Well, it's the whole thing of, is it detrimental to you? Like, if, if somebody very harshly says something that's true, you are detrimenting yourself if you are like, well, you were harsh, so go away, I'm not listening to that. Especially if you recognize it to be true. Yeah. You benefit from taking advice that is correct, even if it's harsh, and then improving the work. Like, that's beneficial. Um, I guess it would be preferable if everybody was nicer about it, but I don't know, we're humans, we're emotional and stupid. Well, yeah. you, you know, you just said it would be preferable if everyone was nice about it. I think that just explains the origin of this channel. Like, um, the Cinema Wins, mm -hmm. I mean. Like, isn't it nice when people are positive? It's just like, I feel like... It's like, well, no, <sighs> it, it should be nice when pe people can just be honest and nice. That's entirely possible. Are they still going on about fucking terriers? Show shit. <laughs> I get it. Hey, Rex. You'd love it if you, um... Don't get me. If you pretend you like it, maybe it's someone you'd want. I'm like, on every level. I don't understand. How can you be so bad at media criticism? Hi, let's talk about gish gallops for a second. The gish gallop, sometimes referred to as shotgun argumentation, is characterized by overwhelming an interlocutor with a heavy quantity of arguments and not giving them a sufficient amount of time to properly respond to any one point, even when they may be required to do a hefty amount of research first. The more arguments you trot out, the less factually accurate or logically sound any of them have to be, because you can just move on from one to the next, and it makes it take more time for someone to break down each individual point. Because this fire hose of nonsense puts the interlocutor in a type of stun lock, uncritical spectators may then come away convinced that the Gish Galloper must have therefore just had an overwhelming number of devastating airtight arguments. But what happens when you do take the time to slow down and just process each of the arguments made during the Gish Gallop? Well, they don't hold up all that well to scrutiny. However, the gish gallop is, by design, nigh impossible to respond to in the same way you would with any other argument, because it locks the other party into a catch-22. You see, to shred each and every point as thoroughly as they deserve to be is extremely time-consuming, which not only sells an illusion that they must have been correct, but also allows the gish galloper to paint the interlocutor as obsessive. If the interlocutor decides not to bother, this further sells this illusion that the gish galloper won, and if the interlocutor decides to respond to some points but not all, then the gish galloper can accuse them of cherry-picking. As such, it is the weapon of choice for an internet troll who sees debates as battles to be won in order to assert dominance, but doesn't care to argue by intellectual engagement. Enter Every Frame a Pause, better known as EFAP. EFAP is a podcast comprised of a few YouTubers whose main thing is based on criticizing movies, TV shows, video games, and the like. Their main point of focus is on what they consider internally consistent, and they're typically criticizing things like plot holes, contrivances, characters acting out of character, that sort of thing. Now, I used to be friends with these guys. I used to think they had fairly good heads on their shoulders, and I wanted to introduce them to a TV show that I believed, and do believe, holds up to the standard that they appeared to hold all media to. This show is called Terriers. For those unaware, Terriers was a little dramedy about unlicensed private detectives that aired on FX in 2010 and simply failed to draw in a massive enough audience to prevent it from getting cancelled after one season. And it might not be as well known as Breaking Bad or Game of Thrones, but it's gained a bit of a cult following and a reputation as one of the best TV shows you've never seen. Now, I'm one of those oddballs out there who has seen the show, having first gotten into it about a year after it was cancelled, and I've been very proactive in introducing people to it, because I think it's a show they'll like, and for the most part, have been reasonably successful. Some just didn't find their cup of tea, but the response from the majority is that it's a good entertaining show that satisfies their desire for a story with a strong sense of internal consistency and cause and effect. And then I introduced it to EFAP. Well, two of the hosts anyways. I don't like to roll this out very much. It's one of the worst shows I've seen. Uh, I wouldn't recommend it to anybody. No uh, would I. One of the worst I don't, I don't, I've I seen. I would recommend um, now I've seen, especially if you put me and Fringy together, we've seen a lot of shows. We're, we're talking yes. an unholy amount, potentially. And if there were percentiles, yeah, this one's easily in the bottom 20%. Um, yeah, I would uh, I would much sooner recommend, if you want a procedural, just watch Law & Order. You'll get a lot more out of Law & Order. I like Barry. I would rec No, I don't like Barry. <laughs> I would recommend Barry. I think a lot of people would get something out of that show. I think a lot of people would enjoy it. I think it's a show that has good scenes in it, some great scenes in it, and potential. I don't see that in Terriers. Yeah, it's not misrepresenting a scene, not forgetting context, both of which has totally not been done. Don't you worry about it. We just finished this show. I don't even... <laughs> like, it's... And I don't know how you could defend that. I really don't know how you could there. defend that. How can we talk about anything at that point? Like, we talked about that in the same way that we would talk about basically anything that we're trying to analyze. Now, when I tried to watch this with Mahler and Fringy, they made a lot of arguments, most of them pertaining to the law that were a bit 
confusing, to say the least. For example, they claimed that the protagonist's lawyer couldn't offer attorney-client privilege to a wanted murder suspect. Man, they've got the main suspect on the murder weapon and they've taken them to a law office. Holy shit, my brain! Seems that her fingerprints and DNA, all over the scene. Oh god, she knows that? Man, they were in the lawyer's office and she knew she was the suspect because that's there's no uh, lawyer-client privilege, there's no case, the lawyer's not even involved, she's a friend at that point, that's how she's operating. And like, why didn't the lawyer tell them, get the fuck out of here, if you're here for like a second longer, I'm telling the police you're here, because what you're doing right now is carting around the major suspect in a major crime, and she's a lawyer, so she knows this back to front. Which, as it turns out, isn't true at all. The standard mindset for lawyers to have is to treat anyone suspected of a crime as innocent until proven guilty. So they're more than happy to give privileged legal advice to a suspect seeking it, even if they're on the run, and aren't obligated to report them to the police unless they're aware the person has an immediate plan to hurt someone. They also claim that this lawyer recommends the suspect flees the country. Well, do we know that there's no uh, attorney-client privilege in So that the problem case? is, now the problem is, that lawyers cannot help you commit further crimes. That is not a part of uh, lawyer-client privilege. They can, they if you tell them and something, she, they, that's that, that girl that, but, isn't yeah. her client too. No. Well, well, well. So you could do you could do some like flizzing to to get around that. However, you still couldn't tell her like, okay, flee to Colombia. You can't. That's sure. not. You can't do that. In actuality, all she does is acknowledge the suspect may try that, which isn't the same thing as recommending her to actually flee. Her fingerprints and DNA all over the scene. Are you rich? Well, then do you speak Spanish? Because in prison or in Colombia, it's about to be your mother tongue. One of the more ridiculous law-related criticisms you'll hear in the watch party is Mahler appearing to think that if someone threatens to trash your property and then later show up at your house with a baseball bat to make good on that threat, that you would be the one initiating an assault against them. Now I'm guessing you don't get more than, what, two grand a month dealing your batshit blackjack? We just want 10%. I don't have the money on me. We'll come back later tonight. Have it then, 7 o'clock. And if you don't have it, Joey here trashes the place. <laughs> Hey, what if she did call the cops? What if Gustafson's in there waiting for us? Well, we promised her we'd come back and trash the place. They don't. So the boyfriend doesn't assault them. They come to her property with the intent to, like trash the place and possibly I'm afraid he engages the assault. If you remember, they're standing outside and then they get grabbed in. With the baseball bat? Yeah, it's not a crime to hold a baseball bat. Now, I have no idea if that's how they do it over in Wales or Australia, but if they do, uh, we do things very differently in the US. That's kind of the thing about the law, how it is practiced varies between countries and even different parts of each country. And in the US, the person with the bat making the threat would be seen as the aggressor. And in a fair number of states, this is actually a really effective way to get your ass shot. They also tried to argue that an obvious joke during a deposition was in fact perjury or an admission to lying on one's tax forms. You and Mr. Pollock are private detectives? Well, on our tax returns, it says we sell seashells by the seashore, but uh, we moonlight a bit. Mr. Lindis wanted so to he's just admitted under oath that he lies on his yeah, tax forms. Him and Eleanor not well, no, he says we and sell seashells by the seashore. He's joking. $30, he's under oath he really for a testimony for a criminal investigation. So, despite how utterly absurd this criticism <laughs> is on its face, I did take the time to ask five different lawyers about this, because unlike most things that EFAP complained about, there is not a whole lot of reading material already available for this particular scenario. And the answer from each and every single one has been that this is obviously a joke, and obvious jokes, especially about things that are not material to what the case is about, are not perjury. Don't believe me? See if you have it any better luck at getting a lawyer to go, yes, we would absolutely, in all contexts, see this as a serious instance of perjury and prosecute it as such. Anyways, when arguing over this point, Fringy seems to be under the impression that shouting over me and repeating himself makes his argument right, even if that argument is, at its core, unironically based on the position that a joking way of saying that you do odd jobs is tantamount to either perjury or admitting to tax evasion. I mean, they, they like, why to... is he not being investigated for tax evasion? Either he, either he's evading taxes or he lied under oath. Perjury. Well, I, I mean, all he's saying is, so it says on our taxes that we sell seashells by the yes, seashore. Yes, it is illegal. It is, it is illegal a lie. to lie on your tax. 
And all the people in that room know they're lying. But they're, well, so, that's not what no, they're no, actually no. putting on their tax forms, though. No, it's, no. It's, so you lied under oath, then. <laughs> is it? Is it? Is that actually going to fall under oath? Is that actually going to fall as a lie under oath? Where, where you just simply make a, to lie. a joke like that? The exchange is a great example of how you can sometimes appear to be walking all over a person, even while actively demonstrating that you are the one in error, so long as you maintain the composure of being the validated party. That's just weak arguing. You made a bad argument, Fringy. <coughs> that scoff you heard from Fringy there is just a taste of the smugness that is present from both him and Mahler throughout that entire watch party when they make their arguments. Because they seem to be under the impression that they don't need to make an actual argument so long as they make their interlocutor feel like they're being ridiculed by someone they respect. In actuality, much like shouting over someone and just repeating your argument, appealing to ridicule doesn't actually make your point any easier to understand or more logically sound or more factually accurate. It just means you can't form a proper argument even when you are right and it's just plain cringe when you are wrong, which is usually the case since you don't have to do this if you are right. I could tell that things were starting to go off the rails when we hit this plot point towards the end of the first episode where the main character, Hank, finds his friend dead of an overdose he rightfully suspects was forced onto him, and attributes to the guy he also rightfully suspects of murder, and in his emotional state is asking his former partner to do something about it, even if he doesn't have probable cause to go after the real estate tycoon that Hank suspects of murder. And Fringy doesn't seem to understand what people are capable of saying while incredibly emotionally charged. Then do something about it, Mark. Do something. What exactly do could he do, it. though, if he doesn't have probable cause? I mean, Hank's upset. But, so Hank was a cop before, yeah. right? Yeah. So he knows this, that like, that's not how it works. Well, yes, but he's upset. He just saw his friend dead. So he forgets about how, like, it works? I mean, in that state of mind, I can buy that he's like, kind of disillusioned and he's, he is just saying, do something okay, about it. That exchange pretty much speaks for itself. It's the kind of criticism they are accused of making all the time, that they want characters to be strictly logical without having any room to do or say anything that is emotionally charged, which they passionately insist they don't do. Different people are driven by all different kinds of things, and having a child is something that a lot of people probably are willing to risk dying for. Raising a baby in this world is gonna be a difficult but not necessarily impossible task, and they have prepared for it. It's an extraordinarily reckless decision, but it's still one that these very family-oriented characters may make if they believe they're up to the challenge. Also, you know, it could have been a mistake. This is the one that really drives me nuts. Movies are, for the most part, about human beings, or at least characters who think and act like human beings. And you know what human beings are not? Logical. People are impulsive. They make choices based on emotion. Not everyone thinks exactly the same. And also, People make mistakes. This argument is a reasonable response to people citing the pregnancy plot hole, so long as you cut it exactly there and don't let it play any further. If I were to nitpick it, I would say that it's not really right to say that humans are strictly not logical. Most thoughts that most people have will have some kind of internal logic to them, even if that logic is flawed in some way. But let's just do him the favor of assuming that what he meant to say was that humans aren't exclusively logical, and yeah, that's fine. Setting aside all their garbled arguments about the law, when someone begins complaining about things like this, it tends to be indicative that they have stopped engaging with something in good faith and are now just looking for things to complain about. It's up to you if you want to go through the full watch party recording and see if they made any actual valid points, and I'm just cherry picking. Because, obviously, someone who is arguing in bad faith very clearly from the sample of arguments I've selected must have actually been making a lot of solid points that I'm just ignoring. There are actually EFAP fans who've apparently watched this watch party and have concluded that Mahler and Fringy are totally correct. A conclusion that I can't understand how someone actually reaches unless they are operating under a truly bizarre premise that the factually accurate position in an argument is determined by whichever one is being put forth by the most aggressive and smug party. And that if you are put on the spot by someone who is arguing in demonstrably bad faith, that means that whatever position you hold must therefore be wrong. Because if you were right, then how could you lose an informal, lopsided debate? Because yeah, 
I'm not at my A game during this watch party. I was expecting to have a fun time introducing a couple of friends to something I thought they would enjoy. I was not expecting them to use this as an opportunity to talk down to me and make up a bunch of silly arguments that don't hold any water if you do any research that isn't possible to do in real time. It's a very cultish, might makes right way of thinking that's neither productive for actually having fruitful discussions on anything, really, nor is it particularly easy to talk a person out of, especially when they're hell bent on believing that you are the enemy. And while debate bros who are at least consistent consistently correct tend to be generally insufferable and unpleasant, stupid debate bros become impossibly fascinating from a purely anthropological standpoint when someone dedicates the insurmountable amount of time that it takes to dissect their points and analyze the substance of their arguments, and looks deeper than just how confident they sound while making their arguments, and demonstrates why their intellect doesn't actually live up to the hype that their fans have incessantly gassed up. Assuming that you can stomach some truly profound, breathtaking levels of sheer stupidity, brazenly inconsistent principles, and total intellectual dishonesty. Now, I might be biased, but I have six hours to prove this beyond any reasonable doubt, so I'm just going to come out and say that one of the core premises of this video that you're watching is that a massive plurality of EFAP's fans, the most vocal ones anyways, aren't any good at actually thinking critically for themselves. I can't give a precise percentage or even go as far as to say it's half or a majority of this fan base. I can only say that it's enough for this mentality to be incredibly pervasive, and it clearly isn't being discouraged by the hosts themselves, and that's frankly all I need to say. They seem to have conditioned themselves into letting Mahler and his friends do all the critical thinking for them, which makes them extremely susceptible to just accepting anything they say by default, which would be one thing if they were actually reliable and trustworthy, but when they are fallible and subject to getting extremely biased and ignoring any information that counters their perspective to a degree bordering on acute mental illness, it becomes a rather surreal case of the blind leading the blind, and when their delusion about these guys faces a serious challenge, they don't want to actually argue based on the facts, based on the evidence, they would much rather attack the character of the person criticizing their sacred cow, poison the well against them, strawman them to death, and loftily indicate by some phrase that the time for discussion is past rather than just explain why they're wrong in the manner that I'm sure they'd be perfectly willing to if I were to seriously try to argue that they were totally wrong about, say, the Rise of Skywalker. Uh, but I'm not here to argue that The Rise of Skywalker is good, because it is in fact very bad. I'm here to talk about a show that no one has seen, nor are any of these guys' fans apparently willing to actually watch before deciding to die on the hill that EFAT made a bunch of absolutely airtight points about it. Look, they wanted someone willing to mount an argument that has nothing to do with their length, or the one stream they did about Jenny Nicholson, or the goofy politics of those they've chosen to associate with, and... Here I am. So, circling back to Gish Gallops, people are usually discouraged from responding to these things because of the sheer amount of time it would take to appropriately break them down. I'm built different, however. I revel in dissecting bad arguments, and a Gish Gallop just gives me more to break down. And considering I got on YouTube because I wanted to break down bad arguments about movies and TV shows and whatnot, I hit the mother load with this one. On top of that, I think that Terriers did not deserve to be denigrated by these guys in the manner it was, as someone who was both a fan of the show and also cares a good bit about when people misrepresent something to criticize it in bad faith. So I've spent a fair amount of time analyzing these arguments, cross-referencing them with the show, and in the case of some of these points, looking into how accurate they are with the law. That's just the unfortunate nature of Gish Gallops. It takes no time to make an enormous mess, and it can take a hundred times the amount of time to clean it up. But now that I've gone through that way too extensive research process, I'd like to share my findings in the most entertaining way that I can, because uh, these guys do not understand anything they are talking about, especially the law. And their arguments centered on the show are so bad faith, it's comical. And I don't want to just poo-poo their take without elaboration. It's a standard social contract we agree to when we enter a conversation. Let the other person make their case, and they should let you make yours. Either way, if you enjoy watching a bad take just get ripped to shreds, then this video is for you. Name one unreasonable thing they've said. If it's a woman you're a wanton. The main set of arguments I'll be breaking down are from a live stream that EFAP did right after having watched the full show, where they proceeded to rant about how bad they thought the show was. In fairness to anyone in the EFAP fanbase who's tuning in with no prior knowledge of any of the arguments I'm about to go into, this is from a live stream that only has 13,000 views as of this writing. It's their first EFAP mini dedicated to catching up on Super Chats that were sent to them during their third anniversary stream if you want to find it. It's the one with a runtime of 8 hours and 6 minutes. Anyways, no point beating around the bush, let's begin! One of the main characters called Brit, and he, he as a friend who's like used to do crimes and stuff and they decide they they get they get abducted and get taken across the border at San Diego so they go to Tijuana um and they are tasked with helping this guy's old criminal buddies basically steal some evidence from lockup so all the crimes that are committed in this episode so first of all uh they get themselves sent to prisons so they got that crime to deal with 
But then they assault a police officer, break out of prison, steal evidence from lockup to give to, like, a cartel, and then he illegally flees back into America. Like, okay, so... They've got all his details. They know he did all these things. They've got all of his details. They know who he is. They know where he lives. Um, it's over. So first of all, you can't just get into the boot of somebody's car and just get into America from Mexico. Like, they're going to check the boot of the car. It doesn't matter that there's a cop with you. They're going to check the car. And even if we assume that being with a detective is going to help you get back into America, even though police and border patrol are, like, totally different entities... As soon as you get back to America, you're just going to be extradited to Mexico for all the crimes you committed there. Yeah, if you've it's actually impeded done. the case against a cartel, they're going to be fucking pissed at you. They're gonna and you assaulted a police cartel. officer. And assaulting a police officer, yeah, breaking out of their prison. Their friends. Uh, yeah, breaking out. The amount of crime. And there is a clear evidence trail for all of this, by the way. <laughs> yeah. so, uh, everything that guy just says bullshit. Thank you. There is a lot to unpack about this entire section of criticisms, and to a layman, this might even sound convincing, especially if you've been told that Fring you went to college for the subject at one point, and doubly so if this is being dropped on you in real time by someone who just sounds confident that they know what they are talking about. The prospect of going up against him on something like this seems like a daunting task. But instead of making knee-jerk reactions, let's take a breath and just think about what has been said. <laughs> This is gonna be fun. First off, there's a few small things to correct. They get abducted and get taken across the border at San Diego, so they go to Tijuana. They don't get abducted, just Brit. Ray is voluntarily working for this cartel. He's merely in hot water with them because he's the one who had control of the drugs when they were seized by the police. And they are tasked with helping this guy's old criminal buddies. This is more of a semantic mistake compared to the rest, but it's worth correcting regardless. They are not tasked with working for Brit or Ray's old criminal buddies. Brit is having to help Ray with a task for a cartel that Ray is currently working for. Basically steal some evidence from lockup. So. All the crimes that are committed in this episode. So, first of all, uh, they get themselves sent to prisons. So they got that crime to deal with. Fringy does not go into detail as to what they do to get themselves arrested, which implies that it's something serious. In actuality, all that gets them arrested is a bar fight that they stage. But then, they assault a police officer, break out of prison, steal evidence from lockup to give to, like, a cartel. When Fringy says they assault a police officer, he implies that Brit helps Ray do this. In actuality, Brit is not in the jail cell when this happens. He leaves Ray behind in the cell to go fetch the seized drugs from lockup, and while he is gone, a cop checks in on the cell and enters it when he sees Brit is missing. This could actually be considered a convenience, a valid criticism which you may notice these guys do not bring up. Ray puts him in a sleeper hold, and when Brit comes back to the cell with the drugs in tow, you can clearly see he is not happy with Ray and shows concern that the cop may have been killed, which Ray assures him he hasn't. He's not dead. Give me that. Now, perhaps in the eyes of the authorities, Brit could be seen as an accessory after the fact, but Fringy does not clarify this by providing any further context. So to his audience, Brit would have actively participated in the assault of a police officer. And then he illegally flees back into America. Like, okay, so... They've got all his details. They know he did all these things. They've got all of his details. They know who he is. They know where he lives. Um... It's over. As soon as you get back to America, you're just going to be extradited to Mexico for all the crimes you committed there. Yeah, if you've it's actually impeded done. the case against a cartel, they're going to be fucking pissed at you. Uh, so discerning listeners may have noticed that Fringy mentioned at the start of this diatribe that Brick gets abducted. Now, there is one possible context that while Brick gets abducted, he is promised a handsome monetary reward for this. After all, in this stream, they really like to bang on about how these characters just do bad things for money, which is even what Fringy says immediately after talking about this specific part of the show. We have multiple issues throughout the show. The number one thing is that the protagonists are just really bad people. They are not ethically dubious. They do a lot of evil things, and they do it just to make money. That's their goal. Oh, can we talk about the... their interest. There is so much evidence that connects these two to, like, all of these, these crimes that they've committed and that they did mostly for money. Now, here's the kicker. This isn't true on even a microscopic level. What actually happens is that while he is working a process-serving gig, Brit is held at gunpoint, knocked out, stuffed into a car that is registered to an associate of the cartel, which both Mark, a police detective, and a DEA agent he is friends with have seen via security footage, and when he is brought to Mexico, he is shown a picture of his girlfriend taken just minutes before by a guy that the cartel has sent to keep an eye on her, and is then told, Nothing is going to happen to her, so long as this property is returned to me by six o'clock. I call my cousin, he come back here, she never know you there. But if you know him from me, it could be a problem, comprende? 
Now, because nobody gets killed as a result of Brit or Ray's actions, what Brit does in this episode is completely covered under the legal defense of duress. Of course, the fact that Brit was under duress is one thing, making Fringy and Mahler's moral condemnation of what he does here beyond absurd. In order to be seen by the law as acting under duress, there needs to be evidence of that available to the authorities. Successful duress defenses in court tend to be rare, because situations in which one is forced to commit crimes under duress are fairly rare as it is in the grand scheme of things. And on the occasion that that occurs, there is usually enough evidence immediately available to the authorities that there isn't a need to arrest or press any charges to begin with. Now, in a case where it's not clear enough that someone was acting under duress, let's suppose there's no documentation handy to prove what was happening, no text messages, no videotapes, and anyone who could testify to the arrest is either dead, can't be found, or just won't admit what happened, someone in Brit's position might be extradited. And in front of the word might is an asterisk twice the size of that word, but I'm already in the middle of a point, so one second. But in Brit's case, not only is there a videotape showing him being kidnapped, which has been seen by both a respected police detective and a DEA agent, but he later acquires a cell phone belonging to one of the kidnappers, a cell phone which in its inbox would have a picture taken of his girlfriend from earlier in the the day, and they'll also have the cell phone that took that picture and will have it in its sent folder and possibly still even in the photo gallery. And they will have that cell phone because the same respected police detective mentioned earlier shoots the owner of that phone, Yuriko, after seeing him holding a gun to Katie's head in her apartment. What I've just described is a mountain of evidence that makes it immediately clear that Brit was under duress, which would be thoroughly documented by the authorities in universe. In Brit's case, it wasn't his own life that was necessarily at risk, but rather a close loved one's, as is the case in Tiger Kidnappings, which are on unheard of to see being prosecuted against as if someone who was just trying to keep their loved ones alive is equally culpable as the criminals who threatened them into breaking the law. Provided that there does exist sufficient evidence either for a defendant to be found not guilty, for a prosecutor to drop charges against someone who's been arrested, or for the police not to make an arrest in the first place. The evidence is so overwhelming that no cop in their right mind is going to make an arrest. Not only because it's definitely not going to do anything but waste the court's time and taxpayer dollars, but also because, for whatever flaws we can criticize the institution of law enforcement for, cops are still human beings who are capable of feeling empathy for a person who is thrust into this situation. It's the same principle as when a self-defense shooting occurs and there exists a mountain of evidence for the authorities to immediately determine that the shooting was lawful, even in scenarios where they might later change their minds after unearthing new information. If you've it's actually impeded done. the case against a cartel, they're gonna be fucking pissed at you. I don't see why they might assume that Brit was part of the cartel, considering the aforementioned mountain of evidence that exists and proves that he was kidnapped and forced to help Ray under duress. Which these guys have of course left out while focusing on evidence that would have been incriminating for Brit if it weren't for that additional context being left out. All of this is trivial, however, compared to the next point, which is that nobody checked the car at the border. And then he illegally flees back into America. Like, okay, so... They've got all his details, they know They've he did all these things. They've got all of his details, they know who he is, they know where he lives. Um, it's over. So first of all, you can't just get into the boot of somebody's car and just get into America from Mexico. Like, they're gonna check the boot of the car. It doesn't matter that there's a cop with you, they're gonna check the car. Wanna bet, Froggy Nelson? And even if we assume that being with a detective is gonna help you get back into America, even though police and border patrol are like, totally different entities, as soon as you get back to America, you're just going to be extradited to Mexico for all the crimes you committed there. I'm gonna fuck you up. So starting off, there are a couple of kernels of truth to what Fringy says here. The first of which is that every car would technically be checked at the border. Assuming your definition of checking is drivers being stopped and made to present ID and ask a couple of questions. But the way Fringy uses it here implies more than just that. He seems to be saying the car would be searched, like it would have had its trunk popped open or maybe a canine unit would sniff it. And I'll explain in a minute why that isn't as much of a guarantee as Fringy suggests. The other kernel of truth is that Border Patrol is any different jurisdiction from Mark. Of course, I don't see why that's relevant because Border Patrol is the name for the folks who drive along the border where crossings are attempted away from ports of entry. Ports of entry aren't managed by Border Patrol itself, but by the agency in charge of them, which is officially named Customs and Border Protection. Pedantry aside, Fringy technically using the incorrect terminology is relevant relevant to the fact that CBP would indeed be above whatever branch Mark would be a part of. And while Mark would need probable cause in order to search a citizen's car without a warrant, CBP does not. Their website will even tell you that every car is subject to be searched. Additionally, a cursory glance at what security is like at the border will mention x-ray scanners. These things are called Z-portals, and they're like the x-ray scanning machines you might see at an airport. And the first one of these was introduced at the San Ysidro port of entry in 2008. Now, I bet that the folks watching this in the hopes of validating their bias for EFAP are salivating at this. 
us, as though I've just proven this point right. Every car is subject to be searched, and they have x-ray scanners at the border. Now, that's a nice argument. Just two small problems. Every car being subject to be searched does not mean they are guaranteed to be searched. And unlike what you might initially assume, the Z portal is not a standard part of every lane. It's only used on cars selected for secondary inspections. Now, what is the exact likelihood that your car will be chosen to go through one? Well, according to what the CBP themselves say, they only send 16% of commercial vehicles through it and a whopping 2% of private vehicles, like the one Mark's driving here. So, unlike what I had instinctively assumed when I had first heard of the port of entry having x-ray scanners, where it sounded like it was just a standard part of the process that every car had to go through, there is actually a 98% chance that if you're just driving a four-door sedan, you aren't going to go through this thing, because they would first need to decide that you need to go through a secondary inspection, which they aren't going to do for a vast, vast, vast majority of cars going over the border. That's because CBP not only has to worry about catching contraband that's being smuggled over the border, but also they have a long, long line of cars that they need to be able to keep moving at a reasonable pace, and need to strike a balance between these two objectives. If they're forced to focus much more on getting every car searched, they will not be able to also have traffic moving at an even remotely acceptable pace, which would result in severe congestion at the border. Because of this, they're going to have to let most cars into the U.S. just after asking a few quick questions in a primary inspection, such as what part of Mexico you're coming from, how long you were there, why you were there, and if you have proof of citizenship. I do wonder, where exactly do these guys believe that the majority of drug trafficking, arms trafficking, and human trafficking from Mexico is happening? We know for a fact that billions of dollars in contraband is being smuggled from Mexico into the U.S., so where could all that contraband be brought through? Well, the vast majority of drugs that are smuggled into the U.S. from Mexico are said to have been brought in through these ports of entry. And this data is not coming from some random nobody, but the DEA themselves. You hear all the time about drugs being seized at a port of entry, or weapons or human smuggling attempts being thwarted, immigrants found hiding in car trunks. These stories can lead one to believe, see? See? The border security is airtight. Nothing can get through. Of course, that just forces one to ask, why would people attempt to smuggle anyone or anything through these ports of entry in the first place if it was guaranteed to get them caught? That's because these news stories aren't saying that CBP is able to catch these sorts of things every time they happen. They are just reporting on the times that CBP is catching them. But CBP themselves will admit that they can only catch what they can see. And what gets successfully smuggled over the border, whether it's drugs, guns, or people, isn't going to have that same level of official reporting. That's sort of thing might be why you never see news stories about people successfully smuggling people through a port of entry in the trunk of their car. Because that requires them to be willing to talk about it, which usually is only going to happen after they're later arrested, if they make a confession for a potentially lightened sentence. Those guys don't really make headlines, but you know who did? This woman in San Diego, who went through the San Ysidro port of entry while coming from Tijuana, who was surprised to find that two Mexicans had snuck into the country by getting into her car's trunk without her knowledge until she was 40 miles away from the border, at which point they ran off and were were never found by the authorities. This didn't happen in the 70s, the 80s, or the 90s either. It happened at the beginning of this year. Hey Friggy, looks to me like nobody checked the car at the border! So if you are wondering how this sort of thing can happen, we should now look at what the process of going through a port of entry actually looks like. Now because I live on the other side of the country away from the Mexican border, I can't just go through it myself. So I'm having to go off of what other people have told me about their experiences of crossing the border. Now despite how much this benefits my case, I'm not one to settle for hearsay when there's other things I can do to really test this out, such as perhaps videos of the process. Like this one. All right, he's waving me up. How you doing, officer? Anything to declare today? No, sir. What are you doing down here? I went down the 1,000. Got a broken foot, so just wasting time. <laughs> oh, man. All right, take care, sir. See you. Have a good one. As you can see, this gentleman rolled right up to the border, was asked a couple of questions, answered them quickly and cordially, and was let right on through extremely quickly. But that could just be an insanely lucky fluke. Let's look at another video. In this one, you can see that the uploader included captions narrating the process, telling you that generally CBP just asks to see your passport, ask you where you're coming from, where you're going, how long you were in Mexico, and then let you go on your way, without stamping the passport. No mention of a guaranteed vehicle search, and there is no point in the video where I can easily make out a car's trunk being popped open. Perhaps a lot of the car's trunks were being popped open, but they were just out of view. Were you there from Mexico? No. You got a birth certificate? Uh, I, I don't have it on me. Are you going to prove to be a U.S. citizen? I just have a passport. It doesn't matter. You have to prove to me. If you scan it, it'll show you that I have a passport. It doesn't scan. It, it, I've done it before, so... Yeah. You need to have a birth certificate with you. Uh, I know better than anybody else through these lines. Yeah. I've done, it, I've done it before that. What's that? I've done it before. What's that? Without my certificate, just my ID. 
I did it just with my license before. I don't know Now here's a very interesting one. This guy rolled up to the port of entry without a passport or a birth certificate, just a driver's license, has a brief exchange with a CBP officer in which he's primarily arguing with him. He answers a few questions, treats the guy cordially, and the officer lets him go on his way, telling him to bring a valid passport or a birth certificate next time. As you may have noticed, his trunk does not get popped open, nor do you even see a flashlight shown through his window, as CBP officers might do at this hour, as seen in this video. In that same video, by the way, you do get a look at them popping a car's trunk open briefly. You'll see that right here too. Now interestingly, they do it with that car, but they don't do it with this car. And of course you'll notice, none of these cars are going through a Z portal. What's the matter bro? Nobody checked the car at the border. So as you can see, these quick little searches are indeed a thing that they can do at the border, but clearly from these videos, which are the only videos I've been able to find of people entering into the US from Mexico in a car, this isn't something they always do. And in fact, avoiding such a search is actually quite probable to do, which corroborates with what I've been told in people's personal testimonies, which is that while CBP legally has the right to search anyone they want, regardless of whether there's probable cause, they still tend to go by probable cause. And sometimes they'll do random searches as well, but otherwise it is inevitable that drugs, guns, and people will slip through the cracks, as evidenced by clear success stories such as this one, which is why people make those risks in the first place. But wait, I hear you say. Okay, so Fringy is incorrect here. Not every car is inspected at the border, and in fact there's a reasonable chance that yours won't be when you roll up to the customs agent. But is this at least a thing that they could plausibly do? No. I could easily just move on to the next point, but I find that I would be doing you a disservice by not spending a little more time to explain not just why this argument is wrong, it's wrong to a point that any illusion that Fringy has even the foggiest clue that he knows anything about the law shouldn't be possible to recover. Now on January 5th, 2021, the same day that an infamous typo was born, a bill had been signed into law mandating that every car at the border had to be scanned in some capacity. As we can see, after this change was made, the average wait time for the front of the line extended from 34 minutes to almost 5 times that amount, 2 hours and 30 minutes. Setting aside the whole thing about inconveniencing tens of thousands of motorists, the worsened congestion caused by this type of policy turns out to lead to major revenue losses. As an example of this, after attempting to follow this policy, the state of Texas is said to have lost $477 million in revenue per day. Because as it turns out, this type of policy resulting in a 90% decrease in border crossings is a very bad thing for businesses dependent on international trade, which very well may begin gouging prices for their products in order to minimize the bleeding of their profits. Hence, it's probably unreasonable for every car to get checked at the pl border. Now, I'm going to give Fringy the benefit of the doubt and assume that he didn't take an economics course in university as well. Allow me to give you a crash course using my knowledge as a humble high school educated grocery store clerk. Suppose you like avocados very much. You get them from a particular grocery store because that store gets their avocados from a better supplier than any other store in your area. These avocados have a premier quality and have ruined other avocados for you. And on top of that, they're more affordable than the average avocado. Never going over 80 cents a pop, usually they're running a lot cheaper. Well, the supplier of those avocados is in Mexico, and because of these new policies requiring heavier security at the border, they are now only able to move avocados across the border at 10% of the rate that they used to be able to. The supplier now has to pay truck drivers much more money by the hour to deliver much fewer avocados than before. In order to keep their company afloat and prevent from having to lay off their employees, the supplier now has to charge much more money from their clients, which includes the grocery store where you buy your avocados. Now the grocery store is getting fewer avocados and might be running out of them much more quickly, while having to pay the supplier more for what they can get. Yet. They might only get two cases of them per day, and run out of them before noon, when previously they could count on getting a minimum of eight cases, and be able to keep the avocados display filled all the way up until closing time. The avocados might have been so good that they even drew people to the store in the first place. The loss of revenue in these avocados is going to quickly translate to a noticeable dip in what the produce department, and possibly the rest of the store, rakes in every week. The grocery store is now left with only one choice to account for the change in supply and demand. Raise the prices of these avocados up to a minimum of over $2 each. That's more than double the previous maximum price, but these avocados are good enough that people will still be willing to buy them. They just might not be willing to buy as much as they used to. The biggest loser now isn't the avocado supplier or the grocery store, which are still making about what they used to make before security of the border tightened up. It is now you, the customer, 
All because some dingleberry voted into office by a bunch of other dingleberries got the idea that every car should get checked at the border. All of this is to say, based on the caliber of argumentation he has given, I highly doubt that Fringy is going to be an avocado at law anytime soon. But, you know, this is all stuff that requires an exhausting amount of research to be done in order to understand. Clearly, the show did not explicitly explain how this could be possible. Nope. Uh-uh. Now folks, I have a confession to make. Absolutely none of the research that I've just spent several minutes summarizing for you has been necessary. Because, this entire time, I've had something up my sleeve. Something that could have ended this entire argument immediately, but I withheld for... reasons. Suspected felon with the kidnapped American his truck gets through right like that. We gotta wait. Well, we got 300,000 people that go through every day. Can't search them all. Um... What's that? There is literally a line of dialogue in the show mentioning that Customs isn't able to search every car. So even if this wasn't accurate to how it is in the real world, the show would have explicitly mentioned that Customs don't have the time to search every car because of the volume of cars that pass through the border every day, which would have made it consistent within the rules set up in the show even if it wasn't accurate. But on top of that, we now know that it actually is accurate, and the show dedicated a line of dialogue to make this explicitly clear to the viewer because it was relevant to something incredibly important that happens later in this episode. Ah, but remember guys, this is objective criticism. Now, is a cop driving a car with a person in the trunk up to the port of entry risking getting stopped, searched, and caught at the border? Absolutely, there is a risk indeed. But because CBP are selective in who they choose to search and they prioritize it based on who's more likely to be smuggling something, a cop is someone they're less likely to search so long as there's nothing about them that could be suspicious. Remember, Fringy made it unambiguously clear that he is in fact stating that their car would be guaranteed to be checked. You can't just get into the boot of somebody's car and just get into a America from Mexico. Like, they're gonna check the boot of the car. It doesn't matter that there's a cop with you, they're gonna check the car. Very poor choice of words. However, even if we pretend that Fringy said that it's plausible for cars to not get searched at the border, but you would have to be incredibly lucky for them not to search your car, the probability of not being searched is so great that this wouldn't even be remotely considered a contrivance in the eyes of a person with a modicum of common sense, especially in comparison to much more major strokes of luck that Fringy has made up excuses for in other movies. Which I'll go into detail about after I'm finished breaking down EFAP's critiques of Terriers. Now, if you then want to argue that the characters themselves shouldn't have been willing to take even even the small chance of getting busted in the first place as opposed to getting Brit back in the US through the proper channels, all I would have to do is remind you of the fact that Brit's girlfriend is at the risk of being kidnapped or murdered by a cartel member at this very moment. And they now have a ticking time bomb that makes it frankly absurd to suggest that these characters stay behind in Mexico to clear Brit's name by the book while he is in a state of profound panic about whether his girlfriend will be alive when he sees her. Hey! Oh my god, thank god. Listen, I, I need you to go to my place right now and get Katie. Get her out of there. I can't. What? Why not? Because I'm in TJ. Shit! I also can't help but point out that this comes across as wishful thinking on Muller and Fringy's part, almost like they're salivating at the idea that Brit would be dealt a punishment this harsh, despite by Fringy's own admission, acting under duress. So in, in my head, because I hate these guys, the canonical ending is they were so stupid that they went to Mexico, got arrested, and got sent to jail for the rest of their lives. And then Hank was- For all of the crimes they committed throughout <laughs> the whole season. And season. they were definitely <laughs> separated. We're putting yes, different prisons. Absolutely. One of them is in America, one of them has gone to Mexico. Yeah, and that's it. They're, they're in forever. That doesn't sound very objective. In any case, I personally find this minor compared to all the things that they've gotten wrong on a strictly factual level. Morality being far more subjective than recounting what factually happens in a story or how the real world works. But I wouldn't be doing my due diligence if I didn't at least acknowledge just how unfathomably crass the set of arguments is on a moral level. Sure hope this is the worst that it gets on that front. To play armchair psychologist for a second, it really comes across as these guys just having this irrational, seething hatred for these characters and personally wanting to see them get legally punished, no matter what the context would be, to the point that it's bleeding into their ability to see what's actually happening in the show clearly. What's particularly fascinating about this is, I don't think you have to watch the show for yourself to spot major problems with these arguments. Your car is always going to get checked at the border. Oh, the character commits a lot of crimes after they get abducted. Like, you don't have to watch the show to spot the problems with these specific arguments, but I guess their fans just aren't smart enough to spot these problems for themselves. It's a really good trap in terms of critical analysis because it's like, it's, it's like yeah, it's something you'd easily find out if you actually looked into this, but you didn't. So look what happened. Now, with all that out of the way, let's shotgun our way through a few other arguments they made regarding the law. 
They complained a good bit on their server and in the watch party about the first scene, in which the main characters are introduced appearing to kidnap a dog, which they immediately explain doesn't belong to the guy they appear to have just stolen it from, but rather to the guy's ex-wife who recently left him and is paying them in collateral to get it back for her. Remind me again, how much are we getting paid for this? It's my dry cleaner's dog. She said anything we bring in the next two weeks, no charge. Come on, what else are we gonna do today? Cure cancer? Baby. However, they don't seem to care that the show explained this because then they continue to act as if the bodybuilder was the actual owner. Because, according to their logic, if the dry cleaner was able to present evidence to Brit that she legally owned the dog, why couldn't she just call the cops? So who's who's she? Uh, that's the dry cleaner who owns the bulldog. So she's the ex-girlfriend of the guy who they stole it from? So I'm not a fan of kidnapping dogs, and I need pretty good reason like if you asked me to help you do that you know i'd be like oh is he an abusive owner or what, like are they doing it literally just because they want to get free dry cleaning well i mean it's his dog right no it's her dog well what do you mean it's if so, they were together so if it so this is the thing if it's if it's hers legally she can call the police sorry oh, yeah, i, I no, guess no, i was no, under no, no, i thought so i'm 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 not sure about like how how that would yeah, because real life. Um, technically over... he would be kidnapping the dog, right? So that is not how pet custody disputes work. If you are married and you need to separate from your spouse, but you can't bring your dog with you because, I don't know, the hotel or apartment that you're staying at doesn't allow dogs, and you then have to leave your dog with your spouse, you cannot call the cops on them in order to get the dog back, because the spouse has done absolutely nothing illegal. They would not have taken the dog away from you by force, you would have left it with them. The police do not, and cannot, get involved with disputes like this. They'll get involved if there is a court order, but that's a process with a whole song and dance that's really time-consuming and really expensive. Brit's dry cleaner wants her dog back, does not have the cops as an option to help her, and doesn't want to jump through these hoops, so she offers him two weeks of free dry cleaning to get her dog back. I don't see why it is too much for them to assume that she would have proven her ownership to Brit beforehand, but apparently that that isn't shown on screen was a problem for them, so they just inferred that the dog actually belonged to her ex-husband, and Hank and Brit were stealing the dog from his rightful owner. I thought we were cool with basic good faith assumptions that the writers wouldn't be cretinous enough to glorify stealing pets from their rightful owners, but I guess not for this show. Flashback. All right. Genald. Here we go. You also have a line where he says, what do you get when you cross a mentally ill loner with a society that ignores him and treats him like trash? You get what you deserve. And then he shoots the talk show host in the head. And it's like, well, does the writer director also believe this? For Christ's sake. Jenny. What? For Christ's sake. Yes. He, yes. He, Todd Phillips. Ted, is it Ted or Todd? Uh, Todd. <laughs> Ted, Todd. Ted, it's Todd. Ted, Todd. Phillips. Jeb. Double T in the morning, Phillips. Double T in the P. He definitely is absolutely down with the murder of people who don't like his comedy. It's it's. He clearly has an issue with Robert yeah. De Niro. <laughs> clearly hates Robert De Niro. All right. With a society that ignores him and treats him like trash, you get what you deserve. And then he shoots the talk show host in the head, and it's like, well, does the writer director also believe this? Is this yeah, what he the supports movie's murder. about? Yep. Is it yeah. in about support of the Joker shooting okay, the host? She's definitely the just being deliberately obtuse. I refuse to believe she's actually retarded enough there's, to believe this. There's no way. Like, she's got to be doing something because no. Like, this is just intellectual dishonesty. This isn't you're stupid. I mean, you are stupid. Well, but this yeah. is End of flashback. The breaches of law are hilarious and dramatically inept. Fringy went to university for law, and I just happened to know at least a few basic things through osmosis and other procedural shows. Flashback. You should never have to argue your authority if your argument is solid. It shouldn't need that. You shouldn't need to go, hey. Exactly. I am this thing, therefore what I said is more true now. It's like, you don't need to do that if it's a solid argument. Logic would be pulling out his non-existent hair right now. We heard that. Oh, right. oh yeah, a well this, bit. oh yeah, well Thomas Aquinas said it, so <laughs> God has to be real. End of flashback. You either die a hero, or you live long enough to see yourself become the villain. I, like, think, I think it's okay. You either live long enough to become a villain or die a hero thing, I think is a dumb statement. On their first bout of complaints about the show on EFAP 151, they complained that Hank and Britt should have been thrown in prison after they admitted to the police about taking a cell phone with a sex tape of their murder suspect from a crime scene. They, the probable cause for going into Ted's house was that he was sold the mobile. <laughs> it's like, wow, yeah. who sold him the mobile? Oh, and then you, they are doomed. Unlicensed private investigators. They are fucking doomed. <laughs> Illegally operating private investigators. 
Yeah, so it's over. Like, it's not just that they've committed these crimes, but also that there is a very clear trail of evidence connecting them to yeah. this crime. So, perhaps unsurprisingly at this point, these guys do not understand the concept of turning state's evidence, despite the fact that they supposedly have watched a lot of police procedurals where you'd think this would be depicted from time to time. But, but, but it's all his fault! I was only following orders! State's evidence. Now, because I did not know about the exact term for this concept when I made this thread, I refer to this as immunity deals. So for those who aren't familiar with this exact phrase, turning state's evidence is what happens when you break the law, and while doing so, witness a much more serious crime being committed. And you agree to cooperate with the police and essentially confess to breaking the law in exchange for them not prosecuting you so that you can testify about this much more serious crime that your own crime allowed you to become privy to. Since, you know, they would rather catch the bigger fish if they can help it. It's a pretty common occurrence in the justice system, seeing as this gives criminals an incentive to rat each other out and in turn speeds up the rate at which cops are able to score arrests. That's what would be going on with Hank and Britt, seeing as Linus is the one who is actually suspected of murder and Hank and Britt are just a pair of witnesses who committed a much more minor crime in the grand scheme of things and have personal connections with the local law enforcement, and therefore are more likely to score something like this than a random hobo or registered sex offender might be able to. Didn't you go to college? Maybe in Fringy's headcanon, this staple of the justice system just doesn't exist in the world that Terriers is set in. When they were expressing clear annoyance that the main characters weren't being thrown in jail in the first episode of the show, they rejected the simple explanation given that Hank, being a former cop, is allowed to get away with things most people aren't because of his personal connection with a respected detective on the local police force, and literally dismissed it as hilarious. Again, ridicule is not a substitute for an argument. He's friends with the guy. That's Mark so. Yeah, so that's <laughs> gonna get him. But is he friends with the other guy who's who he impersonated to get information on an active homicide case? Yeah, or well, the operator. Besides, I mean, that's... man, if you're my friend and you do that, I ain't, I ain't fucking saving your bacon. Flashback. That was um, that was an actual complaint that SK Hadmaller was the line. He has everyone in his pocket. Um, that can't possibly be true because he can't have every single police officer in his pocket. Fucking hell. End of flashback. Yeah, I don't buy that with the information the department have pointing to Hank and Britt being suspects that they ignore it because they're friends. That's hilarious. Seems to me that Guff doesn't even consider them that tolerable. Like he asks about planting the gun and from the looks of it, wouldn't cover for them if he found it to be true. Plant that gun? What? Did you and Hank plant that gun? No, sir, detective. You are a good friend. I give you credit for that. God knows that I love Hank, but it is not in Hank Dalworth to do anything but self-destruct on people. You want to learn how to duck? You call me. Seems to me that Guff doesn't even consider them that tolerable. I don't understand. How can you be so bad at media criticism? Nor would he cover for many of the heinous things they have done. They tampered with the biggest piece of evidence in the crime scene, dude. The problem with Mahler dismissing this as outside of the realm of plausibility based on his reading of the character, assuming it's even genuine and not just being willfully obtuse, is of course that the very scene that introduces Mark is making it explicitly clear that this is entirely within his character, and each scene he appears in afterwards is consistent with this idea that he uses his position in his department to cover for Hank. But he turned up today without a face and a lifeguard station right near where your truck got towed wow that's uh that's a coincidence yeah well the dog had to pee so we had to pull over somewhere brit had to go too because they're on the same cycle like that <laughs> we already have a suspect eleanor gosney daughter of mickey gosney yeah the same guy you bailed out of jail to say well, you, you weren't looking for her today were you mm -mm. happened to run a cell trace with detective reynolds id what no that that would be highly illegal. Why were you there? Mark, what can I tell you? My partner had a full ladder. All right, everybody, let's get out of here. You can't just have one friend on the police force and he magically has the power to make all your crimes go away. Uh, why not? No, seriously, do you not believe that cops are like this with each other? Felt Did like just it was a tragic story. Makes me wonder what police procedurals Phoenix right here must be watching. You can't just get into the boot of somebody's car and just get into America from Mexico. Like, they're gonna check the boot of the car. It doesn't matter that there's a cop with you, they're gonna check the car. Now comes the part where we throw our heads back and laugh. Ready? Ready! Ready. <laughs> 
Taking issue with this is indistinguishable to complaining when the police are willing to cooperate with Batman instead of just arresting him immediately, despite the fact that he is a vigilante who breaks dozens of laws every night that he goes out to fight crime. A comparison I even tried to make in the watch party because it's a fairly simple and easy to understand concept. You know, police detective choosing not to enforce the law with someone that they may have everything that they need in order to arrest them out of some personal bias or because they find them more useful out of a jail cell instead of inside one. And, uh, this is what they had to say. So, a big difference like between person. Batman and Hank is that the police can't get Batman, or at least Batman will make, he'll make well, it very I hard for them to get him. I don't know who he is. is the yeah. Big, I don't know who he is. There are enough scenes in various media featuring Batman in which the police could easily arrest him if they wanted to. That this is not only sidestepping the actual point that I was trying to make, which is that the police don't want to arrest Hank and Britt, in the same sense that they don't want to arrest Batman, but also a rather absurd one. Also that Mahler and Fringy can just stubbornly reject the rather elementary reality that cops in America at least, are in fact granted with discretion for when they can make an arrest. And, oftentimes, they will exploit that power where it's convenient to them. You know what though, uh, another thing that doesn't make it an Batman does it for no reward. He just does it. He does it uh, to help. These guys do it for money. Setting aside the fact that this is a comparison to the character's morality, as opposed to why the characters aren't getting arrested by the cops they have connections to, and therefore entirely irrelevant to the point I was trying to make. Feel free to go through the entire show and fact check me on this, but the only money these guys ever make from cooperating with the police is a reward they collect for helping them solve one case at the end of the second episode, which Fringy has only just finished watching at this point. A reward which police are known to offer to anyone who can provide information that leads to certain cases getting solved. This comically hasty conclusion he's made after only watching two episodes is just a taste of how deranged and utterly incongruent with reality Fringy's bizarre hyperfixation over these two making any money really is. Which we'll get around to talking about more once we hit the finale of the section of this video that is dedicated solely to countering their criticisms of Terriers with references, in which we will have to address perhaps their most significant argument about the show, that the main characters are villainous as opposed to ethically dubious, and that the show lacks awareness of these characters' flaws. I'm going to just leave it up to you to determine whether they were being willfully obtuse, or they really are just that stupid that they can't even comprehend a point that simple. I don't think you get... they're done. That's jail. If they choose to prosecute, yes. What? I don't, so I don't know that a police... I don't think they can choose whether or not they want to prosecute that. That's a crime. They have no authority. Mahler can kid himself all he likes, but yes, they do. In America, police are given the rights to use their discretion for when they may make an arrest, which is, for better or for worse, a necessity for the occupation, as whether an officer may decide to make an arrest is going to be dependent on context, which varies from case to case. For instance, if they simply don't have enough evidence to score a conviction, they're extremely unlikely to make an arrest, a decision which they cannot then get into legal trouble for. Without discretion, they may be then compelled to make arrests even if they have an insufficient amount of evidence against the suspect, meaning the arrest will ultimately lead to no Nowhere. However, there is a significant trade-off to this, because it then makes how the law is enforced incredibly subject to the biases and personal whims of the cop you are interacting with. They may or may not have, for instance, a racial prejudice that strongly affects how you are treated. If you get pulled over one day for going only five over the limit and you politely explain you're simply running late for work, you might just be lucky enough to run into a cop polite enough to let you off with a verbal or even written warning. Or the cop who pulled you over has had one truly rotten week and is in need of keeping up with his quota of traffic tickets written out. And it doesn't matter how polite you are with him, you're going to get a $200 speeding ticket. That's a more minor example of how you might just get lucky or unlucky based on which cop you're dealing with than what's happening in the show. But it isn't at all unheard of for cops to exploit this power bestowed upon them when dealing with people they are personally biased towards, which is what you'll hear from any lawyer or police officer you talk to about this subject, which in turn is why this is frequently depicted in stories featuring cops. Only, for whatever reason, Mahler and Fringy have decided that it is a problem for terriers to depict cops in this manner. So it works, it's like they say in Civil War. You're saying the quiet part out loud, I think. The whole point of like police and stuff is that they have people to answer to. You as a citizen can't randomly decide I'm going to tamper with evidence because I think it's the right thing to do, even if it leads to the right outcome. This is why vigilantes are illegal. We've well, got other not, people involved who would know. He, it's not a decision that he alone is allowed to make. Because it just isn't. Yes, it is, Fringy. Cope harder. Um, and in fact, like, he has an obligation to enforce the law. 
for reasons I just outlined, no, he does not. I don't know how it is over in the land down under, but if that is indeed the case, it isn't in America. The conscious say, well, you're my friend, so I'm not... I mean, if... if Because that, that, that makes him kind of like just a shitty person, if that if that's like what would accept. It is beyond laughable for Fringy to act like the show has any obligation to portray Mark as a squeaky clean by the book cop when the show is clearly aiming to be neo noir in the sense that Breaking Bad is. Where the characters we're following aren't paragons of virtue, but rather flawed human beings who will have emotional biases, which the show has clearly communicated to the audience about Mark from his very first scene in the first episode. The idea that it is a writing problem in a story for a character to not fit within Fringy's perception of what makes a good person just because they are a cop or we are meant to root for them, is so at odds with what he has said in plenty of other streams, and just plain stupid all around, that it is an utterly embarrassing demonstration of an EFAP fan's intelligence and media literacy, or lack thereof, when they watch through the watch party and somehow conclude that the arguments they were making, including this hopelessly childish moralistic fallacy, are even remotely reasonable. Just because they sound more confident than the person they are putting on the spot with these bizarre complaints that they haven't seemed to lob at anything else. That's not the only part of the core premise of the show they just dismiss out of hand, of course. They made a huge stink about the fact that these guys are unlicensed PIs, and act as if that is just too implausible of a premise to accept for a TV show. And did I hear it right that they they basically said we don't have IDs and Lindus was just like, okay then. Oh, fuck, yeah, yeah they right. Don't, they, like, don't, they don't work with license. Well, think about how that scene So that's illegal. Out, so, it is illegal, yeah. there's yeah. that, first of all. Um, yeah, but when people do illegal things, they tend to get in trouble for it. <sighs> so, two things. First off, relating to Lindus being okay with hiring these guys even if they aren't licensed, they are looking for a girl who is blackmailing Lindus with a sex tape that also has evidence of him committing fraud on behalf of her father. Lindus knows these guys are looking for her already. He offers them a handsome amount of money as a means of buying their loyalty, especially since he needs them to do something shadier for him than a licensed PI would be willing to. Just because Mahler doesn't believe he himself would hire an unlicensed PI does not mean it is outside the realm of plausibility for Lindus too. I have seen this argument used to defend absolutely baffling decisions from characters which are at total odds with how the characters were written, so I get why a lot of fans of Mauler and EFAP do not like this argument. But sometimes, it is in fact valid. Sometimes, someone makes a criticism that amounts to nothing more than appealing to personal incredulity. Unless that person is me, of course. I would never fall into this sort of tunnel vision myself. Why is Rosie still standing here? Why hasn't she cleared out of the area like everyone else? Yeah. I have plans to revisit that video pretty soon. In all seriousness though, we are not supposed to be doing this. We are supposed to be asking, well, why did this character do X when the thing they are doing is actually nonsensical? Like a trained soldier with a gun opting to close the distance on a target that is only a threat at close quarters, rather than shooting them from a safe distance. That's when, oh well, just because you wouldn't make this decision doesn't really cut it. That's when it's fair to ask why a character made an unbelievably stupid decision. A person hiring an unlicensed PI? There's any number of reasons one could be willing to do that. Because they're just more affordable, perhaps willing to work for collateral in a way that licensed PIs won't be. Perhaps it's for when you need something done that a licensed PI is unlikely to do because that would put them at risk of losing their license. I can't believe I'm actually having to spell out why some people might be willing to go outside the law when it comes to this sort of thing, but like, these are the arguments I'm dealing with. I am sorry if it sounds like I'm talking to a five-year-old. Alright, secondly, Mahler. Fringy. The basic premise of the show, whether you look it up on Wikipedia, IMDb, TV Tropes, Amazon, or FX's website, makes it explicitly clear that this show is about unlicensed PIs. The show makes this explicitly clear less than 13 minutes in that these guys are unlicensed. The first scene of the show features them doing a job that a licensed PI wouldn't do, and doing it for two weeks of free dry cleaning rather than any actual money. There is internal justification for why they are able to operate without licenses, based on the fact that one of them used to work for the local police force. A thing which, not only is your disbelief for completely unwarranted, but the fact that you can't even suspend that disbelief to give the writer a chance to make their case with this premise, is incongruent with a fundamental aspect of how we engage with stories, that even you morally inconsistent dumb fucks have preached about elsewhere. Lots of stories require you to accept premises which aren't exactly realistic. Fantasy stories require you to accept that magic exists and functions as demonstrated. Science 
fiction stories ask you to buy into the existence of technologies such as FTL drives and advanced robots. Even action films set in the modern day may ask you to accept that the protagonist is hardier than the average person. But this is all fine. It's part of the narrative deal. If plausibility alone define the quality of stories, any story which doesn't exactly mirror the real world would be bad and that's an absurd standard I never want to see applied to fiction. All that matters is internal consistency. For so long as a story establishes its own rules and follows them, it can be enjoyed without straining our suspension of disbelief. Just because a show doesn't have fantasy elements doesn't mean that it has to abide by real world rules, it just has to stay consistent to itself. If I'm watching a show set in the real world, it is completely reasonable for me to assume that the world is operating as I would expect it to unless I've been told otherwise. Well, that's nice, Fringy. Just one question. What if your understanding of the world is not accurate? Flashback. It's right. incredible that the fucking dumb takes keep on coming. Rags, an objective measurement of quality for an adaptation is faithfulness. Yeah, for an adaptation. Yeah. You don't think faithfulness equals quality, you're out of your dogged mind. So <laughs> I don't know why you think that faithfulness of a story as an adaptation to something else means that the film itself is bad based on characters writing story consistency with itself. You don't have to be consistent with because so this is why I started off by saying a historical at historical accuracy is an adaptation argument because it is because you're adapting a historical event in much the same way that now the shining is a shit movie because it is not faithful as an adaptation the haunting of hill house is a shitty tv show because it is not a faithful adaptation of the source material also i'm surprised this is taking everybody as shock like i would yeah. have thought they would all be on board with the idea that like you can't depict reality like I, saving private ryan gets attacked for different uh, historical inaccuracies a lot even the best, mm -hmm. uh, most beloved historical movies have problems. Uh, oftentimes you'll find that they argue it's like, yeah, well, of course they do, because you have to change things to make it a movie rather than a documentary. Um, yes. So, so The yeah. Shining is an adaptation of a fictional work, not real history. Literally wow. the same thing as an adaption. And it's literally the same thing. That's what an adaption is. When you it doesn't matter. Ad adapt a source it's into another thing. That's, yeah. Yes. Right. Um, also, Braveheart is one of, like, that That shit's filled with uh, inaccuracies, too. This is the thing. If you want to do this, it just takes you down a road that uh, kills a shit ton of the movies you probably think are very good, and it takes away from talking about what they've achieved with their writing. End of flashback. If it operates otherwise, you can probably assume that's the case, especially if it's not contradicting its own rules, LMAO. Dude. You know the show is good if the coverage of it includes, I don't know, the law doesn't work the same way in this world. Now, after having listened to and processed all of their arguments about the show from the watch party and their streams, I concluded that these weren't very good points. Shocking, I know. I talked about it a bit on my Discord server, and about a day later, in response to someone who was going off of something I had tweeted a week earlier when I was initially conceding to their arguments against the show, I then posted a thread of tweets giving an update of what I thought about what they said. I'm willing to go public with it now. Having had time to mull things over after an episode of self-doubt, I disagree with a staggering vast majority of their criticisms. A lot of it is based on ignorance of how US police operate, a failure to infer the most basic good faith assumptions, an inability to recognize the noble qualities in the two protagonists along with the selfish and impulsive qualities they share, and a complete misinterpretation of how the show frames its morally gray characters. The standard use to judge Hank and Britt would effectively fuck over characters like Doc Brown, Jack Sparrow, Batman, every superhero really considering the legality of vigilantism, Han Solo, Hello, Sean Spencer, John Wick, etc. Worst of all, several aspects of the show that they have mentioned on their streams have been grossly taken out of context, and rewatching the first episode with Pendulum and Madvocate recently has made that abundantly clear. I've noticed that a fair number of people have finally started watching it out of morbid curiosity after the EFAP take and seem to be just as confused by it as I am. I think it's one of those cases where it really will benefit you to watch it and come to your own conclusion. I don't mean to drag my friends here, I think this take in particular is a huge miss from them, and I know the feeling is mutual. They should be allowed to give their honest thoughts on their platform, and in turn, I'll give my own on my platform. Do not harass them, do not pester them. They don't like the show and never will, that's fine. Just watch the show for yourself and come to your own conclusion about whether these characters are evil or are framed as heroes or are just motivated by money. TLDR. 
I have come back around to believing that Terriers is still fucking fantastically written, and I still plan on making a video going into exhaustive detail as to why one day, ridicule me all you want for it, I can guarantee you that I do not give a fuck. So, you might notice that much of what's in this thread has been substantiated in gory detail at this point in this video, and that which hasn't will be later. The most pertinent one here is where I said ignorant as to how US police operate. Hopefully, you now have an understanding as to why I possibly would have said that. Now, as for how the statement was worded, I don't see anything at all wrong with what I said here. They had publicized their arguments first, they were now out in the public square, and their take was therefore subject to a public response, in which I explained where I disagreed with them in broad strokes as opposed to going into the finer details and utterly ripping into them as I easily could have and was well within my rights to. This thread was, for all intents and purposes, a pulled punch compared to what it easily could have been. If I changed out a couple of names here and had someone express disagreement with me about something like Spider-Man 2 or Civil War in this manner, that would be fine. I wouldn't take personal offense about it or insist that they listen to my arguments until they relented. As a matter of fact, the EFAP guys had just recently done that to me over what I'd said about Civil War. As for Civil War, like, again, heard a lot of the arguments before. I'm not worried about Civil War. Player. It's gonna be yeah, fine. Not at all. Con I've not at Civil all. Civil War many times. Pretty, You're pretty confident be better in that one. That. I believe you. They thought Terriers was good. What was that, Rex? <laughs> Nothing. Nothing. You're saying the quiet part out loud, I think. I think I spoke my mind on this matter as honestly as I could have, while still taking it easy on them and urging others to leave them alone. Now, after we go through all of their criticisms of the show, we're going to have to have a chat about how EFAP reacted to this thread of tweets. Spoiler alert. They didn't take kindly to it. However, there is a major highlight to their reaction, which was a message I received from Fringy 40 minutes after the thread was posted. Now, if someone is disputing your knowledge on a subject, you might want to hit them with a strong argument that firmly disproves what they've said. In this specific case, you would want the grossest, most absurd instance of the show disregarding how the law is enforced in order to make it an uphill battle to defend the show on this front. Ideally, this is something that a layman might miss, but a lawyer, a law student, or anyone who's done a little reading could see from a mile away. The creative liberties regularly taken with the Miranda warning and procedurals would be a clear example of this, except in this instance, you would want something a lot more significant, perhaps targeting something with major effects that bleed into several episodes episodes, if not all of the show. Fringy sees that the unlicensed PIs being unlicensed in a show about unlicensed PIs not getting in trouble for their lack of licenses and various other crimes due to their connections with the local police force, and a guy making an obvious joke under oath not being charged with perjury, aren't going to be critical issues for me. So if he wants to prove me wrong on this point, he's going to have to target the next most absurd part of how the show depicts law enforcement. And his leading argument was literally repeating all of his arguments pertaining to the U.S.-Mexico border and extradition, apparently believing that they were so airtight that they would actually refute my claim that these guys were ignorant as to how U.S. police operate. <laughs> of course, if there weren't enough issues with their arguments already, this message adds just a few more things to break down. For one, Fringy literally opens by admitting that what Brit does here is being done under duress, but that it isn't enough to get you off for a lot of crimes, which might be true depending on where you live. However, according to the Legal Code of California, where Brit lives, it is in fact applicable for any crime below homicide, making this part of Fringy's message a rhetorical trick in order to steer one away from taking a fact that immediately destroys his argument into consideration. That's not the only rhetorical trick in this message, however. He also mentions that Mexico has an extradition treaty with the United States. Now, to an uneducated person, this might sound like these countries have a mutual agreement to honor each other's extradition requests. But if you just read the text of the treaty itself, that is clearly not how it works. It is made explicitly clear on page 9 in the text of the treaty itself that extradition requests between countries are just that requests, meaning that they are not mandatory. They are up to the discretion of the country where the target is located, which can decline requests, because even if the crime was in fact committed, there are other factors to be taken into consideration. For instance, a requested country in which the death penalty is illegal is unlikely to extradite someone wanted for a crime where capital punishment is possible in the requesting country, not without an agreement from the requesting country that capital punishment will not be pursued against the target. And in this case, because of how much evidence there is available to prove that Brit would have been under duress, any effort to have him extradited would be a complete waste of time. Now, now, the actual argument itself around whether this is a valid criticism is over. Fringy doesn't have an argument here. We could easily just move on. But your honor, I'm not done. I might have already completely buried Fringy's credibility as any type of expert on law, but I'd be remiss if I were to skip over all the other ways in which his argument here crumbles, even if we were to ignore all of the context that he left out. One of those ways would be the fact that Mexico and the United States have differences in their judicial systems that cannot be ignored. To this day, as it would have been back then, Mexico's judicial system does not give defendants a jury of their peers. They just have a defense 
defense attorney who will argue with a prosecutor before a judge at whose mercy the defendant is. Meaning in order to even buy into this premise, we would have to accept that even if Brit was not acting under duress, the US would determine that Brit's crimes are bad enough to warrant giving up one of their own citizens to a judicial system even more prone to corruption and injustice than its own. And without a murder charge, we are only left with the possibility that they might extradite in that case. Of course, in order to get to that point, this extradition request has to be made in the first place, which barring the fact that he didn't phrase it as a request that can and most likely would be rejected due to the facts of the case, Fringy alleges would happen as soon as Brit pops back on the radar. So to determine if he got at least that part correct, let's take a quick gander at what the extradition request process actually looks like, according to the Kush Law Group's blog. So in order for Brit to be arrested, there would need to be a warrant for his arrest in the United States, which in order for them to list it in the first place, Mexico would have to reach out to the US federal government requesting extradition. But Mexico is not going to do that without first having evidence that Brit is in the US. They might know who Brit is, but that doesn't magically give them the ability to track him down outside of their jurisdiction if he is no longer in Mexico. And since he was snuck back into the US, there's no way for them to definitively determine where exactly he's gone. Now, it is possible for a detective in Tijuana PD to visit the US later on and by chance bump into Brit, but they won't have any authority to make an arrest on him. They would have to report back to their department and from there, they could try to contact their embassy in the US to begin the process of filing a request for extradition. This part of the argument here acts as though either Mexico's PD would just automatically be able to know where Brit is as soon as he uses a credit card or a cell phone, things that they would not have the legal authority to keep track of because that's well out of their jurisdiction, or the US would automatically know that there's a warrant for his arrest in a different country. This sort of thing is why in this same episode, after a warrant was issued on his arrest, Ray is established to have been able to flee the US and stay in Mexico without the cops in the US knowing where he was and being able to extradite him. So yeah, extradition is a legal process that's a little more complicated than a country arresting one of its own citizens because it just automatically knows that they're wanted in another country and then shipping them off to that country and that is before we even bother to factor in the appeal process that comes with it. You see, as a self-admitted layman on this matter, I can assure you your average American does not need to study law in order to know that habeas corpus is a sacred right granted by the US Constitution, ensuring that even if the powers that be entertain an extradition request in this context enough to get to this point, Brit will have a chance to plead his case with an attorney, and he wouldn't even need the help of the lawyer he actually works with, as any public defender catching a whiff of this could effectively get him released. And considering just how long of a shot it is, it's hard to even believe that Mexico would attempt to waste the money and time on this. At worst, they're probably going to just say whatever, but if he shows back up in here on his own volition, his ass is ours. And that's even assuming that upon being informed of what happened with all the evidence that Mark initially didn't have on him while in Tijuana, the cops in Mexico couldn't be reasoned with and convinced that Brit was much more of a victim than a criminal and decided to drop charges against him. It's worth mentioning how critically bankrupt you must be that you can't infer the cops would deduce that Brit was acting under duress. Chief and Jolly, is it a reasonable inference to just go, yeah, they would have contacted Mexico's police and been like, yeah, here's all the evidence that he was under duress. We're not giving him up. That just sounds like you're writing the script for the writer's southpaw. <laughs> <laughs> when basic like A to B happens, but it happens off screen, then we can't, we can't infer it. Yeah. We can't infer it. They don't explicitly have a whole like sequence dedicated to showing that the obvious happened. So like the fact that not every single moment of a story, like every single second of every minute of every hour of every day can be shown on screen. Otherwise the, the movie would like 30 million years 40 long. Hours long. 40 hours long. 40 hours long and really boring. fucking boring. That's the line, you've, come on. Okay, <laughs> I don't give a shit what Patrick Willems says. The point is, <laughs> you can't show every single, Ha wait, 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 Steve. How do you know that we were talking about Patrick Willems? We didn't say that it was Patrick yeah. Willems. You're ready for escape me. <laughs> the point I'm making is that not every single event that happens within the time frame of the story can be shown on screen. So, inferences have to happen in order for, for things to just sort of connect and continue um, in causation. So, we're at, if something we're at happens the... off screen that doesn't make sense given the information we have and what we see going forward, then it becomes a problem when you try to just infer this, that, or the other to like, you know, do mental gymnastics. But basic inferences based on what would logically happen, you know, like that that's the distinction, yeah. basically. That's the difference Sorry. between inferring and like writing the script for the writers, and I feel like that's worth yeah. highlighting. Yeah, we'll, we'll it, see. It basically, it comes down to how reasonable 
How reasonable is the inference? We can is, is always gonna be the baseline, right? We can infer a way that uh that Reva was able to force speed away from Anakin, that's how she survived. Didn't you hear? So. He actually let her live on in order sixty six <laughs> intentionally. Well so, so, so you know that the grand the grand inquisitor has two stomachs and that's why he survived. <laughs> so if you have managed to be fooled by Fringy's criticism here, don't worry. The government actually can't just kidnap you and ship you off to another country because they say they want you behind bars. You actually will get a hearing and a chance to have the extradition request denied. And that's assuming the government even goes far enough to issue a warrant for an arrest after learning of these extreme circumstances in which their citizen in question is being prosecuted for crimes that they were forced to commit under duress. Is that really how they do it in Australia? Man, and I thought the wildlife over there was an issue. Y'all must be living under some heartless fascists. Oh! <laughs> I'm sorry, I keep forgetting, you were sick the day they taught law at law school! The only thing that could possibly defend this argument at this point is if this exact scenario played out in the real world. With someone in Brit's exact position being extradited by their native country to one where they were kidnapped and had their loved one threatened. Even with the exact amount of evidence and close connections in their local law enforcement to vouch for them on this matter that you'd think would help them avoid arrest or even convince an extradition panel to release them. And if this completely unheard of story has ever actually happened, it was never cited by Fringy to make what he's arguing even a tiny bit credible, and to this day, neither I nor anyone aware of this message have seen something that could back it up. And yet, somehow, we are still not finished going through everything in Fringy's message. Because he then moves on from episode 8 to talk about something that Brit does towards the end of the show. Now, let's be fair, just because everything else Fringy has said pertaining to the border and extradition and law in general has been wrong, does not automatically mean that these next arguments must therefore be wrong. So it's only fair that we give him a chance and see if he makes a valid point here. So, let's take a look at what arguments Fringy is making here. Number 1. Brit literally could have killed the guy he beat up. Number 2. Brit is only sentenced to prison for a year. Number 3. Brit initially considers this light punishment to be too much and is tempted to flee the country to escape punishment for it. And number 4. Brit would just get caught in Mexico because he would still be wanted for the crimes he committed in episode 8. So for context, in the 10th episode of the show, Katie, who discovered in the previous episode that she is pregnant, admits her pregnancy to Brit along with the fact that she doesn't know who the father might be, because she cheated on him. In her mind, at least. It's a long story. The short version of it is that she was taken advantage of by her professor, who drove her to his place while she was drunk. She believes that it's her fault, which is what she tells both Hank and Brit. There's a whole other can of worms to EFAP's analysis on this subject, and how some of their fans have been arguing about it, without having first watched the show for themselves. For now, let's just stay on target. There's an emotionally intense confrontation in which they break up. In the next episode, he happens upon a photograph taken of her and a classmate on a night that they were out drinking with the rest of the vet school class that they were a part of, and naturally jumps to a paranoid conclusion in the midst of being an emotional basket case. He knows the guy goes to this bar because the sign for the bar is actually caught in the background of a photo of him and Katie singing karaoke that he posted to his social media. He waits outside the bar for him, and, thinking he's the guy, he assaults him. This plot point is something that they harped on quite a bit, both in this live stream before I posted my Twitter thread, and in their server after that thread was posted. And then Britt proceeds to beat this man almost to death. Um, wrong dude, just FYI. And, uh, and the- It doesn't matter, in any and, case, and, and, but, yeah. Oh, it's just, it's just good to know for the audience, oh, I suppose. Fuck me. That so, sounds like a- you can't- and even if it was the right guy, you can't beat the shit out exactly. of somebody. Exactly. It's terrible. There's so many tears. It's like tier uh, one of, he did it, and he did it knowingly, and he hates me. It's like, you still can't beat him to death. It's like, okay. But this guy didn't know, as far as you know, that you were involved. Is just doing his fucking human rights. Just being like, hey, girl, I like you. Do you like me? Let's do stuff. Which is totally allowed. Even if... They're, they're entangled with someone else. You could say it's bad etiquette, but I mean, we're talking about love here. It gets complicated. Then, of course, it's not even the guy who did it. It's just a Randy who's <laughs> connected, sure, but like he's just like, oh, God. And, like, this guy is beaten to fuck, and of course he's pressing charges. Thank fuck the show managed to pull through on that. And our wonderful main character is like, oh, man, I'm probably going to go to prison. Like a whole year. As you should, yeah. A year. <laughs> a year. A whole year. year. For you're lucky. Man. You are so lucky that you're only getting a year. That's more than you. That's less than you deserve. He doesn't even have any remorse for the fact that he did it. The show isn't so aware that he's done anything. Monster. It's like Black Widow. They they have no idea. Yeah. Um. And so just monster. And his friend is like, hey, how about we just go to Mexico? <laughs> Yeah, like, so, so, yeah, the gist is, right at the end, he's driving him to prison, it's like 25th hour, except terrible, instead of good, um, and it's like, hey, I could take you to prison for a year, and then we'll get back out and get up, back up to stuff, or, we could go to Mexico, again, 
once you get to the border, oh, hey, you're in trouble in Mexico. Also, you're in trouble in America. Oh, and you're, you're taking him to a different country. Huh. You're both going to jail. Yep. Um, so that, so in, in my head, because I hate these guys, the canonical ending is they were so stupid that they went to Mexico, got arrested, and got sent to jail for the rest of their lives. And then Hank was... For all of the crimes they committed throughout <laughs> the whole season. The and they season. were definitely separated. We're putting yes, different prisons. Absolute, one of them is in America, one of them has gone to Mexico. Yeah. And that's it. They're, they're in forever. Awful um, people, terrible yeah, plotting, that's... complete disregard for law and order, just an ab utter disregard for how the law functions or how police operate. It's awful. So, first off, I just want to highlight that nowhere in that stream of arguments did they call out any inconsistencies. They are literally just complaining that the characters are not good people and that the show is unaware that these characters are bad. Mahler said so right here. And to be fair, some of the content that EFAP covers does have this issue, and it's a valid thing to take issue with when it pops up, even if it doesn't create a plot hole. Surely, we don't like it when stories just gloss over the main character doing something morally reprehensible by not having any other characters react accordingly to that, or by presenting what the main character does as righteous, which is what EFAP is claiming that Terriers is guilty of. I am coming from the opposite position at both angles. I think that the EFAP hosts are grossly exaggerating how bad the main characters are, I happen to think they comfortably fit within the morally dubious anti-hero paradigm, not villains as EFAP make them out to be throughout their coverage, and I also think that the EFAP hosts are ignoring where the show does acknowledge the actual faults of the main characters and has them either get criticized or face consequences for their actual character flaws, and not the ones that EFAP just made up from whole cloth. I'll go into that aspect in further detail later in this video, but for now, let's just focus on this one topic. Alright, now this set of criticisms is a bit of a tangled clusterfuck between what Fringy says in his message and what all the EFAP hosts said on their stream and on their server, but let's do our best to unpack this both from a legal and a moral standpoint. So, first off, let's talk about the way in which Mahler and Fringy frame this, frequently referring to this as nearly beating a man to death. Now, what they're most likely referring to is this exchange. Salt, battery, pretty serious shit. He could have killed the kid. But he didn't. The only thing he got going for him. So that's a line of dialogue being spoken by Mark, who hasn't seen Gavin at all, who's likely in the hospital at the moment he says this. Now, if we never see Gavin after this, then perhaps that line of dialogue would be enough. The problem is, we do see him in the very next episode, which is set on the very next day, and as you can see, he's clearly seen better days, but I can't help but say that claiming that Brit nearly beat him to death would be a complete exaggeration. Mark can say he could've, could've killed, killed the kid, but that seems to be more of a figure of speech rather than a precise assessment of the extent of the damages, especially in contrast to what is actually shown to us. It would be like if I were to say that Hank nearly beats Jesse to death in Breaking Bad. He clearly beats him to a pulp and sends him to a hospital, but nearly beating someone to death carries a specific connotation to it for someone who can only be going off of what these guys are saying. That connotation would be someone carrying an intent to kill, as opposed to just taking one's rage out on someone they hate, but stopping short of killing them. To clarify, I'm not trying to excuse what Brit does here, but in order to push back against this exaggeration, it may well sound like that's what I'm doing. Uh, one of the first things me and Jay talked to each other about was how, like, why are... We're in spoilers, who cares? We've said this already. Why are the two Spider-Mans getting drawn in? How does the logic work? Is it because they, they're aware that themselves that they are they Peter? So why would... And if that's but maybe, the case, MJ could be here. I'm gonna question the narrator. Why do we think the Doctor Strange is 100% correct about the nature true. of the spell having gone wrong? Oh, he says, true, true. He says everyone's getting drawn in who knows who you are. When it's like, could it, could it be something else? Could it just be people who are related to visions of Peter in any way? That probably is a better explanation. Um, it's not the one that he gives, but maybe he's wrong, yeah. I don't know what, yeah, because, like, mm. it, it, it seems like there's too many variables that go against what Strange is saying, so either and, and Strange is wrong... Be... Yeah. Or... Um, I think while, while, I think, while I think we're probably supposed to buy Strange's explanation, well, Strange isn't omniscient oh. within the universe, so, like, it is completely plausible well, that he's wrong. Well, here's your big counter. Venom, in yeah, the Venom Tony is... movies, has no idea who Peter is, because the, the, yeah. like, there are no superheroes, as far as we're aware, in that universe. 80 billion light years of hive knowledge across universes would explode your tiny little brain. So him being oh. there has to... Either that doesn't make any sense, or Doctor Strange is wrong. Some people are saying that's right um, in the movie. It's literally not. Whether a strange is wrong is up to us. We got the content. Decide. Is that why the spell at the end of the movie that makes everyone forget who Peter Parker is is what sends everyone back to their native continuities? I'm not counting what happens in Morbius, of course. That's not on the writers of No Way Home as far as I'm aware. So I've elected to ignore it. 
because the context would seem to indicate yeah. that but, like, like, we don't add story. anything there um to the story no. there's like two into like you can interpret any line of dialogue as not true like that's like what you, anything that any character says unless you're explicitly shown that event you can think well maybe that's not true so, like so just to address, because someone said that's headcanon, so what we see in the film is that people who didn't know his identity were there, and Doctor Strange said that that was why they were there. So there is something here that is irreconcilable. Either he's wrong, or it's a problem. Okay, so if it's convenient to your argument, you can just interpret a line of dialogue which was literally written in to provide an explanation to the viewers for how the actors from older movies with different continuities have shown up on Earth 199999 to just be wrong, even though the explanation is coming from a wizard. But also, you can interpret a regular person's figure of speech to be literal and gospel. Got it. Mahler and Fringy latching onto this line from Mark in order to paint Britain as villainous a light as they can reeks of being desperate, perhaps even disingenuous. Ultimately, it's up to you to decide which one of those is more likely. But either way, at this point, it's fair to argue that they have likely developed a harsh bias against Brit, which is not good if their shtick is to judge things separately from their own biases. Anyways, let's move on to the next point. Mahler and Fringy present this as though the show is oblivious that this is wrong for Brit to do. Um, wrong dude, just FYI. And uh, and the, it doesn't matter in any and, case. And, and, but, yeah, oh, it's just it's right. just good to know for the audience, oh, I suppose. Okay. Both of those statements are correct, and the show literally addressed this. Dude, I beat up the wrong guy. Yeah, beating up the right guy would have made it fine. This is not the only time that Mahler and Fringy act as if the show is unaware that what Britt did here was wrong. The show isn't so, aware that he's done anything. It's like Black Widow. They they have no idea. That is false. This is just blatantly factually inaccurate because Brit gets called out several times by many other characters in the show. That was my friend at the DA's office. They're coming at you with both barrels. That means aggravated battery. That means three years in the pen if they hit the jackpot. What? You sent that kid to the emergency room. If I had my choice, I'd be prosecuting this case. So, Maggie Lefferts filled me in on your case, and I'd like to say that I'm sympathetic to your plight, but... I think I'm more sympathetic to the kid whose face that you redesigned. I'm not really sure why I should pull any strings in your case at all. The uh, police report is right there. Rick Pollock. That's your boyfriend, right? Yeah. Gavin, I, I'm so sorry. I, I'm so sorry. Britt did something pretty awful. After I, I did something awful, it was mostly my fault. You beat that kid to a pulp. I think it's a good deal. I saw Gavin. He's messed up. Do you I love you, Katie. That's all, that, that's all that matters. I love you too. But I can't trust someone who's capable of doing what you did. Please don't come around here again. The show isn't so, aware that he's done anything. It's like Black Widow. They, they have no idea. We may be meant to sympathize with and root for Brit in general, but that does not mean that the show endorses everything he does, least of all this action. Hence why the other characters react accordingly to it. Seems like pretty standard writing for an anti-hero protagonist. Alright, the next part of Fringy's message is the implied complaint that Brit's sentence is far too lenient, which was also talked about on the stream. And our wonderful main character is like, Oh man, I'm probably gonna go to prison. Like a whole year. As you should, yeah. A year. A <laughs> whole year. year. For brutally you're beating lucky. Man. You are so lucky that you're only getting a year. That's more than you. That's less than you deserve. So I looked up what the standard legal punishment in California is for aggravated battery, which is what Britt is charged with in the show, since, you know, he didn't literally nearly beat Gavin to death. They're coming at you with both barrels. That means aggravated battery. That means three years in the pen if they hit the jackpot. And the punishment for that is a maximum of four years in prison, but it could result in a sentence as low as two, which Brit is sentenced with. Two years? Well, I can't do two years in prison, Maggie. Worst case scenario, a year's jail time. 
I can't do a year in prison, Maggie. Not one year, as Fringy suggested, though it could be reduced to one year on good behavior. Mahler and Fringy believe it is absurd that Britt is getting a lighter sentence than he deserves because they have exaggerated the extent to which he assaulted Gavin and thus incorrectly categorized what the charges should be. And the accurate punishment for the charges that Britt would have been pressed with is in fact what the show presents. Fringy and Mahler can take issue with the standard sentence for this offense being as low as it is in the state, but I was under the impression that they were miffed that the show was not accurately depicting legal proceedings, which is not only an adaptation argument, it is, so far, a factually inaccurate one. How embarrassing. How embarrassing. Now, if they are complaining that Brit thinks this light sentence is too harsh, I'm pretty sure that the writers are not in agreement with his perspective here, which is why his lawyer tells him, You beat that kid to a pulp. I think it's a good deal. Just keep that in mind. I'm not done with it yet. So the next point brings up the final scene of the show, in which Hank is driving Britt to prison in accordance with his order to surrender. And on their way there, they stop at an intersection, and Hank offers Britt an option to go live in Mexico instead. There's a number of reasons why Hank could be making Britt this offer. It could simply be a test of his character. I personally believe that Hank offering this option to Britt is informed by the fact that Katie had told Hank that she had cheated the morning after, and had only kept it hidden from Britt for the next four episodes at Hank's insistence. Oh my god, he's never gonna forgive me. No, he's not. Because you're not going to tell him. What? You're going to lie to him. This never happened. I mean, I tell him everything. He can never know about this. And I know this might kill you a little bit, and it might eat you up inside a little bit, but you'll kill him more if he, if he knew. Okay? The kid you pummeled, she didn't sleep with him. What are you talking about? How do you know? Because I've known. Because Katie told me. When? When it first happened, she was desperate. She hated herself. She made a mistake. She made a grievous goddamn mistake. She was lost and she didn't want to lose you, so I told her not to tell Because I knew what you would do, and look what you did, man! And look where you're at! You should have just listened to me and walked away! Hank would naturally be feeling responsible for what Britt is about to go to jail for, and, although making progress across the season at making amends with his old partner Mark, is still shown to have a ways to go with making amends with his ex-wife, and can't fully rid himself of his self-destructive traits that are fleshed out across the season and explicitly spelled out at the end of the second episode. You are a good friend. I give you credit for that. But you gotta know he is gonna let you down. God knows that I love Hank. But it is not in Hank Dalworth to do anything but self-destruct on people. And when he does, everybody catches shrapnel. <laughs> I got the scars to prove it. What could be a more fitting way for Hank's arc to intersect with Brit's than for him to cast himself as a devil on Brit's shoulder as a result of said traits, while Brit is trying to become a more responsible adult in preparation for fatherhood? The two of them think about this for a moment. The light turns green. Hank asks Brit, So what do you say, partner? Which way will it be? In the scene, episode, and show ends right there, not answering definitively which way they go. Mahler and Fringy bang on a lot about this scene and their coverage at a morality angle, which we'll get to momentarily. But first, I just want to mention that Fringy hasn't criticized Britt for a choice he's actually made, but just for entertaining this as an option. That's because, according to them, Britt doesn't even feel remorse for assaulting Gavin. He doesn't even have any remorse for the fact that he did it. Britt does spend most of the next couple of episodes in a state of denial that he did anything wrong. But here's the thing. When he tries to minimize what he did, he immediately gets pushed back from his lawyer. What? I, I got in a bar fight. No, this was no bar fight. A bar fight is two drunk guys getting in a slap fest over a waitress. You laid in wait, Brit. When he later talks to Katie and she mentions Gavin, he asks about how he's doing. I saw Gavin. How is he? He's messed up. When he tries asking Katie to take him back, she rejects him, on the basis of what he did to Gavin. Then, after he's had some time to process everything, he accepts that he deserves to go to jail. I'm going to prison, Katie. I deserve to go. I mean, I earned it. I um, also need to prove to you that I can take responsibility. When I get out, I want to be the baby's father. And I want to be with you. You know, if you'll take me, don't give up on me yet. Flashback. There's a lot of relevant stuff that's very meaningful to what you're trying to say that you cut out and didn't talk about. There is a lot of stuff that you cut off that is relevant, specifically relevant, or it's stuff that completely contradicts the things that you are saying. End of flashback. So, 
That's right, they've completely left out that this is part of a character arc, along with all the other times they've already taken the show out of context. Oh, it is a fucking surprise. Maybe they just forgot about all those scenes. You might as well complain about Ebenezer Scrooge being a selfish, exploitative, joyless old coot even after you finish A Christmas Carol. The broader point here is, it's natural for people to be reluctant to accept the consequences of their own actions and dodge being held accountable for it if they can, at least initially. In addition, Brit is never shown definitively choosing to try to go to Mexico instead of prison. That's the final scene of the show. The show ends on a cliffhanger. Now, that there isn't a canonical answer for what Brit decides allows for room for interpretation among the audience. Has Brit grown to a point where he's willing to face the music, or will he regress and choose to skip town and try to dodge his jail sentence? Neither answer is really wrong. It's okay to argue either one, but if you're trying to criticize it on the basis of what it is trying to communicate about its main characters, then it's worth factoring in what the author's intent was. While I think that this ending is fitting for the main themes about its main characters, and its ambiguity is fitting for the style of show that it's going for, it's worth remembering that this wasn't intended to be the very last we would see of these characters. This was intended to be a cliffhanger for a season finale that would be followed up with a second season. And sure enough, both the show's creator and Donald Logue later went on to reveal that had there been one, they would have revealed that Brit chose to go to prison and serve his sentence. Isn't that refreshing, when someone is willing to fall on their sword when they see where they've done wrong? Anyways, this is a scene which would have been written with the intent of giving Brit a source of temptation to avoid responsibility for his actions once again, which he then would have been shown to reject in favor of showing his growth as a person. When trying to argue that Brit is this irredeemable monster that the writer has no idea is an irredeemable monster, it's probably best that you don't use a scene in which, as it was written, the purpose was for Brit to show maturity and integrity in spite of being offered a chance to avoid paying the consequences for his actions. Just because that isn't explicitly confirmed in the show itself does not mean that that context isn't there. If Mahler thinks that how Brit initially responds to his sentencing is a proper rebuttal to this point, that is tantamount to saying that someone who ultimately agrees they deserve to pay the consequences for their misdeeds must be a truly bad person because there's still a part of them that even considers avoiding punishment which is thought crime. Of course, in their server, Wick pointed out that the show doesn't confirm that Brit tries to flee as they boldly claim he does, to which Fringy says that, in his headcanon, they flee and get caught. This is, of course, a repeat of what he said on their stream. So in, in my head, because I hate these guys, the canonical ending is they were so stupid that they went to Mexico, got arrested, and got sent to jail for the rest of their lives. And then Hank was- For all of the crimes they committed throughout <laughs> the whole, the whole and season. And they were definitely separated. We're putting yes, different prisons. Absolute, one of them is in America, one of them has gone to Mexico. Yeah. And that's it. They're, they're in forever. Yeah. 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 Yes. Well, that's nice, Fringy, but when I'm trying to honestly grade the quality of someone's writing, I don't give a fuck about anyone's worthless headcanon, least of all yours. Additionally, we've already gone over why it's perfectly reasonable to assume that Tijuana's police would have dropped charges against Brit on the basis of him clearly being under duress, even if we aren't explicitly shown this step in the investigation, which we know would have taken place, and we even see taking place, after the events of the episode. But, if you want to engage with the show in comically bad faith, you might latch onto that as a sign of a massive plot hole. Hank forgot about all the crimes Brit committed in Mexico. If you want to engage it in good faith, however, you might say that this is a heavy implication that Brit's name was in fact cleared to Tijuana PD sometime after the end of the episode. Then there's the fact that a second season would have revealed that Brit would have chosen jail. Of course, that second season doesn't exist, and now what was meant to be nothing more than a temporary cliffhanger has been repurposed into an ambiguous ending that could be read either way. But if that interpretation is meant to be coming from not just a regular audience member, but someone who is supposed to be a critic, and that interpretation will have a judgment of the writer attached, this sort of statement is just the epitome of bad faith. I'm going to act as though your character did the opposite of what you would plan to do for your cancelled sequel, and went against their character arc as a means of condemning them. Fucking hell, just nakedly bad faith criticism on full display here. And then, finally, as for how good of an idea it would be for Brit to flee to Mexico if he wants to avoid punishment, Mexico would still be an easier place for an American wanted fugitive to live in hiding than in their own country, not least of which has to do with how there will be fewer records of them in Mexico, making it easier for them to get a fresh start and less likely that Mexico's law enforcement will be as efficient at tracking down Brit as San Diego's or most other police departments in the United States. And that's before even considering how notoriously corrupt, overworked, and underfunded Mexico's police force is going to be. Seriously, I wouldn't be surprised if Uvalde PD changed their motto to, at least we aren't Tijuana PD. As for whether they would be stopped at the border, I can assure you, that is not a guarantee at all. They might look at their passports, but convicted criminals with orders to surrender and fugitives with warrants for their arrest are known to be able to cross the border all the time. As established earlier, 
earlier in the section, CBP is not nearly as thorough as Fringy thinks they are, which is why people try to smuggle contraband and other people across the border all the time. Because much of the time, it does work. In the same sense, fugitives and convicted criminals are constantly trying to get across the border, because much of the time, that does work. CBP might be able to stop some at the border, but that does not mean that they can stop all of them. Of course, the fact that this isn't a guarantee doesn't mean that it's a good idea. It isn't, and the show is aware of this. I know what you're thinking. It crosses everyone's mind. Can I run? Where would I go? Is it worth it? They may lose track of you for a while, but they will not forget you. You beat that kid to a pulp. I think it's a good deal. That being said, it's still not implausible for someone in Brit's position to consider it. We might know that something is a bad idea and likely to fail, but our minds can still consider the possible benefits that we might reap from it if it doesn't fail, especially if the alternative is certain to have an undesirable outcome. This is something that many people in situations like this one are bound to naturally consider, thanks to our self-preservation instincts. And the show does not condone this. Just because you don't think that you would do this yourself does not mean that the character is acting out of character, that they are framed positively for this in the story, or that they are now an irredeemable monster. They are just a flawed character, with a mixture of selfish and noble qualities. So, considering the degree to which Fringy just got pretty much everything incorrect in this message, how did he decide to cap off this monumental faceplant? Please explain to me how what I've just outlined is wrong, since I'm clearly ignorant of how the US police operate. You got me. You're gonna look at me and you're gonna tell me that I'm wrong? Am I wrong? So Fringy's just admitted under oath that he doesn't know what he's talking about. I'm going to have to say a bunch of unkind things, and there's really no way around that, because the observable facts are just prima facie unkind. Now, at the time, I was trying to put it as delicately as I could have without just calling Fringy an idiot. But I guess using the word ignorant warranted the spiteful gish gallop, as if it was to be taken as anything beyond a description of someone who lacks the knowledge relevant to their criticisms. No idea why I would have possibly come to that conclusion. This is just this is just one of the things where I'm like, for a guy who claims he went to law school or did a law degree, he seems to know fuck all about how the law actually applies in practice. Please do your research, guy. Like you're meant to fuck me. This is the thing, right? Like, if they were just but just subjective critics, then like fair, I mean, like, you're still an idiot at that point, but like fair, that's just your opinion, man. <laughs> like, the second you start setting up, I was like, oh, the reason we were so harsh with Southpaw is that we were giving this, this show like our, our full attention as objective media critics. I'm like, then where the fuck is your research? It offends me as an act, let, let alone that it, it annoys me because of, like they mistreated someone I've come to view as a friend. Like, mm -hmm. as an academic, it annoys the fuck out of me because I'm like, how the fuck do you hold yourself to any kind of level of professional credibility when you can't even be bothered to do the most basic of research? And to think that Fringy sent this message because he was insulted that I just said he was ignorant on the subject. I still chuckle when thinking about what Fringy said in the EFAP talk that they went to Mexico, but they would get arrested. Like, who writes this show? You mean to tell me that this was the best that he could have come up with when someone expressed doubts on his credibility as an expert on the law? Pathetic. You must be upset. Are you upset? It just goes to show. It actually is more of an indictment on you if, in response to criticism, you get really pissed off. Like, then it is to just be like, yeah, okay, that's, that's, I'll take that into account. And of course, you can disregard it because it might just be shit criticism. Power is in your hands, all right? How you yeah. respond to criticism is more important than how the criticism is delivered to you. And you know, it would have been one thing if Fringy was a self-admitted layman on the subject, or at least humbly raised these potential issues in the form of questions and admitted that his knowledge might have been limited here. But that didn't happen. He overconfidently made these arguments as someone who allegedly went to university for law, a nebulous credential that Mahler boasted about in private and public to insist that they knew what they were talking about. What a sick joke! I gotta save this. You only get to see a cell phone of this magnitude once in a lifetime. Complete disregard for law and order. Just an utter disregard for how the law functions or how police operate. It's awful. The Dunning-Kruger effect is essentially the idea that whenever you start upon anything, but specifically like a creative skill, when you start, you have an incredibly high level of confidence, but your skills are shit. Um, and and you, uh... you, are so, you are so confident, like you are so very confident in your ability to do this. But then, and the reason why you're so confident is because you, you kind of don't know what good is yet. And then you know, you start figuring it out when you learn a little bit more about the craft and your confidence, poor, just, 
craters. It goes down. It's it's a it's a steep drop, and um, it's it's this point where I think a lot of people quit. Essentially, the less you know about something, uh, it, think of it as a spectrum in terms of those who don't know yeah. much about a topic think they know a whole lot more than they do. And the people who actually do know a lot about a topic are also confident in how much they know. And people who are kind of in the middle are generally the most accurate about how much they really know about something. It's it's like the lower the lower skill you have, or the more less knowledge you have, the more es the higher estimation of your knowledge and skill you have, basically. Bloody procedural detective show that gets fuck all right about law or detectives. Embarrassing. Yeah, Mahler. If only the writers watched as many police procedurals as you and Fringy did. Oh! But it's okay! Because in episode 8 of Terriers, nobody checked the car at the border! So really, this show knows nothing about COPS! Fuck off! Where did you study law, Fringy? On a farm! Though to be honest, a farm would probably have more educational value than whatever university Fringy went to, assuming he didn't just flunk out. Is that why Mahler made sure not to say anything more specific than just the fact that he went to university for law? I went to college! Maybe I'm just being a bit paranoid. Anyway, I prefer to assume Fringy actually had a 4.0 GPA because the idea that Australia's universities are just that enough is way funnier. Am I the only good Australian? Like, honestly? <laughs> Flashback. Why is it that a random schmo managed to outwit somebody about writing who's been taught it professionally? It's like, oh, is it because education doesn't necessarily mean you're smarter than someone else? End of flashback. In all seriousness, however, on the incredibly tiny off chance that he is actually a practicing attorney, then I would like to extend my deepest condolences to anyone unfortunate enough to get represented by him. Like almost the rest of their criticisms of this show, this particular set of arguments has become quite the meme amongst my circle of friends, to the point where even though it was an inside joke, they couldn't resist making a reference to it in their own videos. When Wu saw Ying Li's dead bloodied corpse with his own fucking eyes, he probably buried her himself. Nobody checked the body at the grave. Oh, did I mention that Mysterio's body had a motion capture suit that would have been found as well? Sorry, the most obvious one went over my head. Nobody checked the body in the hallway. Well, now it's no longer an inside joke. Everyone may now join in on the fun of mocking this completely brain-dead criticism. If they want to still make fun of Patrick Bohms for this five years later, then I'm afraid EFAPS fans are going to have to deal with hearing about this forever. That might sound harsh, but what can I say? Nobody checked himself before he wrecked himself. You know that you can't just be doing that. That's just the thought I was <laughs> No, you'd make a spot. shitty lawyer. You know, <laughs> hey. Wow. wow. Resorting to personal attacks. Thank you for playing. Should we or should we not follow the advice of the galactically stupid? <laughs> And you know what? While we're here, why don't we talk about a few more of their other criticisms? There's this bit where they talk about the third episode. Remember how they needed, <laughs> the protagonist needed a big loan, and he just happens, to, the fucking CEO needs a job from a PI, it happens to overhear that he needs a loan. This contrivance happens at the beginning of the episode, right after the opening credits. If I may talk for a second about the building blocks of storytelling, there are times where, because there wouldn't be a story without this, is insufficient as a defense to a criticism of a major contrivance. However, almost all stories begin from some coincidence that breaks away from the status quo and incites the plot. Which is why, although we don't want stories to be constantly advanced forward or resolved by coincidences, no one in their right mind gets fussy over what is a story's inciting incident. Flashback. So, Aang's been uh, frozen for a hundred years. Um, right. And he wakes up, or he's woken up, um, by what I think a lot of people would call, like, like it wasn't like a cause and effect thing, it was like, oh my goodness, like he's, he's stumbled across, which is fine. But uh, within the next few months, if my timeline's correct, he, like, is able to uh, sort of deal with two, what I would call very, at least by the world's rules from what I understand, extremely mm -hmm. rare galactic events that like had he woken up a few months or let's say a year later uh, he would have lost essentially, like the Fire Nation would have uh, taken over completely because of Sozin's Comet mm -hmm. um, so I guess what I'm saying is like, wow it's really convenient timing that he managed to wake up before what they establish is going to be their only chance to take out the Fire Nation during the Black Sun and uh, before Sozin's Comet fully arrived, um, despite being asleep for a hundred years. Uh, obviously that is, what I'm talking about is the premise of the show at that point, you, you, but 
Do you, do you see what I mean? End of flashback. When this was brought up to Mahler on his Discord server, he mocked the idea that the third episode could have an inciting incident, as if the person was saying that this was the inciting incident of the show, and not of the storyline confined to this episode. Speaking of which, there's this strange bit in the watch party where Mahler was complaining about the inciting incident of the first episode, and acted as though what kicked off the events of the plot was the very first scene, when the reality is that scene only existed to introduce the main characters in their status quo. I didn't even know this was on there until after they sent it to him. That's... It's Linda's talking about his Montague development. It's a crock of shit. He gets the state. <laughs> he did that after... Okay. It's not even happening. What is... Yeah, you got a phone call after doing the act. Man, that's unlucky for him, huh? I mean, that's, that's yeah. the inciting incident, basically. Uh, is it? The inciting incident was the first scene we had. This so stuff still happened later. Th this is the reason why the girl went missing in the first place. <laughs> Muller. Do you fucking know what an inciting incident is? Alright, you know what? Fuck it. Class is in session. Take a seat. What? Mahler seems to be of the belief that an inciting incident is just the first scene in any story, no matter the context. That's the only reason I can think of for why he would simply assume that the first scene was meant to serve that purpose, even though it ultimately ended up being mostly inconsequential to the rest of the story. An inciting incident is when something happens in order to kick off the main plot. Typically, this can be a coincidence or even a form of contrivance, but they're a lot easier to forgive because without them, the story just simply wouldn't have happened at all, and we would all be none the wiser. The essential difference between a contrivance and an inciting incident that's contingent on a convenience is that the former happens once the story has already started, meaning that it relies on stretching cause and effect in order to happen, whereas the latter is what's necessary for cause and effect to matter in the first place. You can criticize R5 breaking down on the Lars homestead because that isn't the inciting incident of the story. The story had already begun, and now for it to continue as is, this huge convenience needs to happen in order for R2 to be bought by Owen Lars, so that he can make his way to Ben Kenobi and so that Luke can be involved in the journey. Alternatively, you wouldn't criticize this film for the fact that the Rebels stole the Death Star plans off-screen and that the Empire managed to catch up to them over Tatooine, which coincidentally just so happens to be where our main character lives. Because even putting aside that the Rebels are there for Obi-Wan and Obi-Wan was tasked to watching over Luke, all that matters for the sake of this narrative is that Luke is a simple kid on a farm who yearns for adventure, and it just so happens to find him because some far-off war made its way to his humble little planet. Both are massively coincidental when ignoring the larger canonical context that didn't exist when this movie came out, but only one of them is a genuine issue with the film, while the other is not. I guess what I'm suggesting with this is like, you know like the whole prologue, how exciting and engaging and informative it all is? And if someone was like, well yeah but you know, that's, that's the setup, or, or like it gets brushed away because it's not it's before the inciting incident or something like this. This yeah, it's, and, all <clears throat> it's all important. That's why it's an there. inciting in an <laughs> inciting incident is not just the first action scene. Exactly, that's kind of what I'm getting at. I I find this yeah, the way we're framing this very strange. Well, so know. it's complicated, like, right? Because generally, the inciting incident, when you think about it from the POV of the main character, is the thing that disrupts their normal situation. It is it is things have changed and now they have to progress from there. So you could say the inciting incident was them just moving to Arrakis, because that is the change. Or or even more so, the fact of them getting, like you said earlier, I would go or, or right the, the Emperor's Decree, I feel like when that happens, yeah. everything else happens. The story has been yeah. incited, yes. Things um, would carry on as they typically would in this world, but this, the, the reason that in this world, this is what our story is about, is because of this event in the world. So you do know the difference! The inciting incident was the first scene we had. This so, stuff still happened later. Mahler kind of forgot what an inciting incident is. Circling back to episode 3, there's also this bit. Yeah, at the end of the episode, um, it, it all goes wrong and the dude's basically like, man, fuck you. Um, and then our main character leaves, the dude jumps- <laughs> he kills himself, he jumps out of the window and kills himself. But the paperwork is right there, the paperwork for his mortgage. So what he does is he forges this now dead man signature on the documents to get the loan for his house. What a great guy, man. What a good guy you are. I'm gonna kill myself! What Franny left out here, of course, is that in the actual scene in the show, Hank does, in fact, get his loan for his mortgage approved. So why don't you go ahead and sign my goddamn loan doc? This concludes our business. Mr. Dalworth. I never want to lay eyes on you again. Looks like you're gonna have to lay eyes on me again. You forgot to sign the title insurance policy page.
The guy signing it just missed a signature on one page before killing himself, making what Hank does here more dubious than outright evil as EFAP claims, while they also act as if the show is framing this in a positive manner. Flashback. Think of Iron Man too. The amount of people he's killed me he didn't need to. Oh Stun. yeah, remember I... that that town that he was in? Like I, I forget the the name of it in the first Iron Man movie. Like he punches a guy up like into a two story building and like it explodes when he hits the wall. It's like yeah, he kills tons you, of people. Do you know movie. why that's badass? While this is horrible, because of the music and the camera. Fucking exactly. tell you it's awesome. Framing. Um, be everything in terms of how an audience reacts to something. Yeah. End of flashback. Yes, I bet you have. What a great guy, man. What a good guy you are. What a great guy, man. What a good guy you are. You don't have to do this. What a great guy, man. What a good guy you are. They also claimed that the main character has killed a man by refusing to take him to the hospital after he gets hit by a car. Considering that these guys killed friggin' Ted, like, he ran into a car, and instead of taking him to the hospital, they let him die of internal bleeding. Of course, what you'll actually see if you watch the show for yourself is Ted, as they call him, demanding they don't take him to a hospital. No, no hospitals, okay? The other guy, the other guy skipped Billy. I'll bring you back in. Here, here, grab me, grab me. I just need to lie down. It's okay, Britt. No hospital. You promised me no, no hospital. hospital. No hospital, bro. Followed quickly after by them trying to revive him after he keels over. Oh God, Linus, Linus, come on! Hey, 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 Robert, Robert, Robert! Oh God, come on, come on, buddy, come on! Oh shit! Oh, what do we do? Do we call an ambulance? This dude's dead. Oh my god. That doesn't look like them just letting him die of internal bleeding, if you ask me, but uh, I guess they just honestly misread the show. In contrast, they claim that the villains of the show are only up to some duplicitous things to build an airport. The worst, the other guys, they, they do some d duplicitous things to try and build a parking lot. Like, a freaking airport in, in Ocean Beach, San Diego. Meanwhile, if you watch the actual show, you'll find that these duplicitous things the villains are up to in order to build this airport entail grabbing land through numerous fraudulent schemes that run legitimate businesses into the ground and murdering multiple people in order to prevent the truth from getting out. I'm getting the feeling that you think that I'm aware of something that I am not. Doctor environmental reports regarding the Montague Resort, land grabs, political bribes, three people dead to keep your tarmac a secret. You can't be serious, but if what you're saying is true, if Mr. Zeitlin broke the law. He had three people killed. Your mother, Eileen, she lives near here, alone. In a few minutes, two people will park across from her home on Lambert Street. Within 30 seconds, they can be inside it. They will hold her down and insert a needle here, beneath her fingernail. Within 15 seconds, she'll be in cardiac arrest. Should be brain dead in two minutes. All we need is a name, Miss Ross. Miss Ross, any change of feeling about your source? Got about five minutes before I have to move on to my next meeting. Why don't we wrap this up before that? Miss Ross, I have to go. Give me the name of your source, or I will just have to leave you alone with Mr. Burke. Robert Gillert. Robert Chillard is my source. So threatening old ladies is part of your business practice. You should stop talking. 
do not know how one misses these sorts of details while giving something their full attention, but apparently EFAP did. According to those who are insistent that they didn't just lie anyways, you can express someone take being bad without insulting them and calling them liars behind their back, by the way. I said that they lied about a scene where they quite literally lied about what happened. Yes, do you wish to contend that their take on that particular scene was remotely accurate? EFAP call people liars when they blatantly misrepresent content all the time. Cry me a fucking river that they got called out for lying when they lied. Argue that they didn't lie or get the fuck out. They did lie. Our stream proves it. Argue with the references or shut up. No, they didn't. All you showed was them being wrong. Piss off, you cunt. Facts aren't opinions. Go back to school. Flashback. Physically okay, assault Rex, some my poor man. I'm, I'm listening. He talked to my son through an iron gate. Joker's. He didn't iron, talk iron, to us because he talked to my son shit. through an iron gate. God you damn it! I just dumb? said I was gonna say something mean, but I got it. <laughs> Ralph, you piece of shit. Motherfucker. God listen. damn it, Ralph! You piece of shit. Fuck. Listen, like this is being a fucking liar. Yeah. yeah. Oh sorry, yeah. This Ralph Definitely. lying to you. This is Ralph. The, you lying at this point is the charitable uh, interpretation. This is this is Ralph lying to you. This is Ralph being very very deceptive. He's being <clears> very very deceptive. Ralph doesn't show the fact that this stranger just walked up to the gate and put his fingers in my son's mouth. He didn't show the part <laughs> where this weirdo dude who just put his fingers in my son's mouth started strangling my butler. No no no. <laughs> don't don't show that. Don't show that. Exactly just say something. Play a clip of something semi-relevant, and then just go to the next scene. Just go to the next scene. Just don't even talk about it. Fuck you, Ralph. You're a liar. End of flashback. Right. So it's okay when they infer that people are being deliberately deceptive when they are both grossly off the mark and going out of their way to remove context when they edit clips together, but it's not okay for others to make the same inference when they do it. Interesting. It's like, well, what is this for? Like, what are we gonna, what are we putting an end to? What the, the, the main overarching plot of the thing that they're trying to put a stop to is some property developers building an airport in Ocean Beach, San Diego. Like, I don't know what I meant to do with that, in terms of, like... I guess Fringy cannot grasp why such land grabs are a bad thing. Maybe if the bad guy's plot was to flood the city, he would understand the stakes. Or maybe he needed a fucking blue sky beam. Who knows what this dense motherfucker would have been satisfied with at this point. The worst, the other guys, they, they do some d duplicitous things to try and build a parking lot. Like, a freaking airport in, in Ocean Beach, San Diego. The worst that Thanos ever did was some duplicitous things to end hunger and poverty across the universe. The worst that Voldemort ever did was some duplicitous things to run a boarding school. The worst that Sauron ever did was some duplicitous things to secure a better existence for orcs. You are either lying or spectacularly ignorant. This next section is the absolute nadir of this particular take, or anything I have ever seen said by Mahler or anyone involving EFAP. If you are sensitive to discussions about rape or sexual assault, you may want to skip it. Your mental and emotional health comes first. Speaking of duplicitous things, remember that thing I mentioned earlier about Brit's girlfriend being taken advantage of while she was drunk? Well, here's that scene. Hey, it's Brit. Give me a message. Have problems? Yeah, if he doesn't work. Maybe it's because it's not your car. Simple sobriety test. I mean, if you can't find your car, then maybe you shouldn't drive it home. That's actually very good advice. Why don't you let me give you a ride? I can't ride to you. I have a boyfriend. <laughs> Gavin. It's not like you're married. Just doing his fucking human rights. Just being like, hey, girl, I like you. Do you like me? Let's do stuff. Which is totally allowed. Even if. They're entangled with someone else. You could say it's bad etiquette, but I mean, when we're talking about love here, it gets complicated. You okay? I said no, okay. Katie? Hey. Everything okay here? Yeah, everything's fine, Professor. Here's what she said about it to Hank the next day. I don't deserve him. I messed up. No, you didn't. I got drunk and I... No, please. You don't... You don't have to finish that sentence. Did someone from school? 
Hello, Professor. You were drunk. It wasn't no. you. Hmm? And you didn't know what you were doing. No, I, I, I was drunk, and it wasn't me. I knew exactly what I was doing. And why? I don't know. I mean, I've been feeling the way he's looking at me lately. I pretty much know what's coming next. That's what you want. That's exactly what I want. What's wrong with me? Why, Hank, when everything's, like, so perfect? I'm gonna lose him. I know it. It's okay. Oh, my God, he's never gonna forgive me. You gotta forget it happened. Okay? I can't do that. Then pretend. Now let's hear how it was described on EFAP. So, oh my god, it's so bad. So like, <laughs> Brit is a guy just doing his thing, and his girlfriend, oh man, you know, what a great girlfriend. I can't wait <laughs> to just settle down with you, maybe. Get a, maybe, oh. you know, I'll get a dog. Maybe we can have a kid, maybe we get married. You know, and this girl, she seems, she seems a-okay, she seems fine. Pretty normal as a character. So, she's doing some uni stuff, some college stuff. And, um, you know, after a night of going out, doing some drinking, she she wakes up the following morning and, oh no, she slept with the professor. Oh, yeah. Uh-oh, oh, I know. That, is, that stands in stark opposition to the concept you love somebody. Oh, well, you know, she was drunk, right? That's probably <laughs> the reason, Rags. She was drunk. She was uh, drunk. Oh, you no. expect maybe that the show is going to be like, I made a huge fucking mistake, I got drunk, and I'm kind of, I feel awful because we were just about to start our life. That might be the drama. But no, she says, you know, I just wasn't ready to get married. That's the reason. Yeah. You know what? Since Mahler wants to take the mask off, let's take the mask off. Let's see how Mahler substantiated this totally accurate, utterly unbiased, and completely honest spin on the events of the show. With a clip from the scene I've just shown, when he was talking about these particular criticisms on his server. Rather than simply downloading that clip, I had this person screen record themselves playing this clip in order to confirm that this was in fact what Mahler had posted himself. Let's see if he kept in all those shots of Katie sobbing remorsefully. You were drunk. It wasn't you. Hmm? And you didn't know what you were doing. No, I, I, I was drunk, and it wasn't me. But I knew exactly what I was doing. Then why? I don't know. You have got to be shitting me. So, <laughs> that's right. Mahler would have had to open up that episode, go to that scene, clip out what he used, and then completely omit everything in the scene that makes it clear that Katie believes she's made an enormous mistake and is overwhelmed with guilt about it. You know, like a liar. You no. expect maybe that the show is going to be like, I made a huge fucking mistake, I got drunk and I'm kind of, I feel awful because we were just about to start our life. That might be the drama, but no. She says, you know, I just wasn't ready to get married. That's the reason. <laughs> of course, that wasn't the only clip that Muller provided for context here. Let's look at the other clip. Why did you do it? What I don't I do? know. I've been trying to figure it out. Are you bored? <laughs> What's wrong? What did I do? Do you love me? Then tell me. Tell me what? Because you're not ready. You're not ready for any of this. I can tell you're not ready for me. So, this is from four episodes later, after Katie admits that she's pregnant and doesn't know who the father might be. The two of them have an extremely heated exchange about this. Brit, I wish so much that... Can't take it back, Katie. Who was it? Who was it? Who was it? Who was it? It's just... Bullshit! Who was it? Nobody. Not like I like him. It just happened. What the hell does that mean? It just happened. Did you pick him up? Why are you protecting him? Protecting you. I don't need your protection! I'd do anything to take it back, and I can't, and I just... Oh, God. Yeah, I didn't want to hurt you. Why did you do it? What's wrong? What did I do? If you love me, then tell me. Tell me what? Because you're not ready. I can tell. You're not ready for me. You marry me, and you'd hate me. And you'd hate your life. You're not ready. 
So as you can see, Brit is acting incredibly emotionally, understandably so based on what information he's working off of, and is yelling during this entire exchange. Now, I'm not entirely sure if you've ever been in a heated argument with somebody, but usually when they are getting extremely loud, cutting you off and yelling at you, it's quite natural for this to rile you up and get you to begin escalating your tone in return, unless you are going out of your way to avoid doing this. I mean, they, they why to... is he not being investigated for tax evasion? Either he, either he's evading taxes or he lied under oath. Perjury. Well, I, I mean, all he's saying is, so it says on our taxes that we sell seashells by the yes, seashore. Yes, it is illegal. It is, it is That's illegal a lie. to lie on your tax. And Either all the people in that room know they're lying. But they're, they, well, so, that's not what no, they're no, actually no. putting on their tax forms, though. No, it's, no. It's, so you lied under oath, then. <laughs> is it, is it, is that actually going to fall under oath? Is that actually going to fall as a lie under oath? Where, where you just simply make a, to lie. a joke like that? Katie is literally saying here that she still doesn't understand why she cheated, an answer which Britt refuses to accept, and gives her an ultimatum after yelling at her for a solid minute. What's wrong? What did I do? Do you love me? Then tell me! Tell me what? When you are under pressure like this during a heated argument, you might be prompted into saying something you end up regretting, possibly even immediately, such as Katie does here. This sort of thing is why it's important to try your best to keep a lid on even during high pressure arguments, but it is not unheard of at all for a heated argument to cause someone to let out their bottled up emotions or lash out in frustration. These types of moments can be found across media, and when they show up, they aren't presented as truly indicative of a character's moral fiber, but as what they are in real life. Unfortunate episodes of our emotions getting the best of us. Like with the other clip, Muller left all of that context out when showing small clips of these scenes to his server, and in doing so, prompted his fans to send these lovely messages about Katie. Pepe cringe grin. This is after her screeching he wasn't ready? Before. She ends up explaining the reason to Brit four episodes later. What a fucking piece of shit. Nah, we lied about the show apparently. Correct! Holy shit. Pepe hysterically laughing. Love the titles of these files, by the way. You're not ready for me. I've never agreed with the victim blaming part, just stating she wasn't entirely blameless on the matter. Is she somewhat of a cunt for- I said she was a shitty person. I said that because she said she wasn't sure why she cheated, but ultimately she landed on, you aren't ready for me. She can go fuck herself. You aren't ready for me, so I broke your heart and trust. She seems a bit cuntish? And that's only the beginning of the fucking laundry list for this show. That line just reeks of the writers trying to punish the dude for his shitty actions, while trying so hard to justify her in some way. Just grasping. These guys ain't beating the misogyny allegations, by the way. <laughs> that second clip also left this part out, of course. I can't even really barely remember anything about it, except I just woke up wanting to take it all back. I mean, Brit. I feel like Mahler and Fringy would know if she was a rape victim or not. Well, Thunderous, as the old saying goes, facts do not care about your feelings. Hey, wait a minute. Let's look at how Mahler clipped this scene again. What did you do it? What I don't I do know. I didn't want to hurt you. Why did you do it? I can tell you're not ready for me. I can tell you're not ready for me. You marry me, and you'd hate me. And you'd hate your life. Right. It just happened to leave out what Katie said both immediately before and immediately after what the clip plays. Probably because that went against his agenda of making her look as villainous as possible. Because that's what you have to do when the truth is on your side, right? Carefully leave out context? The issue I take with is people who either like lie about media to, you know, push their own preferences mm -hmm. necessarily, or that um, are just giving analysis that's absolutely fucking worthless, like absolutely shallow. Look, fellas, I did not force Mueller to do this. Nor did I force him or his friends to say any of the vile things they said about Katie. Nor did I force them to egg on their fans to join in on this grotesque misogyny. They freely chose to do all of that, whilst fully aware that people were telling them that this character was raped and that they had victim blamed. Maybe, instead of getting mad at me for calling a spade a spade, you ought to be a little outraged at them for whatever you wish to call this. I should also probably highlight that if you are being accused of making a mistake as serious as this, it's probably not a good idea to jump to a counterattack before you've had a chance to hear out why someone believes you've made a serious mistake here. Maybe think before you speak. Whatever you do, 
I really wouldn't advise editing this deceptively to frame the alleged rape victim as a whore to your flying monkeys. Whilst knowing that people who've actually seen the full show and all the context are understandably upset with what you've said here. That just makes it really hard to be as charitable towards you as you clearly feel entitled to. And this is also really going to undermine your argument if you later proceed to morally grandstand about how evil the main characters are. I don't know, that's just my personal advice. Now, when I first saw these arguments while watching their stream, I was willing to chalk this up to these guys just not understanding that this character was raped. Perhaps because the show doesn't have any character explicitly call this rape. However, it's worth mentioning that these guys did not need Wonder Woman 1984 to refer to this as rape in order to recognize that what it depicted, objectively, was rape. Oh Fucking... no! Oh no! What did you oh do? Oh my god. Whoa! No! This is not okay. That's <laughs> not- No, it's no. not. Guys, what another, are you- Oh my god. No, it's not. Sexual harassment. 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 Where's Brown Table when we need him? I wonder if that crowd is even gonna take issue with this. Like, will they even fucking recognize how no, awful this is? No, because it's a guy. It's a guy that's- that's being victimized here, so fuck him. If the- if, if the genders were swapped here, right? If this was a male superhero doing this with, like, a random woman's body, this would not be accepted. I'm surprised that they did this. Why they didn't have to, like, but they did, it. yeah. And so they're not even gonna... me too as well. <laughs> For Mueller to then go, oh, well, I don't remember the show acknowledging from her point of view that it was rape, as if that at all fixes anything, is frankly disingenuous. You can interpret any line of dialogue as not true. These guys may be incredibly stupid, but even they should know better. They are not 13-year-olds, nor people who at least have a history of never appealing to death of the author when it comes to a fictional story's moral framing, which they even tried to do with this very show. They are adults, and they are supposed to be critics with an enhanced attention to detail, and they have spotted this sort of thing in stories in the past, without needing their hands held. They insisted that they gave this show their full attention as they would have with anything else, and even took notes. Maybe they just forgot how consent works. One of the more frustrating layers to this is that while the events that are depicted in the show do not break or even bend any character writing or cause and effect, or lead to some truly wonky moral message being conveyed through the text, it is a valid point of criticism that this one aspect of the show has aged poorly since our understanding of what consent means has progressed since the making of the show. I don't think the writers meant any harm when writing this in the manner they did. This show is just a product of a time in which society's understanding of consent has become obsolete, which makes mistakes like this far more understandable in older media than when they show up in the present day. Unfortunately, EFAP did not bother pointing this out. They seem to have missed what would have been a fair point of criticism even if it wasn't at all detrimental to the story. It's probably also worth highlighting that this exact scenario is legally recognized as rape according to California Penal Code Section 261 Subsection A3. Not that what the law states is really an argument for why this is or isn't rape ontologically speaking. After all, marital rape was not legally recognized as rape anywhere in the U.S. prior to the 1970s, and it wasn't until 1993 that every state's lawmakers had agreed it was probably not a good idea to offer a citizen carte blanche to have sex with someone they were married to without first getting their consent. I guess they didn't teach that at the university where Fringy studied law either. Probably because, you know, it would have been concerned with Australian law, mate. <laughs> then again, their understanding of the law did also come from watching a lot of American procedurals, which is probably why they never raised any fuss over the trope of detectives picking up evidence with their personal pens rearing its head in this show. That makes how many actually valid criticisms of Terriers I've brought up that these guys missed now? Some safe sacred cow it is. Not to worry, there's at least one more that I'll bring up later. Anyways, maybe in their precious headcanon, the law in the real world conforms to their delusional understanding of it. Regardless of everything I've outlined thus far, I have firsthand seen people genuinely miss that Katie was raped, despite generally approaching the show in good faith. Which makes me think that unlike many of the things that they would have had to have deliberately taken out of context, that Katie was raped is at least somewhat plausible to miss. Going by Hanlon's razor, I wouldn't say that these guys were deliberately being rape apologists, which I never said. However, that doesn't change the fact that they victim blamed, which, unlike rape apology, can be done out of ignorance. However, even if we set aside the entire argument over whether or not this was rape, it is undeniable that Mahler carefully edited context out of clips he posted to his server, and misled his trusting fans into engaging in truly skin-crawling rhetoric centered on this character. Flashback. My position, uh, that I don't think I've ever stated otherwise, is that if you're gonna criticize a thing, be it a movie or a video, something that has an actual start-middle finish, and then you're gonna attack it for a position it takes and ignore any context within that thing that would make your points invalid, then that is dishonest. Um, so for example, 
It's, yeah. End of flashback. The justifications that I've been hearing for Terrier's many, many, many problems have been among some of the worst I've ever heard. It's indistinguishable from what we'd hear from videos we cover on EFAP. I cheated on you because you weren't ready for me or marriage. But what did she mean, Mauler? You're horrible. You're an irredeemable monster. So, if you are genuinely disturbed by what you've seen, well, get ready for an experience. You see, I did try to give them the best benefit of the doubt that I could have given them, all things considered, and I did try to just chalk this up to ignorance on their part as opposed to malice, but I also couldn't help but be honest about what I had seen. And when I was suggesting people apply EFAP's criticisms of Terriers to other media, because these kinds of remarks were now on the table for being lampooned, I called it for what it is victim blaming. Now, before we begin, it is worth remembering that at the very beginning of this saga, I tweeted out to people following me, do not harass them, do not pester them. I wanted to make it explicitly clear that I was not on board with anyone who was going to bother them about their take here. Now, feast your eyes on a fraction of the filth I've had to wade through for the last two years, as my reward for that. So, you respond to what you perceive as bad faith against a TV show, and then turn right around and imply that Mahler and Fringy are rape apologists. And you're really going to sit here and talk about bad faith? Yeah, I, I shouldn't have uh, have said that they were rape apologists. That was a horrible thing. Yeah, it kind of it kind of just defeats everything, mm -hmm. doesn't it? I mean, I honestly can't say that I believe you. Okay. Because you've lied before. You've lied several times. And I know that you're, like, the most terminally online person that I've ever met. So, I don't really think I believe you. I think you're actually just that spiteful. You know, it, I, I think it's funny that you decided to open up your your huge diatribe with, uh... Or, you didn't open it up with this, but you did put it in there. Something to the effect of, oh, my life, I don't have a whole lot going for me. But apparently you never thought about, um, you know, maybe not spending four months about <clears throat> complaining about us not liking a TV show. Grown-ass man whose whole thing was all about criticism, baby raging over his friends being rightfully criticized for victim blaming a rape victim, refusing to hear me out, and taunting me for trying to open up emotionally. What a great guy, man. What a good guy you are. I'm sure EFAP's ever emotionally intelligent, rational, unbiased, good faith fans will be able to see through his blatantly cruel attitude on full display here. TLDR, Mahler and company were unreasonably harsh towards the show, so Southpaw got really upset and said some very unreasonable things about them on Twitter and Discord, including calling them rape apologists. This video is Wolf calling him out for being a liar and a backstabbing baby throwing a tantrum. Show me where exactly Southpaw called them rape apologists. He didn't. You can call somebody a rape apologist without saying those exact words. That's called an inference. That being said, I don't know whether Southpaw did or didn't do that. However, Hanlon's razor demands that I assume that if he never at any point did infer it, Wolf accidentally read it into something. Just stop. I have had enough. We have had enough. Your actions and accounts have been more than enough justification to prove you are untrustworthy. I don't hate you, nor am I angry. I'm disappointed. From that call between you and Wolf, what I noticed was frustration mixed with disappointment in his voice as he talked with you. That's telling. You had a chance to represent the fans of EFAP. You were pulled from the chat to defend a movie on the show. Mahler brought you into multiple podcasts and videos which garnered you attention and fame. You fawned over Mahler, attempted to emulate the podcast with, edit, South Podcast, and worked hard to be like them. Then they were uncharitable with your sacred cow. Your idol disliked something you care about deeply and made fun of it. Was it time to reflect on the criticisms and return with strong arguments with evidence for your case of it being good? Nope. You are right, they are wrong, and if they are wrong, you can't respect them. So, you got cheesed with Mahler and crew over a stupid show. You then went on a long, two-faced, attention-seeking rant through Twitter, Reddit, and YouTube, claiming you are both the victim of backstabbing, all the while backstabbing them at the same time. You give the toxic brood a bad name. You deal in bad faith and pedantic arguments. You side with those who dislike Mahler and retweet their slanders, all the while shielding yourself with the moral high ground of, hey, they did it to me first. You emulate all the traits of those you argued against not long ago. Your character arc is done. You have existed long enough to become the villain in this story. 
Go away now. Southpaw is completely justified and remains unrefuted. In acting like angry X, you know, instead of responding to Tone, you should consider if anything he actually said was correct or not. Who gives a fuck about the stupid TV show aside from SK fanbase? Southpaw being a drama queen is the issue. EFAP crew moved on in less than a month, and this schizo is still going like if they punched his mom and kidnapped his dog. Ah uh, yes, the you're just angry over a TV show argument. That's all the evidence needed to know that you have no idea what you're talking about over the matter. Keep seething. What have I got to seethe over? You're the one who has to deal with holding a bunch of gaslighting, victim-blaming pieces of shit as idols. Victim pot ain't gonna fuck you. Typical brain-dead response from another vacuous Mollerite. So you are just a tourist butthurt over that fucker LMAO. Uh-oh. Is somebody mad that I'm making a video going over why they lied about a piece of art? Don't get too excited. We wouldn't want you to have another stroke. I'm just saying that a lot of people sees your behavior as unhealthy, let's say. Typical low IQ response from the attention whore contrarian who threatened to off himself because people didn't like his crappy detective show. You literally believe that there aren't any good cops. Sit down and take your antidepressant pills. What gaslighting? Wolf accusing you of calling them rape apologists and then acquiescing to it like a sniveling little child who knows he's done something wrong? I never did call them rape apologists. I said that they victim blamed, out of ignorance, because they did in fact victim blame a character who was raped, while laughing about it. So you admit to calling them rape apologists? You see this look on my face? This will always mean it's time to shut up! And by the way, if a woman wears a provocative dress down a dark street. She owes some of the blame at least because she put herself in that situation. But the rapist should at least be chemically castrated and thrown in prison. Oh, well, thank God for that last third of that tweet. I was about to say that that was full-blown victim blaming, but you really recovered there. Dude has been going on for about two years calling them rape apologists because they didn't like the show his narcissistic mentor likes. This is just his normal behavior. Obsessing over EFAP and telling people how they are this and that. Again, therapy is made for the likes of him. They called them victim blamers, which they are, not rape apologists, and there is a difference. I know what they said in two years. They are both dodgy about it, but both have EDS and need therapy. Also, tell your friend that if I want to talk to narcissist, I would have contacted my ex, not talk to him. How are they dodgy? They have references. Oh, we didn't say they were rape apologists. We only said victim blamers. First of all, potato potato. Second of all, they both did said and imply a rape apology. Narcissus is just mauling for two years because he was booted from the group. Again, therapy is made for both of them. Alright, if you believe victim blaming and rape apologism are the same thing, then they are undeniably rape apologists. You should feel good about yourself. You managed to make them sound so much worse. Don't tell me I can't say what I'm saying. Tell me why what I'm saying is wrong. Southpaw? slandered EFAP as rape apologists for not liking some shitty cop show, then tried to pretend as if them refusing to associate with him further was over this dumb show, and not him throwing false accusations at them because they didn't care for his sacred cow. Don't poo-poo me. If I'm wrong and you can't actually argue why, perhaps that's a skill issue on your part. Unless... you really don't think there's anything wrong with this. I'm sorry, what? She's drunk, she's trying to get into the wrong car, and someone comes by and next thing we know, she's waking up next to him after sleeping with him. How is this rape? We're missing extremely important context, and you immediately jump to a conclusion. It's clear that she immediately regrets the decision when she wakes up, but you don't know what happened between cuts, and unless another scene gives added context, then this is a huge leap to take. This may be your interpretation, but it's also fair to assume there is an hour or more of him offering her a ride, her accepting, them flirting, then both having consensual sex because her inhibitions are lowered. That wouldn't be rape, dude. Here's an idea. If you're going to write an entire scene in your head in order to defend an EFAP here, maybe actually watch the show first. That way you'll at least know for sure that no such scene is even vaguely hinted at at any point in the show. If you gave me an afternoon and allowed me to make up this much headcanon for my arguments, I could mount a rock solid case that The Dark Knight Rises has absolutely no plot holes, or any movie this crowd would chide over such things for that matter. Yes, because the good faith of Mahler thinking what's her name is a bad girlfriend is of course rape apology, instead of you know maybe he got his reference is wrong, because I honestly think he has a set of references that point to his conclusion. Sure, if you omit all the context which doesn't at all support his interpretation, I guess. Yet y'all go for a character assessment. Bad faith. Instead of missing references. Good faith. In order to argue that they weren't lying, you're going to have to sincerely argue that they are just comically inept at their jobs and are thus not trustworthy regardless, to which I'd have to ask why you are even listening to them in the first place. All you care about is intelligence and 
stupid and competent. Not sure I appreciate this defense. Or the idea Wolf gaslit Southpaw that he was angry in the watch through the first episode, which implies intent, which implies knowing. You can gaslight unintentionally, genius. It's actually a common subconscious defense mechanism for narcissists like these guys. But whatever. When that could be his read on the situation. Or he could have remembered incorrectly. If he just remembered incorrectly, he could have come to me and apologized and been like, hey man, I didn't mean to do that, but he didn't, so there we are. But yet again, you go for character assessment instead of thinking of another possibility. Like what EFAP does all the time. In a world where superpowers are real, physical injuries as a result of superpowers are not real. Here's the next shot of the movie that CinemaSins decided not to include in their video. Oh, do we just like to do a little bit of lying on purpose? Is that what we do? Do we like to do a little bit of lying? Fringy and Muller didn't like his sacred cow terriers and it broke his mind. He's basically been on a two-year descent into insanity, trying to explain away all of Muller and Fringy's critique, going as far as calling them rape apologists because a character's fiancé drunkenly slept with her professor, and Southpaw has rationalized it as her being raped, despite no indication it was from the show, to try and invalidate the critique. I remember watching Southpaw and SK's The Real Story hit piece with some pretty neutral friends, and everyone came out of a significantly increased respect for Mahler and company. TLDR, Southpaw, the sacred cow slaughterhouse, is a giant cry bully pussy who can't take a minuscule fraction of what he dishes out and has decided to make it everyone else's problem because he's an enormous cunt. If the gloves weren't off already, they are now. And next time you want to cry and seethe about me or anyone who criticizes you arguing in bad faith, I suggest first looking in a fucking mirror. I've had quite the lovely experience of being accused by EFAP fans of claiming that EFAP are okay with rape for having referred to what they did here as victim blaming out of ignorance that this character was raped, which EFAP refuses to either take the L on or correct their fans for claiming that I had called them rape apologists, even though SK personally corrected them on this. It's as if they think that I am honestly the kind of person who would make such a heavy claim about someone I once considered a friend out of a vacuum, purely because they simply didn't like a TV show, as opposed to someone who could be genuinely appalled by this and willing to call it for what it is, no matter the backlash one may face for it. <laughs> what, you think I enjoy this? There's no getting around this. Their commentary on this is genuinely hard to listen to for people who've actually watched the show. Oh, yeah. Uh-oh, oh, I know. That, is, that stands in stark opposition to the concept you love somebody. So, that is blaming. All right, Just Jolly. blaming. Yeah. <laughs> Jolly, uh, you wanna... <sighs> Why the fuck do I do with this? Um, I, I need to rattle through as well. So like, let's just do it this way. First of all, to say they just left out of context there is, just, is a supreme understatement. I don't know how else to put that. Like, at this point, that's a mission to the point of you are lying. I don't know how else to, to frame this. Because let's actually run through what actually happened. So it's like, okay, we have Katie. And Katie is a early 20s woman. She's at, you know, she's at college. She wants to make a life for herself. She's got ambitions. She wants to settle down with Brett. But, you know, Brett, oh man, he's got a history as a, as a guy with a, with a rocky past. You know, he's an ex-con. He's, he's you know, in an illegal business. And not only that, the nature of that business regularly exposes him to risk and threats. In fact, she gets held at a fucking gunpoint. You know, so like, earlier in the series, before this whole shit goes down, Katie is basically like, I think Brett isn't taking the relationship seriously. I think he's not growing up. Basically, she's expressing very legitimate doubts about how a uh, viable and long-term future with Briss is going to be if he doesn't fucking get his act together. Which, given that his work is not just, like, immature, but dangerous to her, is a very legitimate, um, like, concern to have about a relationship. Now, later on in the series, she goes out to a bar, as they say, and she gets very, very drunk. So drunk, in fact, that when she leaves the, the um, bar, she doesn't realize she's trying to get into the wrong car for about 10 minutes until one of her classmates points it out, at which point she admits that she is too drunk to drive. Now, this man then starts to proposition her, and because she loves Brit, and because she's like trying to like let her alone, she's like, no, I don't, I don't want to do that. Then, her college professor, a man who has significant power over her in many, many ways, who is also stone cold sober, turns up and offers to take her home, basically. And then the scene cut there. And then the next time we find her, she is waking up in the professor's bed in his house. Now, to anyone with more brains than a dead woodlouse, what has clearly <laughs> happened here is that she has been raped. That the professor has taken yeah, abused his position of authority over her, the position of trust he had in him as a, uh, you know, an authority figure, and has taken advantage of the fact that she was drunk to sleep with her in her vulnerable state of being an extremely drunk person 
with severe doubts about her relationship. She was seduced into sex with someone in a manner which, had she been sober, we know for a fact he would not have done. So sex has been done on her, or like sex has been done to her, in a manner that she would not have consented to when sober. So she has been raped because she could not consent to the sex that, we got, that she had. Now, putting aside the fact that we've had so many fucking people tell us that they don't think that's rape, at which point I'm just I'm despair for humanity. But let's put that to one side for a second. <laughs> the fact that these people are like, oh yeah, she's morally to blame for having slept with this guy is so fucking repugnant, I don't really know where to begin with this. Like, moral, it's, it's, it is victim blaming. That's the toughest way of putting it. Yeah, it's also well, the most honest way of putting it. When, when, people, when people get mad at me for calling this victim blaming, is like, prove me wrong, though. No, but it is. Like, it, 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 what if it in every is, technical sense, right? Like, he, is a victim. he is a victim of a man who has taken advantage of her in a, in a situation where she could not give reasonable consent. So she has been raped. That is inarguable. That is just a fact of the matter. It baffles me that anyone even attempts to make an argument against this. So that's the point A. And then point B is like, if you are the kind of person who is a girl who is so drunk that she cannot meaningfully consent to that, and then someone who is sober takes advantage of her. And you then blame her for having sex with that guy. Like, you don't hold him responsible. You, you hold it as like, oh no, she did something morally bad. You're a fucking cunt. It's, <laughs> it's really that simple. Like, you are just a complete bastard and a misogynist. Or at least, I'll bring some very severe misogynistic subconscious perspectives, even if you don't think you're consciously a misogynist. It's despicable. I'm so tired of hearing people defend this point. I'm so tired of hearing Ethan um, accusing Katie of being like some kind of conniving, sinister manipulator who's just a bad person because she didn't stay with a person that she professes to love, despite the fact that they've got every reason to have that serious doubts about that relationship, and she was in a vulnerable state, and she would never have done it when sober. Ah, <sighs> it's insane. Doesn't it suck that people are only interested in her for She-Hulk and not Jen, which to me is Isn't like weird that holy not disclosing fuck, that you've just completely missed the way more important bad thing that happened <laughs> here. Show, yes, she should disclose who who they're doing yep. things with. Yes, absolutely. Yep. Call my lawyer. Right in the middle of the lobby, in front of everyone, I had to transform. It was so embarrassing. I can totally see how your boss bringing that on you on the first day would make you spiral. Hmm. Tell me more about how you felt. Turns out that you might want to, it's kind of dishonest sort of to tell people that you to present yourself as a thing when you have an entirely different I, form. And I think it's, when people I think it's discover you as a catfish. I am so tired. Um, oh yeah, absolutely. He certainly feels that way. And if you remember, we flagged this for a reason. He felt the need to say that she was She-Hulk as a shock to the guy she was on a date with yeah. before. So she knows this is a surprise to, to people, and yet she decided to not tell this guy when she knows that Jen is less appealing to people. Yep. Do not try and make me point. feel bad for her that he is like, nope. whoa, I didn't okay, know this was the kinda... case, you didn't tell me this, and that she's like, yeah, but who cares, right? Not a good Lol. look. So if you already- I was already having trouble liking this lady, was not fucking yeah. impressed with this move. Kind of, uh, yeah. Hopefully she- she's happy. Hey. Yeah. And you know, to be fair, what would she know about the ethics of the situations like this? It's not like she's familiar True. with any of these kinds of situations. It's not like she had to learn about how these can have repercussions in law even or anything. Really bothers me when characters like who work about this shit for a living have no idea how this works. Yep. Very bad, not good, Wonder Woman 84 vibes. Right. So, because Jen doesn't revert to her human form before sleeping with this guy, even though she disclosed that she looks different in her human form, and he made it clear that he doesn't care to see her in that form before hooking up with her. Because he seems to express regret with hooking up with her after he does see her human form the next day and doesn't find her as attractive, well, that's Wonder Woman 1984 vibes. But a sober college professor hooking up with a drunk student? Well, that's not rape. She just regrets having sex while she was drunk, and she shouldn't have gotten drunk if she didn't want to accidentally have sex. But don't you dare accuse them of victim blaming. Look, if you're going to feign outrage on EFAP's part about this, 
I'm just going to tell you. I don't care. In the last two years, I've watched enough people just go mask off when getting pushed on this, namely people who haven't watched the show first or seen all the context that I know about, mind you, just people who have clearly substituted that with listening to these clowns, that I've deduced that the odds of someone mounting a good faith argument that is both informed on what the show presents and what consent entails both at a legal and ontological level are so impossibly low that I really am not going to take your opinion any more seriously than I would a flat earther or a hollow cost denier. I really don't like to do this. I don't like to just write off an entire perspective as crazy because I'm one of those idiots who likes to entertain the idea that I might be wrong when I enter a discussion with people. But there comes a point where I've talked about this enough. I've made my points about this abundantly clear in the last couple of years of talking about this. And the people I've had to argue with about this are just so consistently refusing to argue based on any kind of sensible logic. And I've shown this particular section of this video to a number of women I know who have never heard of EFAP or Terriers and just simply watched the last half hour of this video and earlier versions that I've drafted up. And I've seen how utterly horrified they've gotten upon hearing these initial remarks from EFAP, plus the insane doubling down that their fans have done after the fact, that in this particular case, the people who've wanted to honestly honestly argue that this isn't rape have had their chance and they've blown it they are at best dangerously misguided as to what entails consent. They seem to be under the impression that if you while sober take advantage of someone who is throwing themselves on you because they're drunk that, that isn't meaningfully any different from if you were drunk yourself, which is something that I don't think any person with a functioning moral compass would dare actually do and that's just totally delusional. And at worst, they proceed to indulge in actual rape apology, as opposed to EFAP's initial remarks, which were just deeply and callously ignorant. As someone who knew someone who was taken advantage of in this manner at the time that I first heard EFAP make these comments while watching their stream live, and now knows a plurality of people who've told me about it after learning about this, this aspect of the show hits particularly close to home for me. And this is approximately where it stops being about EFAP just having no knowledge of the law, or incredibly basic concepts like how inciting incidents or character arcs work, or how framing works and it becomes so much more significant. Because this is a way of thinking that leads to people actually getting seriously hurt. And it's abundantly clear that almost everyone who's fought me on this has refused to seriously appreciate the gravity of this part of the discourse before then engaging in an argument about it. Because to them, the egos of a few e-celebs matter more, and I'm sick of it. Just a sick world we're living in! Sick! Anyways, now that we've gone over the way in which these guys have very selectively read several scenes to support a conclusion they clearly want to believe, for whatever reason, why don't we talk about just a couple more arguments that they made. Starting off, there's this point they make about an environmental report that the bad guys doctor. Oh dude, the um, the radiation thing, so... Oh, the right, yeah. Oh. So like, our characters find out that the, the bad guys might be trying to hide the fact that there's a high radiation levels to the point where no one would be around in this particular area. They find this out because they are... The, the ex-wife of the main character is an architect slash person familiar with, with, like, these particular things. She sees the paper by chance and she's like, bruh, this is, like, super bad. It's like radiation-y stuff. It's like, oh my god. And so... Very lucky that she has that level of knowledge, but you know, Anna absolutely, as well, so um, he, he knows about it too. Yeah, and and so you're like, okay, and so they they get it out there. It's like a payoff for the episode that they get that to be public, and no one's allowed near the, the place anymore. It's like, huh? I mean, freaking kind of just accepted that on, on good faith, which is like, I guess they did all they needed to do to prove it, and woohoo, we did it. Okay. But then they have this like twist, where the main guy's sister. <laughs> notices that it's all bullshit. She reads it and she's like, nah, these levels are actually this, and this is all, this is all wrong. And we were like, what? I wonder if you fellas in chat can notice, like, what's wrong here with this. Something doesn't make sense. Yeah, so, first thought was like, why would a random girl who's, friend, uh, who's the sister of our protagonist know this better than the people would who have had to have verified it for the fucking government? Why? Yeah, people who and then, in this field. turns out there's no radiation there, and so we were like, wait a minute, you didn't check? You didn't send anybody with the proper like, equipment? Like, into another report? Like, what the, you, just, you just found this report and were like, it's good enough. <laughs> no one's allowed there anymore. It's like, yeah. what? And then, of course, third, if this is something that she could deduce based on the publicly available information, how would she be the only person who noticed that? Like, she notices that the chemicals do not produce this result. That, that's just not how it works. You're telling me she's the only person on Earth who knows this? I don't Somebody understand how they wouldn't it. have specialists to check the fucking thing. 
And then yeah. why would she know more than this them? This is just their life. Just to check these things and know. And that's like major for pushing everything forward again. I mean, the, the show is full of these, like the big events that just don't make any sense. It is the most important, like it is the central arc of this season. This one, thankfully, season. Yeah. So I don't know how these big-brained objective critics miss this, but the site wasn't alleged to have radiation. It was alleged to have toxic levels of benzene which the show explains. Benzene is a carcinogen found in crude oil and gasoline. This test cites levels at 380 parts per billion. This report is also not, as Mahler and Fringy suggest, claiming that a chemical or some type of radiation does something it doesn't actually do, which any person could have then been able to verify by just doing a Google search. The telltale clue that is spotted is... All that benzene with the earth metals? Those compounds can't exist together in those ratios. Not in the natural world anyway. Someone made the numbers up. Put the chemicals there for the test. There's no cancer in the ground. And the reason that Steph is able to spot this, unlike most of those who've looked at the reports, is because she would have more knowledge of earth metals than the average person. Which is because... Gretchen said that Steph had a scholarship to MIT way back when? Yeah, she was a uh, chemistry engineering double major. My folks used to say she got the brains in the family, I got the facial hair. So, <laughs> that's right. This huge plot hole that they banged on about, about how Steph is able to know something that other characters don't know, is directly accounted for in the show by the fact that she studied this in university. The punchlines write themselves. Either way, this would be a bit like asking why a bunch of people who only studied chemistry in high school or for a year in college miss a detail that Walter White catches. The whole point here is that this is something that most people wouldn't know about. It's not like there's a line in the show that makes that clear or anything. Most people wouldn't know that though. Whatever. Pay attention! And sure, if you want to comment on how lucky it is that the main character's sister is knowledgeable on this, you can. To that, I would then have to ask when is it, and when is it not, a flaw for a supporting character with a personal relationship to the protagonist to have some level of expertise in a field of knowledge that is relevant to the plot. I don't know. Seems like a bit of a stretch to jump to that after they just help out with one plot point. You would probably have more of a case if the character was magically knowledgeable on anything the main character needed help with. Well, he knows everything. Seriously, ask him. It, no, we're not introducing a pen that knows everything. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we are. No. Please. No. <laughs> but tell me, if a relative of mine is a rocket scientist or works in pharmaceuticals, and I'm a detective where their specialized field of knowledge is relevant to a case I'm working on, is it just convenient that I happen to know someone who could help me out with this? Or are we fine with allowing stories to have this? This is sort of related to that earlier point I made about inciting incidents being part of the building blocks of a story. Characters being knowledgeable or skilled on things that are relevant to the main plot are essential for keeping a story moving. As long as the writer provides internal reasoning for why a character may have whatever knowledge or skills they have, and it doesn't just come out of nowhere because the writer wrote themselves into a corner, then where exactly is the problem? Because in the same way that no one's going to start fussing over how convenient it is that of all the people who were bitten by a radioactive spider, it was a teenage genius who was able to build compact devices that are impossible for real scientists to build that enable him to shoot extremely strong webs from his wrists. No one's going to start fussing if he just so happens to have a friend who's capable of keeping a secret learning who he is and is also competent enough to be his guy in the chair. It's when a later movie suddenly has him claiming that his grandmother believes that magic runs in his family, and this enables him to cast a magic spell that plays a major role in the plot, without any official training in the mystic arts, that we might begin taking issue with it. Someone said they hated how Ned was able to open portals without training. He has to try quite a few times, and uh, in yeah. Doctor Strange they do establish it's less to do with like some kind of mechanical muscle you're, you're doing, it's more so, it, like I can't remember what the Ancient One says specifically, but much more about wanting it. Um, Which is that you have to let go or something, right? Yeah, because she yeah, puts him in like the Himalayas or some shit, so he has to open the portal to save his own life at that point. So that's how she gets him to do it. It's not like, you know, you 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 doing a punching bag for ten weeks and then you can punch better. It's like literally just a matter of your mental state. And Ned really wants to well, see people. Well, Strange was skeptical. That's why. Where Ned wasn't skeptical at yeah. all. Like the um, magic. Well, why would he be? You know, um, he's he knows yeah, exactly. Doctor Strange at this point because he already believes he's magical. Yeah, and he also already, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so um, listen, you're not actually I, arguing I, I, this play, I, are you? It's like, rewatch Doctor Strange, bitch. That's how it works. I'm just following the rules. <laughs> my, my, my thought was literally just, when I when I saw this, it was, I'm not sure if Ned should be able to do that. I would have to rewatch Doctor Strange to check. 
That's how and I remember I'm it. I'm happy the... to trust Wumbo on this. Well, it's worth remembering that portals seem to be like the easiest thing you can do as a magician, you know? Yeah, it's, it's much more about having the yeah. sling ring than it is about having training. <laughs> no, let's stick Magic with is not balanced. No, it, yeah, I agree that it should be balanced better, but it isn't. That's how it works in Doctor Strange. Good night, thanks to Doctor yeah. Strange and all the other stuff, yeah. And, and there's, Remember, there's you can cast to... runes without even knowing what runes are, all right? And there's some references. <laughs> that's, that's, the only thing that Ned, that's the only thing Ned can do. He can't even close them by themselves. And he can't do them well, you know? Yeah. Like it's, not... it's funny you should say that, because I was looking through some live streams and this defense sounds very uh, similar. Ray, strong female character. Stronger than Luke. Strong as Jedi. Stronger than Kylo. Stronger than Anakin. Yeah, people Googling that could be... Why are they giving or against? Well, it's, uh, okay, yeah, hot take. Right, again, we're only arguing for uh, and that yes, should, that Can you pause important. for a second? Ray got better training than Luke did in Empire Strikes Back. Like, because the, the Force works on kids' movie logic. Like, it's your belief in it and your understanding of it that gives you power. Just as a disclaimer, because I know I'm going to be accused of agreeing with this defense here just by virtue of including it here at all, even if the point is to just show that Mahler is making a defense for No Way Home that people would make for the sequels, even if Patricia's understanding of how the Force works is correct, I find this defense to be a Thermian argument and thus an unsatisfying rebuttal to the complaint of Rey being an overpowered protagonist, as it fails to address the real meat of the criticism, which is not that there isn't an in-universe reason for why Rey is so strong, the issue is that a protagonist who is consistently amazing at everything and never gets defeated and doesn't face any substantive challenges or have any substantive flaws to overcome makes for a boring character. Anyways, continue. Like the reason she's more powerful than the people in the prequels is because all of them thought it was just midichlorians and mm -hmm. the reason she's more... I mean, the reason she's more powerful than Luke in that particular scene is because she has a lightsaber and he has an antenna. Like... But... Like, like she, she learns the nature of it. She learns the, like, what the Force even is. Like, like she gets a better understanding of it than almost every other character in the, in the, in the canon. Like, if you consider that the Force works on kids' movie logic and your like belief and understanding in it is what gives you more power with it, then yes, Ray got better training than Luke did in The Empire Strikes. Yeah, when people point out things like Ray was able to move a whole stack of boulders, but uh, Luke wasn't able to pick up his ship or something like that. The thing is, is that those aren't actually any different in terms of action. Like, if you if you believe in the Force and you believe in yourself, then those are both fairly easy things to do. It's not a matter of training like you would train a muscle where you get stronger with it it's just once you believe you believe and it just happened to be that with luke's training ray believed in a way that luke didn't it's not like you know you you you're doing a punching bag for 10 weeks and then you can punch better it's like literally just a matter of your mental state you're trash mauler all right Raimi memes aside i'm just going to recap this double standard i've outlined the ceo of sex being able to open up portals totally fine Hank's sister knowing about earth metals more than the average person? Ah, I'm gonna kill myself! You know, between what we've just gone over, plus their refusal to allow the show to have inciting incidents, I'm starting to get the impression that these guys are just calling anything and everything convenient when they're desperate to come up with reasons for why this is one of the worst shows they've ever seen, but don't have a real argument behind that. A character is knowledgeable on something that's relevant to the plot? Convenient. The, the ex-wife of the main character is an architect slash person familiar with, with like these particular things. She sees the paper by chance and she's like, bruh, this is like super bad. It's like radiation-y stuff. It's like, oh my god. And so, very lucky that she has that level of knowledge, but she will absolutely. As well. The main characters stumble on a criminal meeting which goes south because they were following one of the involved parties because they were already a suspect. Convenient. On this particular day, time, quite lucky. Could have been any other time of the day. So Hank and Britt knew this meeting was happening because they had tapped this character's phone and were shown staking out his house until he got a call from his half-brother arranging this meeting, which he would be doing at this point because he's a wanted fugitive known by law enforcement to be in the area and would need his share of the money they boosted together a few months back. Everything happening here is following basic cause and effect, and nothing changes if this meeting happens at any other time in the day, so long as Hank and Britt are staking out the house and waiting for this call to come in. But sure, it's 
lucky in the same sense that you could just call anything that advances the story forward lucky anyways. The main character isn't an expert at something, but knows people who are convenient. As well, they happen to be visiting the house the moment they also see the known detective tapping the phone as well, which gives them the idea to tap it. It was just like, that seems, Lucky. this is just an ongoing case. So we don't even know how long this has been going on for. And they just, they were like, yep, there they are tapping the phone. It's like, oh, and then they also know people who have the power to, and, and willingness to tap the police. Now, ignoring this absurd premise that it is lucky for these private investigators who work outside the law to know some tech literate geeks who are willing to help them tap the police, considering that this is all occurring the morning after these guys have confirmed that the fugitive they're looking for is in the approximate area, and this is the earliest time that either of them could be here because they see the fugitive's half-brother as a decent lead, and it's reasonable to speculate that even if they didn't intercept Reynolds' tap here that Hank and Britt, being private investigators, would have done the standard thing that private investigators do with persons of interest and stay out Bradley's house and later follow Bradley to the pier in which he arranged to meet with Montel, in order to act as if this is both extremely unlikely to happen and the plot could not have moved forward without it, you would have to both ignore context provided by the show and appeal to totally baseless speculation so you can present this as an egregious, improbable contrivance that detracts from or taints the main cause and effect of a story. I don't... I have no idea what story you couldn't do this with. I'll elaborate on that in a minute. I also don't understand what the issue is with these criminals meeting at this time of the day, especially when, unlike what you see in Homecoming, there are no cameras around where they are meeting, and it's been spelled out in plenty of other media why a public meeting in broad daylight like this can actually be preferable for some criminals. Where do you transact your business? Enlighten me. I don't know, uh, how about Taco Cabeza? Nice and public, open 24 hours, nobody ever gets shot at Taco Cabeza. Hell. Why not the mall? You know, wait at the gap. Hey, it's time for the meet. You know, I'll put down the flat front khakis, head on over, grab an orange Julius, skip the part where psycho lunatic Tuco, you know, comes and steals my drugs and leaves me bleeding to death. Look. If you read or watch as many stories as I do, you will see contrivances that are astronomically lucky, which feel forced in to move the plot in a direction it otherwise wouldn't have. However, even the most highly acclaimed stories will feature very minor contrivances that are at least probable enough that they aren't worth fussing over certainly not enough to write off the story. Forgive me if I believe that these things, that Mahler and Fringy are getting disproportionately whiny about, pass the smell test in the same sense that Frodo getting stabbed right in the chest where he is protected by his mithril vest, rather than just decapitated or smashed by this cave troll, does. These types of things are contrived in the sense that all stories in general are contrived by a writer to get the story to a particular destination that they have in mind. A part of approaching stories in good faith is that this is not inherently a bad thing. What makes one of these things cross over from a non-issue to a major contrivance comes down to just how probable or improbable it is in tandem with whether it's the only thing that could have helped the writer out of a dead end that they wrote themselves into. Rations. Wait a minute, how did this happen? We're smarter than this. Apparently not. I would even say that there is a pretty big one at the start of episode 10 of Terriers. That episode largely happens because Hank happens to be in the same bathroom of the same hotel at the same exact time as the two biggest villains of the show going in there and, while oblivious to his presence, make it clear that they mean someone they are about to meet with harm. That even if someone might try to argue it's an inciting incident, would be what I count as an example of a major contrivance in this show. There's a pretty obvious difference between that and what they're complaining about in the second episode. You can argue that things could have played out differently here, but without an argument for why what did play out is unnaturally forced and ergo comparable to a more cut and dry example of a major contrivance, such as the one in episode 10 that I mentioned, or when a character survives getting shot because the bullet was stopped by a tiny object that happened to be on their person at the exact spot where they were shot, or when a character somehow magically knows where another character is without any reasonable explanation for how they would know, your criticism comes off as nothing more than arbitrary. If you can't see the difference between these things, if you are this overly sensitive to the occasional minor coincidence or lucky break, then I struggle to understand how you square that away with anything you think is really good, let alone how you cope with the reality that these things regularly happen in the real world. Oh, and a quick addendum on that bullet contrivance I mentioned earlier. 
That is a thing that some people in the real world have in fact been lucky enough to be saved by. I don't mean to imply that it is entirely off limits for stories to feature a stroke of luck as significant as this, as it's dependent on context, such as if it is surrounded by several other major contrivances, or if this is just an anomaly and there are otherwise very few other contrivances of the size, if any. Cartoons and comedies in general also tend to get a fair amount of leeway with what they are allowed to do that would be typically considered absurd for comedic effect. Flashback. Okay, for all the people, this is Ralph <laughs> is saying this, he said it a few times, for all the people who say, this is an incredible coincidence that all of this could actually happen, right? Then again, it's all logically possible, but remember, right, when we talk about coincidences, everything that is happening in your life, you, as if you, you watching this right now, you, everything that got you to where you are is the product of a million billion crazy coincidences which are only insanely unlikely in like hindsight you know like when we look back we say that's an insane coincidence that could have never happened but to us <clears throat> that's how things happen that is the reality of what happened so don't worry about it too much when people say well, like oh that's an insane coincidence right like you are where you are because of a gajillion coincidences lining up just right so it's okay and of course this comes up on the show wow i'm glad that all worked out you think that killing those guys is funny i do what a coincidence i guess it's some of that dreamlike logic right they would just invite well no no i i gotta uh, ralph i gotta like everything like i said everything when you take what it is what happened and then you look back you can say literally everything that happens is a series of insane coincidences but well, right it's just to highlight one right possible and like, they follow how is it that i met you uh well before i'd met basically any of the youtubers and we managed to start up efap very soon after all the tlj stuff happened what well, are the odds of me meeting you, just, you and wolf first? well you just so happened to have made just that one video that i just so happened to have watched because i just so happened to have been recommended it you decided to send a message right that i happened time. to catch because it was exactly. a youtube message which is unlikely to catch everything is the product of a trillion different incredible coincidences when you look back but something had to have happened right yeah and that's that's what i began at. it's like yeah. well there's logic it's like i did make yeah, that video is exactly. there a chance that rags would have seen it? it's like it makes sense that rags would yes. have seen it mm -hmm. does it make sense the rags would have been so interested in it to send me a message to just hang out at some point it's like why not yes. why would that not happen you know it's like exactly gotta chill out just with these yeah, it's not the same sure. as um, fucking Han Solo turns up to the Millennium Falcon five minutes after it's moved away from Jakku that happened to be in the exact same place as Palpatine's fucking daughter in a junkyard. Like, fuck off. <laughs> it's way too contrived. End of flashback. So you do know the difference! You could literally do this with anything. But I can go into more detail about that after I'm finished breaking down these arguments. Another plot hole that they banged on about had to do with their use of these bearer bonds that they are given as a reward for a caper they get hired to pull off in episode 4. Even though in episode 6, Hank mentions... Oh yeah, hey, about those bearer bonds, yeah. Um, we can't touch them. Look, we can't touch that until this Linda shit is well and cooled down. Well, how long is that gonna take? Uh, two years. However, there come two points in the series where Hank spends some of these bonds anyways. You don't think I can take care of you? Hank, you are. You're paying for it. It's nothing. I had some money put away. Yeah, bear bonds in the wall. That was weird. Mauler and Fringy latch onto this as a major inconsistency. Remember when they stole the the bonds? Uh, yeah. Remember how they they spend the bonds and then confirm that the bonds are too hot and to then, sell? That was my favorite part. We can't use. We can't spend them. Wait, no. Yeah, we can. Uh, wait, we can. We can spend them. Wait, no, we can't. It's like so because these blithering idiots don't seem to understand how bearer bonds work. Allow me to explain. 
To put it in first grader terms, bearer bonds are an old, uncommon type of currency in which the issuance of new ones has been outlawed in the US since the 80s. However, bonds issued before that point may still be redeemed if the issuer still exists. The reason these things may no longer be issued is because, unlike most currency, bearer bonds are unregistered, making them ideal for buyers who wish to remain anonymous. As a result, whoever physically holds the bonds are presumed to be the owner, and transactions involving these things do not leave behind a paper trail the same way that most currency he does. However, in order to redeem these things officially, one has to take them to a proper bank, and the one time that we see Hank cashing any of them out is at the beginning of episode 12, in which he is meeting with a guy who we later learn is involved in some types of criminal enterprises, including but likely not limited to arms dealing. Hank offers these bonds to Freddy at half of their value, which Freddy negotiates down to a quarter, and Hank is desperate enough for some emergency cash at this point that he accepts. Hey Freddy, you got the money? You got the thing? Yeah. I'm in kind of a hurry. There's $20,000 in bearer bonds in there. I'll take 15 in cash. What, are they hot or something? Or something. I mean, and I'll give you five. Done. So, you know how in Breaking Bad, the characters are often spending unlaundered money they've earned through their criminal enterprise? Ever notice how when they're doing that, it's for transactions with other criminals where they don't have to worry about accounting for the IRS? The same basic logic applies here. So, when it's mentioned a few episodes earlier that he used some bonds stashed in his wall, even though we don't see how he redeems those bonds, because we see how he redeems them here, we can safely infer that he would have redeemed them with some guy he has connections to, even if it wasn't Freddy specifically. Freddy is far from the only type of criminal connection to hang and Brit, as throughout the show, they are shown to have multiple such connections, which is to be expected for a pair of unlicensed PIs to have if they wish to be efficient at their jobs. These connections would include this trio of geeks who get involved whenever Hank and Brit need their technological know-how, which happens fairly often in this series. In one episode, there is this ice cream vendor who used to be a pharmacist until he was busted breaking into his own supply of drugs, who helps identify an anti-malarial drug with memory loss side effects, and of course, being an ex-con, Brit has his old partner in crime from his BNE days, Ray. These characters are outlaws, and and as such, they have connections with several other outlaws. This is not a plot hole. I mean, the, the show is full of these, like the big events that just don't make any sense. And yet, these are the best arguments you can come up with? Ridiculous. Apply yourself. Now, what if I'm deliberately leaving out their strongest arguments against the show? Not to worry, we can talk about those as well. Oh, um, oh, 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 SK, SK, okay, okay, sorry, sorry, sorry. So, he says... Why did you, why did you, SK, leave out the most valid criticism of Terriers? Why did the goons leave the weapon in the first episode and didn't search for the phone of the dead body? Would you like to know why that is? Okay? There's nowhere to run. When she went, goes back to the lifeguard tower, um, she finds her boyfriend dead, believes that her cell phone is taken at this point, so she just takes the gun that's left at the crime scene to protect herself. They make a big stink about this in the watch party. Like, why do they uh, leave the gun at the crime scene? Now, um, I initially thought maybe it was the two goons that attacked them in the parking garage. It's not. There's actually a line in episode four in which Lindis himself admits that he is the guy who killed uh, Tony, the dude in the lifeguard tower. I know you planted that gun in my study. Set me up for this. You can deny it all you want. I don't care. That's not why I want to talk to you. You killed my friend Mickey Gosney. I swear to you. On the life of my child, I had nothing to do with that. You innocent of Anthony Bianco's murder too? No. Let's just say when you frame me for that, you got lucky. He is the dude who shot him. So it's like, oh, it's not these two um, private security dudes who might know better than to leave a gun at the crime scene. It's Lindus, this dumb fuck rich dude who doesn't have any experience with killing people and might make a mistake because he saw, I don't know, you see them leave the gun at the crime scene on, on TV because you don't want to get pulled over with it. On top of this, it's even mentioned in the episode when the girl is saying where she found the gun. She says that she found the gun right next to the murder victim. After dad pulled a no-show, I went back there last night, found Tony dead on the floor with his head off. And that gun was beside him. I grabbed it and got out of there. So it's like, oh, it's probable that what happened was he placed the gun next to the guy in order to stage a suicide, in order to make it seem like the guy wasn't murdered which is a thing that some murderers are known to do. It's not an unreasonable mistake or a decision for Linus to do. And Eleanor, who at this point would be in fear for her life, hasn't gotten a gun from her dad, as she was hoping, and sees a gun right here, and needs a form of protection, takes the gun from the crime scene. So that's a reasonable lapse in judgment right there, too. My bad, everybody. There was somewhere to run. 
There's also this moment that they banged on about quite a bit in their server about these two goons who jumped them in a parking garage not immediately pulling out their gun. If you're not thinking very critically and you're looking for things to complain about without considering any good faith explanations for why a character might have made a certain decision, you might hastily conclude that this is what I like to call a tentacle blade problem. These guys had a gun, but they didn't open with it. They had guns. They weren't going to shoot them in broad daylight. Shoot them? Just, just apparently they were. Like, no, but also, to, yeah. He, he was threatening him with a gun. That doesn't mean he's going to shoot him with a gun. No, I'm not saying that he was going to shoot. If you want to abduct them, which it seems like that's what they wanted to do, point it at them and say, get in the car or I'll shoot you. The problem here is that people who work in private security, like these guys, are typically trained to use their guns as a last resort if an encounter escalates to a potentially life-threatening one, such as if a combatant begins beating them in the head with a heavy metal object. It's also worth noting, of course, that this guy doesn't immediately jump to shooting Hank. He's pulling out his gun to try to talk Hank down after he's just seen his buddy get smacked in the head with a fire extinguisher. Although, in fairness, it's not like Mahler is the best at being able to glean whether someone intends or doesn't intend to kill someone else when guns get involved. You don't go like, well, just, just because we got him on video doesn't mean shit because it could have been a face swap. It's like, well, we still have to fucking bring him in, which is all they wanted to do yeah. with Winter Soldier. They didn't want to kill him. And you're going to have to hurry. We have orders to shoot on sight. I wasn't in Vienna. I don't do that anymore. They're entering the building. Well, the people who think you did are coming here now. And they're not planning on taking you alive. kill him. Apparently they were. <laughs> Not as smart as he thinks he is. On his server, Mahler suggested that these guys should have immediately pulled out their gun and then, in broad daylight, fire a warning shot in this crowded parking garage in the middle of a city. No comment. That's, that's kind of stupid. Which is funny, because then in the very next episode in The Watch Party, they complained about a guy who's depicted as skittish, intimidated, and not at all physically imposing, bringing a gun for protection to a meeting in broad daylight with his much larger half-brother who he double-crossed, and then firing it in panic and running off instead of staying to murder him. Was that a gun? Incredibly lucky the gunshot did what it did to uh, the half-brother. When they just showed up... Like they're point, right there. Point right. blank, and it shot him between his torso and his arm. And instead of firing again, he ran off. Now, as you may have noticed from the tone of his voice, Fringy has already developed a seething hatred against the show and isn't exactly good at hiding it. The problem is, this seems to be making him miss the fact that the only reason Bradley shot the gun in the first place was because Montel had lunged at him, which was likely prompted by having a gun waved in his face, and that Bradley ran off afterwards doesn't really indicate a major inconsistency in his motivations. If anything, it seems to hint that he only brought the gun along to deter Montel from attacking him, but wasn't actually expecting to have to use it, and wasn't intending on just murdering him in broad daylight. So he panicked and fled the scene. I guess these guys can easily miss this incredibly basic cause and effect when they are objectively analyzing something that they clearly cannot judge separately from their emotions. Maybe he should have waited to make arguments until he was no longer mad over a TV show. It's as if contextual differences between different characters don't really matter to them, and they'll change their standard according to whatever is most convenient to validating their arbitrary feelings or something. Far be it from me to actually respond to this by saying that this character doing something that Mahler thinks he himself wouldn't have done does not a flaw make, but this guy not making a brain-dead decision that Mahler believes he himself would have done does not a flaw make. I also don't think I believe that, ne like, if I was on one of these ships, I would have taken the bullet, I would have been like, I'll blow the other one up, there's no way I'm letting both ships blow up, that's fucking retarded. Yeah, they're good and everything, shutting everything down, it's just like, Batman, you fucking serious? You really want to give yourself up and get arrested in the hopes that Joker stops hitting people, really. It's just like, dude, seriously, you're naive if you think he's gonna stop. At worst, you could say it's perhaps convenient for Hank and Britt that these guys followed how they would have been trained to use their firearms, in the same way that it's convenient for any character to come out on top in a fight, even if there are no noticeable contrivances present which enable them to, such as if their only armed opponents decide to consistently run up to engage with them in close quarters, which is the one range where said character is a threat, rather than just shooting them from a safe distance. Especially if the only times that that character is shot at by any of these dozens of armed men, all of their bullets magically only hit the one limb of his otherwise squishy body that is bulletproof. Keep your distance. 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 
Keep your distance. Keep your distance. Keep your distance. Keep your distance. Keep your distance. Keep your distance. I'm not gonna kill anyone. Keep your distance. Keep your distance. We have orders to shoot on sight. Right. Bucky has fists. You have guns. Fucking use them. They don't give a fuck about Mando getting shot anymore. He is officially blaster proof. Despite yeah. half of his body not being I'm covered in Beskar, I will... he gets shot like 20 times in this episode. Captain America Civil War is the best film in the MCU. There is one valid argument they made, though. They just so... ...deserve to be locked away forever because of how they damage other people in society. So selfishly driven. It's really annoying. Yeah, they just want to do things for money. It's always about getting money. Yeah, like this one random scene where Hank scams this depressed insomniac guy so he can take his wallet. Oh wait, that's not even a scene in Terriers. This is from an episode of Monk the main actor played a bit part in. And his name in that episode is Goalie. Silly me. Well, in my headcanon, this is the same character, and he's a despicable piece of shit. It's just as good as any of EFAP's actual arguments about the show anyways. But, all joking aside... You remember my, my daughter Eleanor, my little girl? Anyway, she calls me out of the blue yesterday. She sounds scared. She asked me about a 38 I had from back in the day. Can she borrow it? I was on my way when the goddamn cops roused me. Hank, you can find her, can't you, Hank? That's what you do. Give her this money. Tell her. Tell her that dad tried. Just make sure she's safe. I can't. I just can't. It's always about getting money. My advice to you, as a friend, is ditch this. That right there is money and power. And it's just too big for you. If you're looking to make a buck, I got stuff coming in. Hmm? Cheating wife case. I need pictures. You want to get yourselves killed? Stay on this side. What about her? Her life is in danger. This is from your dad. Don't worry. It's not forever. We're going to straighten things out down here and you'll be back before you know it. Oh my god, it's, it's not about money, Yo-Yo. It's not about... I've done what I've done. I will live with the consequences. But my wife and my son are in danger. Imminently so. And I need for you to secure their safety. Please. I need you to do this. Not for me, but for my family. They are innocents in all of this. <laughs> out the fucking money, y'all, y'all! Wait, 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 look. The guys who are after Lindis, once they find out he's dead, okay, they're gonna go after his wife. What are you saying? They're gonna go after the wife and the kid for the, for the scientific mumbo-jumbo stuff on those papers. We can't do that to him. It's gonna put him in harm's way. So selfishly driven. It's really annoying. He had a message for you. He gave to us to give to you. Leave town. You're in danger. There are men who mean you harm. Former associates of my husband. That's right. Yeah, they just want to do things for money. It's always about getting money. You think we'll be rewarded with money? Huh? That you will sell back to me? What is mine? No, no, I, I don't want money. I don't want anything, nothing. It's not about money. Usually when you've got like people who are bad people, like protagonists in Grand Theft Auto, you try to give them like an element that makes them interesting or that there's something about them that's worthwhile. Well, like, Nico and CJ are, like, loyal to their family. That's that's an important one. It's like, that yeah. helps a long way. Come on, Seth, we gotta go. Come on, sis. Chop, chop. I'm not taking you back to the hospital, but I gotta take you somewhere. Why? Look, I hesitate to say this, given your proclivity for paranoia, but bad men may be coming after us. So come on, get some, get some things together. Let's go. Hurry, I'm not joking. I don't really get why you can't just tell me. I, maybe because it's one of those things where the less you know, the better. Yeah, better for me or better for you? Better for the both of us, yeah. Just spend the night at a friend's house. It's one night. Thank you. For... It didn't take too long. Hey, Mark. A while ago, you said that Hank would let me down. Guy getting put in that ambulance right there. He just took a bullet from my girl, man. He the team wanted to rescue my ass. I never said he wouldn't have his moments. Mom, you want ice cream? Mom? Do you guys know who I am? Because I got no idea. Don't worry, kid. We're going to help you figure out what's going on with you. I promise. What are you doing? 
We're not an adoption agency. Look at him, man. He's not a bum. He's dressed quite the opposite. Wherever he's from, I'm sure his people would love to have him back. There might even be a big fat reward in it for us. Yeah, they just want to do things for money. It's always about getting half court shot at best. And you know it. What is this about, dude? Really? He's the same age Steph was when she started. You now she was going to college, getting straight A's. One morning, she just walked out of class. She was gone for six days. No one noticed for two. Oh. This is not, no, oh. it's not. You're not understanding the point. It's not about the money. So let's just not abandon this kid just yet. So selfishly driven. It's really annoying. An ugly stick. I was an angel. You were an angel. You always took care of me. I want to take care of you, but I'm not ready. Think you can let me go for a little while? Well, like Nico and CJ are like loyal to their family. That's that's an important one. It's like that yeah. helps a long way. If you end up hating this place, you gotta tell me. Figure something else out. And you have to promise to come visit. A lot, not like when I was at St. John's. Promise. Um, no, the it, most it, the show will do okay. is be yeah. like, oh man, these guys pot of gold, but they do some they do some dubious yes. things, and it's like, nope, they're just fucking evil. What is that? Jessica Sampson. Missing college. She went missing 36 hours ago. I guess your John Doe does have something to feel guilty about. Go ahead. Adam! Adam! Is that you, man? It's Hank. We're here to help. Jessica, it's okay. It's okay. You're safe. Nope, they're just fucking evil. Campus security was called 25 minutes ago. When they got here, the kids started carrying on about how he was going to shoot the roommate unless they went in there to stop him. What do you need us to do? Well, you've been friends with the kid the whole day, which makes you his oldest friend. Figure he trusts you more than he trusts us. I'm coming in. Hank, no way. I already saved one girl today. Why not go for two? If you go in there, I can't protect you, okay? I'm gonna need to. You, get out. Get out. Close the door behind you. No, 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 not you. You sit down. You had a crush on her, man. That's normal. Normal. Those pills you took, they made you do what you did? You don't know it. There's something inside me. The pills made me... It just brought it out. It's all shit. I'm sick. I'm crazy. You're not crazy. You're not crazy. You want to see crazy? I'll show you crazy because I know it. Now listen to me, man. You do not get to do this. There are people out there who have a kind of crazy that will never go away. And they have to keep on living. And what happened to you is going to pass. So stop being a selfish prick and pull yourself together. Go get better. Deserve to be locked away forever because of how they damage other people in society. Wait a minute, I remember this case. Been missing about four or five years now. My mother still calls every few months. Has she run any fingerprints or DNA or anything? You don't have the resources to run prints on every hooker that shows up dead. Sorry. You know what I mean. You think you might want to call Mrs. Dale and tell her what happened to her son? Evelyn Dale? Rick Pollock, I'm a private investigator. This is my client. Michael Regas. We're here about your son, Trevor. I'm so very sorry for your loss. We're here because Michael hired me to track you down. He felt it was important to meet with you. He uh, became friends with Trevor shortly after he ran away. Can you tell us about the past six years? Everybody, they really liked him. We never really knew why he ran away. You don't know what happened? I wanted you to know that he told me more than once 
how much he loved the both of you. <laughs> he deserved to grow up to be a good man. <laughs> he was a good man, Miss Dale. I knew him very well. And your son was a wonderful man. But they're not even anti-heroes. Like, I wouldn't, I would consider them to be villains. Zeitlin is here at the hotel with this muscle guy, Tan Su. up to something. I don't know what I overheard them in the camp, but I think they mean someone harm, and I want to find out why. I'm right above you. Did they threaten you? Someone close to you? Look, just leave my mother out of this. You don't need to go to 517 Lambert Street. I got a job for you guys. Write this down. Hi, Mrs. Ross. Uh, your daughter Laura sent us. Yeah, we're friends of hers. Uh, from work. I, I don't understand why I can't just call Laura. She's fine, okay? She just needs to know that you're okay. I feel like I'm being kidnapped. Ma'am, if uh, that were true, we'd be the world's shittiest kidnappers. Nope, they're just fucking evil. Good afternoon, sir. Hotel security. We have a report of a woman screaming in here. Miss Ross, were you screaming and somehow we missed it? Not that I recall. Well, I think that wraps up all the questions I have for you, Mr. Zeitlin. Thank you for your time. It was my pleasure. Let me walk you out. Oh, no, that's all right. I'll let these gentlemen escort me. Just out of curiosity, who phoned in the report? Another hotel guest. Must have heard a... TV or something. Just keep walking, they're coming. You, who are you? I'll tell you about that later. My mom? She's with some friends of mine, she's fine, but you're not. Come on, this way, go. Really? I'll be in touch. Thank you. Excuse me. Please, take care of this lady. Take her wherever she needs to go. Okay. I mean, no, I'm serious now. This is not about the fucking money. Why won't you understand it? Understand my point. This is not about the money. So, you've confused moralizing with criticism. This so. is a problem, buddy, is that we don't care if you don't show all of it. We care when you start misrepresenting it yeah. and lying about it and taking it out of context, which is the only thing you people are capable of doing because you don't actually have an argument. Like I will always say, the characters aren't that bad of people. Brit nearly killed a man. The characters aren't that bad of people. Yes, and the show said it was bad, but that doesn't mean the characters don't do good. They help people out for money, yes. People need dinners on their table. They even do cases where money isn't involved, like the one with the amnesia kid. You said they weren't bad people. <laughs> no, Fringy, you illiterate fuckwit. He said they aren't that bad of people. Learn to fucking read. And also, the show doesn't meaningfully acknowledge their wrongdoing. The show doesn't seem to even appreciate that framing a man for murder because you suspect they did it is morally wrong. Do you know what Lindis's lawyer alleged in there? That you and your boy Toy just planted that murder weapon at Lindis's house. You don't believe that, do you? That he's my boy toy? The Lord taketh away, he also giveth. Well, he will also bone us if anyone finds out we planted that gun. We framed a guilty man. The Lord's light shineth upon us. Quit it. Quitteth what? You're pissing him off. Look, we nab Montel, put a little change in our pocket, and then we start at the Tony. Plant that gun? What? Did you and Hank plant that gun? No, sir, detectives. You are a good friend. I give you credit for that. Bobby told me about an office that he keeps at the top floor of the first building he ever developed. He also told me about a financial parachute that he sequestered there in case of, oh, I don't know, someone framing him for murder someday. I think we have to come clean the guys in. About what? About everything. Well, maybe not everything. About robbing this building. Hank, that's a felony. I could go to prison. We both could, no, but about planting the gun. He has enough evidence. He'll let us slide, but he has to hear all this. Here it goes. God forgive us! You know what this reminds me of? The time we had to climb down the ravine to the car we crashed with the dead guy inside? You heard. I did, and um, I'm sorry. I just wanted to come by and say I'm sorry and uh, that you shouldn't blame yourself. I drove him to this. No, you didn't. He knew that. I've been lying to him for months. I know, I saw him earlier today. What did you say to him? I needed the loan, Miriam. 
What a great guy, man. What a good guy you are. Hey, hey, where's my husband? What have you done with him? Answer me, you bastards. What have you done with my husband? I know it was you. I saw you. I saw you take him. The show isn't so, aware that he's done anything. It's like Black Widow. They, they have no idea. Uh, so, uh, what can I do for you, Jason? You can stop using my credit cards. They really make it hard to f get invested in these people when they keep doing heinous shit. Steal a, a man's fucking cards when he's about to get married and charge a bunch of hookers to it. It's like, <laughs> it's like, it's not funny, man. Your partner, Britt, I realized where I knew him from. That day that I was being fitted for my tux, he lifted my wallet, didn't he? Yeah, it's, it's not his fault. He didn't know who you were. I mean, it needs to stop, Hank. It's, it does. It did. It's, it's done. What's this? That's a file on Jason Volloway. You investigated me? That's why I Brit left your wallet. Using your credit cards and all that other shit, that was irresponsible. But I really wanted to find out who Gretchen was marrying for her sake. You need to understand. You did me a solid by not telling Gretchen what I did. I'm giving you this as a courtesy. She doesn't love you anymore. Do you get that? She loves me. She doesn't even know you. But she damn well will before the wedding. Who tells her you or me? That's your call. You've been spying on him? I did some research. I figured you'd only known him six months. It was worth looking into. You've been spying on him? Just read that. You've been spying on him? Okay, fine. I did a background check. Ran credit reports. The whole works. Hoping you'd find something. No, not necessarily. Just, just read that. Anything else? Anything else? That says he might be a child molester. What are you trying to do, Hank? Blow up my wedding? Win me back by dredging up this bullshit? If it's such bullshit, why was he keeping it a secret from you? Jason told me about this on our second date because he's honest, because he's stable, because he cares more about me than himself. He didn't do anything. I spoke with one of the victims, Gretch. Jason was there. He knew about Talked everything. Talked with one of the victims? What the hell are you doing, Hank? I was looking out for you. I was protecting you. I don't need you to look out for me. I don't need anything from you. You don't have a damn clue who Jason is. Yeah, I do. That's who he is, right there. You think I didn't do my homework on this? I didn't know you knew. He was innocent, Hank. Blameless. My God. <laughs> you're more reckless sober than you were drunk. Don't tell me you're protecting me. You're the live grenade in my life. Stay the hell away from my wedding. You're disinvited and stay the hell away from me. If you think our criticism amounted to protagonists doing immoral things equals bad, then I would also wonder how we square that away with plenty of content we love. Maybe the argument is that they are pieces of shit, and the show seems to have no idea beyond a handful of scenes chewing them out. The show is downright convinced they are rapscallions with hearts of gold, when in reality they cause a major portion of the horrors in the season. They spent very little time dealing with the immorality of their decisions, because the writers don't think they've done on anything wrong. This then bleeds into other characters as well. The scene where Hank is told that he's a piece of shit by his ex was my favorite in the show, by the way. The closest we get to him even remotely realizing how much of a twat he is. Uh, just one question, Mahler. Which scene are you talking about? The one I just showed, or this upcoming one? Henry Dalworth, you're under arrest on three counts of conspiracy to commit murder. What? Oh, no. Wait, Captain, please. Read him his rights, get him to hold it. Hey, hey, oh, oh, what the hell's going on? Hey, hey, wait a minute, okay? These two men, they confessed to the murder this morning. Also confess that your friend here hired them to kill his ex-wife's husband. Oh, no. No. Get him to holding now. Maggie! 
What the hell is going on? Why did Hank get arrested? Two guys confessed to shooting up Sam's liquor, and they're claiming that Hank paid them to do it. What? That's horseshit. It's horseshit that's sticking. Apparently, Hank has been stalking Jason for weeks. Accusing him of being a child molester. Using his credit card. Man, do you know anything about this? Hank checked into the hotel where Gretchen and Jason were getting married the day they were getting married. Talk to me, Hank. I didn't do it, Gretchen. I didn't kill Jason. The police seem certain you did. A lot of what they say is true. You're delusional. And jealous. Self-destructive. You take every ounce of happiness in your life and wreck it. And you take the people you love with you. But you couldn't kill Jason. I guess all of those scenes will be forgotten. I don't understand. How can you be so bad at media criticism? Wait, have you guys either of you seen Fracture? Uh, is that the one with Anthony Hopkins no. and Ryan Gosling? It yeah. is. It is. I, I saw it a very, very, very long time ago and have no memory it's, um, of it. It's okay. It's, it's like, it's really worth it for Anthony Hopkins acting, as per usual. Um, but the storyline is a man executes his wife and there's about 10,000 pieces of evidence, and he even admits to the detective um, in person, in the crime scene, I shot her, she was like annoying me, I shot her, I killed her. Mm -hmm. the, the point of the story is, they can't prove it, they use everything they can, and he keeps fucking up the entire system, because basically he learned all about the system, and he, it's, it's kind of like law-abiding citizen, in a, in a way, um, where a man prepped for a long time before committing the murder so he could get away with it, and it's like a criticism on the system itself. Now, second act low point, when the evidence has almost fully run out and he's about to be let off for free, our protagonist is told by the detective on the case, who happened, by the way, like, it's, it's all part of the story, he's very invested in this, and he says, I can plant the gun, because we, we know he did it. Like, we know he did it. And our protagonist is like, yeah. And he's like, so I can plant the gun and he can be done. Like, and it'll be that. Uh, and he said he, he can put it in a place that they haven't checked in his house yet, and then it can just be a matter of, oh my god, we found it, there it is. Mm -hmm. And it's like this huge deal in the story. He wrestles with it for a full day before deciding he can't do it because it's not right. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to be honest, really bothers me that they've uh, framed him for murder when they don't actually know that he did it. And it bothers me when you frame someone for murder when they have done it. Like, that's kind of my line. Once again, the moralistic fallacy rears its ugly head, this time in a breathtakingly pathetic fashion. What Ryan Gosling does in Fracture has absolutely no bearing on whether it is in character for the main characters of this show, neither of whom is played by Ryan Gosling reprising his role in Fracture, mind you would do. Whether this particular storytelling choice fits a story is dependent on whether it is consistent for the main character to do. Ryan Gosling's choice in Fracture isn't good writing because it's merely noble of him, it's because it wouldn't be in character for him to go along with planting the gun in Anthony Hopkins' house, because his character is portrayed as far more by the book, if a bit arrogant, and the entire conflict around that film is how he catches Anthony Hopkins by playing entirely within the confines of the law. Of course, that movie takes quite a bit of artistic license with the law so that it can have its story, making it especially bizarre for Mahler to act as if it is even fine by the standard that he used to judge Terriers, but whatever. The appeal to the main characters of Terriers is that they don't do things by the book, and they're far more willing to cheat if it means putting the bad guy away. Complaining that these guys aren't as noble or principled to a fault as Ryan Gosling is in Fracture is just complaining about the basic premise of the show. It's going into the show with a specific expectation to see characters working within the confines of the law, getting flustered when the show is clearly demonstrating that that isn't what this story is about, and then complaining that the show just isn't about something else entirely. And they, they don't even know that he's done it. I mean, they just got assaulted by a couple of guys who tried to grab the daughter of a friend of Hank's, who was blackmailing a guy with a sex tape which contained proof of his current real estate scheme being fraudulent. A sex tape that Hank and Britt were offered upwards of 40 grand Rand to recover for the guy being blackmailed, which led to them discovering the blackmailer's boyfriend with a bullet in his head. And the blackmailer's father just coincidentally overdoses on heroin despite never shooting up in his life. And when Hank confronts Lindis on it, Lindis does nothing but smugly look back at him. They may not know he did it, but they have an entirely reasonable suspicion that he did, in tandem with Hank being understandably pissed off by his friend's apparent murder, which the police aren't willing to do anything about, making this a perfect storm for why they might be willing to do this. It's completely within their character to suspect him and plant the murder weapon, Mahler just 
didn't pay attention. Oh, there's a fucking surprise. Yeah, yeah. even if even if you're pre even if you know that he did it, it's not the right way to do this. I agree. They're they're ethically uh, very dubious. I mean, I don't know if that's dubious. Like, that's just evil. Yeah, that's <laughs> As I mentioned at the start of this, and have demonstrated throughout this video, Mahler is noticeably very smug throughout this entire watch party, and his chosen method of persuasion is to not break down any particular argument in a sensible fashion, as a person who actually argues in good faith would, but rather to just patronize and clearly laugh at what I'm saying. It's a rather common method for a narcissist to take advantage of a certain degree of trust that someone has in them to then bully that person into agreeing with them, because what this does is effectively gaslight them into believing that what they are saying is ridiculous, even if it really isn't, and make them less confident in what they're saying, so that the narcissist can then just walk all over them without having to put in any actual effort into making a cogent point. I'm bringing this up again because I find this specific instance to, possibly better than any other example I've shown so far, demonstrate that whether an argument is sound is not determined by which person sounds more confident, thanks to just how utterly insane Mahler's position here is. I really shouldn't have to explain why not personally finding the main character likable doesn't magically make his story badly written, although Mahler's fans will surely insist that what he's actually saying here is that he thinks that the show is endorsing what Hank does here, because it doesn't depict this as an affront to morality as foul as, say, rape. But that just kicks the can down the road to, this show doesn't dismiss context to the degree that I do, and therefore it is badly written. Mahler and Fringy are well within their rights to not like that the show isn't catering to their own delusional view of morality. But it bears repeating that they haven't stopped at saying they don't like the show or the main characters. They are making what they would claim to be objective statements about its quality. No matter how much their fanbase tries to deflect from my criticisms with this Mott and Bailey of, oh, you're just mad that they didn't like the show. Furthermore, something being wrong or unethical doesn't make it evil. There are varying degrees to this sort of thing, which I'll get to in a minute. Appealing to the idea that you yourself have a steadfast principle against framing someone for murder in any context does not magically change the fact that the context in which Hank and Britt do it here isn't actually villainous. While this action would make it delusional for one to argue that they are paragons of virtue we should strive to emulate, that is quite clearly not how the show is trying to frame these characters anyways, making these arguments not meaningfully different from complaining about any story featuring antiheroes that we are meant to root for on the basis that they sometimes do very bad things, even if the story recognizes that those things are bad and makes a point of depicting them as such. Planting a murder weapon on someone that you genuinely suspect of murder, even if you have tangible reasons for that suspicion, is not moral to do. But it is also a far cry from being outright villainous. As a point of contrast, a truly villainous context for planting a murder weapon on someone would look a bit more like taking a weapon that you used in a murder that you committed and planting it on a person that you would know is innocent. Bonus villainy points if the person you're framing is even a family member. Such contexts are what differentiate a morally complex antihero from a villain. So if you go out of your way to ignore such context, then of course you can make outlandish claims like the ones that Ethad made about Hank and Brit, all of which appeal to a childish, black and white perspective of morality taken to its logical conclusion. Well, because one of the issues is, it's, it's interesting to think about because it's like, well, Grand Theft Auto, the protagonists are really bad people. It's like, the, I would say one, the, the games are aware of this. Also, they put them up against worse people, usually. Mm -hmm. Like, just like, real pieces of shit. Um... It's so like Nico Bellic is a bad guy, but Dimitri is a bad guy who also betrays everybody that he knows for money. It's like, oh, okay, so it's easy to hate him more than Nico. It's like, well, San Andreas, CJ is a criminal who kills people for money. Tenpenny is a police officer who abuses position of power to kill people for money. It's like, oh, so it's worse. There's like more things on top of it. Um, hit, well, and I, I guess there is sort of the, the Ludo narrative dissonance, right, of ignoring just the amount of devastation that these characters create. But I think it's just an acknowledgement in the world of, like, these are not good people. Whereas here it's like, these guys are the protagonists. Like, they're not... I, I feel like the tone of the show does not suggest that these guys are at all. The show does not believe these people to be bad. There is no in-text resignation of them being bad. Unlike, say, Breaking Bad or GTA. Yeah, well, you know, that's just like, uh, your opinion, man. The show frames these characters as people whose means are questionable, but whose goals are ultimately noble. They are incredibly difficult to root for. There is, constantly, throughout the show, people call them out a lot of times. When the show has one of the protagonists nearly beat a man to death, and then ends with that character smiling over the prospects of evading punishment, I don't know what to tell you. Here's a real crazy idea. 
What if Infinity War was the end of the MCU? What if we end on the phenomenal closing scene of that film, where Thanos watches the sun rise and smiles? I think this scene could play out in multiple different ways. The scene could remain as it is, or Thanos could turn to dust and nod, being perfectly content with the hand the stones dealt him. The gauntlet drops to the ground. The bad guy won, but the stones themselves are a permanent fixture of this universe. And maybe one day, Thanos' wrongs will be undone. When the show has one of the protagonists nearly beat a man to death, and then ends with that character smiling over the prospects of evading punishment. What if we end on the phenomenal closing scene of that film, where Thanos watches the sun rise and smiles? I don't believe in consistency. What if I'm poor at spotting subtext? Ha! <laughs> As if being completely unable to grasp subtlety has stopped anyone from leaving a flaming hot take on the internet. The best thing about a blunt reading of the text is that I can use the text directly, like an artillery shell lobbed into my opponent's argument. I'll just approach understanding a story's meaning with the same complete lack of tact and grace I apply to my day-to-day -day social interactions. Well, if I ever actually left my house, I suppose. Yes, my inability to read between the lines will make me come across as either willfully stupid, completely daft, or so literal-minded that I should probably stick to middle management rather than any kind of media analysis. But understanding that will require that I also have the ability to pick up on subtle cues to adjust my behavior, and that's not going to happen, so I'm all in on a literal surface-level reading of the text. That's not to say that even a complete lack of understanding of subtext restricts me to merely reading context. Context can be completely ignored or championed purely based on if it supports my point or not. This never leads to problems. Like, for example, this story has a bad thing in it, then the story is obviously endorsing the bad thing. All of the context showing the bad guys doing the bad thing, framing showing the tragedy of the bad thing occurring, whole chapters dedicated to exploring the full negative effects of the bad thing's wake. No, merely having the bad thing exist in the story is obviously a tacit endorsement and moral equivalent of doing the bad thing. This goes doubly so if the protagonist does the bad thing. For example, what if the protagonist begins to take a series of morally questionable actions in the pursuit of unchecked power? Well, that's bad. I'm going to launch a long diatribe against the main character and endlessly point out how the protagonist is becoming a monster. Then, when I accuse the protagonist of supporting fascism, I'll act shocked when I find the author right next to me nodding along in agreement. What? The story is a cautionary tale. I'm not supposed to agree with every action the protagonist takes? But everyone knows that every protagonist's morality aligns 100% with the author's. Next thing you'll tell me is that not every protagonist is meant to be a wish fulfillment self-insert. I didn't say they weren't bad people. I said they aren't that bad of people. So are they good or bad? Justifying immoral actions with I need dinner on my table is a big oof, my dude. Not as big of an oof as getting engaged in this discussion without first seeing the show for yourself. <laughs> everyone needs a dinner on the table, but that doesn't give everyone a license to get it by all means necessary. I find it utterly amazing that the message from Wick that this comment is responding to is one where Wick wasn't even conceding that they were doing bad things to make money. He said that they were helping people out for money because this is their job. On top of that, he's even pointing out cases where they aren't making any money off of what they do and are just helping people to help them. You know, these are just things that he could have realized if he had just, I don't know, watched the show or something. Or if he had possibly just read Wick's comment out loud before responding to it. But that type of thing doesn't win you any brownie points from the EFAP hosts, so... I guess it just makes sense that this guy wouldn't want to do any of his own research first. Or at the very least, make sure that he's not strawmanning someone. They sound like shit, but that could just be me. I mean, you sound like an unthinking dick writer, but that could just be me. Hey, people in the chat in the comments, help me out here. Is Thunder S an unthinking dick writer? I didn't mean it like that. I'm just saying when they help people for money, it ain't that greedy. Plus, they don't only do it for money. Like, yes, they're immoral and at times bad people, but they are capable of doing good, which they do show. I want a direct answer. Are Hank and Brick good people or bad people? Not one fucking person in the server recognized that this is a false dichotomy. Bad people. Thank you. I hope that in five minutes you don't revert back on that and then say, oh, well, their methods are crude, but they're good people. You're a... You're a fucking baby, Fringy. Never claimed they were good people, just that the show is more acknowledgeable of their misdeeds than you give credit to, and they're bad, but not GTA bad. The four steps of defending the main characters of Terriers. Step one, their methods are crude, but they have hearts of gold. Step two, okay, they're morally dubious. I like anti-heroes. Step three, fine, they're bad people, but is that a flaw? Step four, 
five minutes later. Their methods are crude, but they have hearts of gold. None of... None of these three statements are mutually exclusive with each other, Fringy. They can all be true at the same time. Do you think the common position for those who love the show is that they are bad people and the show recognizes that? <laughs> yes. I wish you the best of luck. Okay, Mahler, even if you were correct and the majority of people who watch the show miss the exact same references that you and Fringy did, that wouldn't magically erase all of those references from existence. Nice bandwagon fallacy, though. Out of curiosity, do you think Hank could wield Mjolnir? <laughs> Oh, this is a direct reference to something I had tweeted out a month before. Hey, uh, Mauler, do you see that dude right above Hank? Do you, do you think that and the frame that I chose for Rick Mitchell on top of the idea that any of these guys could actually be more worthy of lifting Mjolnir than Samwise Gamgee, that this tweet could have possibly been a joke? He's under oath. Some people are grossly unqualified to judge character writing. And it shows. The, the big thing as well, though, is like, even if you were to put all of that to one side, which would be putting aside a lot, what is it in this show that is particularly valuable when it comes to character writing? I d I'm not sure. I don't, I, don't, I don't know what it would be compared to, like, in Breaking Bad, you can get some great stuff in terms of Walt and Jesse, and, um, and I, I, can't, I can't believe I'm spacing. Uh, the v villain. <laughs> I'm totally blanking. Gus. Like, and, and, uh, and Mike. Like, you got all these great characters that are going on these really cool arcs and they're super interesting, but I don't, I don't feel that way about these characters at all. There's nothing particularly interesting about them. Anti-heroes are flawed, as are we. Their moral complexity mirrors our own. And just like us, they are learning and growing as they move along the path of life. Their mistakes make us think of our mistakes. And perhaps the reason we root for their redemption is the reflection of ourselves rooting for our own. So you might be curious about the contrast between the anti-hero and the villain. One we embrace and relate to, while the other we despise and detach from. Both are driven by selfish motivations, yet our emotional response differs between them. The reason for this, while not necessarily obvious, is a relatively simple formula. The anti-hero must have a glimmer of humanity alongside a noticeable vulnerability. This is what allows the viewer to truly connect with the character. It allows us to forgive them when they are unethical, but admire them when they are noble. It allows them to be angry, cowardly, and greedy, but also cheerful, brave, and empathetic. We have to take you back to the hospital now. Why? Because you're sick. And stupid. Six years of stupid. He was supposed to love me. Till death do us part. What, you couldn't wait ten minutes? He's gonna lose me, you know. He's gonna lose me, and then he's gonna be sorry. <laughs> yeah. yeah. He will. Yeah, he will. Is the main character meant to be deplorable? You'd hope so, but no. no. Um, no the most the show will do okay. is be yeah, like, oh man, these guys, hot of gold, but they do some... They do some dubious yes. things, and it's like, nope, they're just the fucking evil. The tone of the show is that though their methods may be crude, they are good people with good goals. That's that's what the show is going for. But they're not even anti-heroes. Like, I wouldn't I would consider them to be villains. Flashback. Literally introduced as being tortured for months on end and left in suspended disassembly. Of course he's smirking. He's just proven his daughter to be a liar. He outfoxed her. He's satisfied. He's not a fucking good guy. Stop acting like the film thinks he's a good guy. <laughs> well, that's the thing. He he immediately opened this up with saying that he's a protagonist, which is like so. Wrong. It means he has to be a good guy, apparently. Also, I don't know. Yeah, all, yeah, the protagonist doesn't have to be a good moral person. Citizen Kane. Punisher. <laughs> I mean, he's supposed to be gray, that's the point of him, right? Star Killer, Force Unleashed. Any character in Joe Abercrombie's books. Geralt of Rivia. End of flashback. So, we, we have multiple issues throughout the show. The number one thing is that the protagonists are just really bad people. Hypocrite! They are not ethically dubious. No. They do a lot of evil things. No. And they do it just to make money. No. Remember how I said their standard they use to judge Hank and Britt would fuck over other anti-hero type characters? 
Seems pretty reasonable now that I've gone into detail about it, doesn't it? You want to know how the EFAB hosts and their fans immediately responded to it? Why, by calling it a whataboutism, of course, ignoring the fact that this doesn't at all fit the definition of what a whataboutism is, as it is a reductio ad absurdum, a valid form of counter-argument not to be confused with the appeal to extremes in slippery slope fallacies. Here's a helpful rule of thumb for people who don't understand the difference between a reductio ad absurdum and a whataboutism. If the person is not disagreeing that there is a flaw, but is trying trying to point to where else that flaw exists that they don't think gets complained about enough, that person is trying to change the subject to deflect from what they are trying to defend. And it is categorically a whataboutism. Remember, you can cost runes without even knowing what runes are, alright? If that person isn't conceding that a flaw exists, and is instead having to draw examples from other media in which what is being framed as a flaw in one thing is actually seen as perfectly valid for other stories to do, that person isn't trying to change the subject to stop you from complaining about a valid issue. They are trying to break down why your standard is untenable with a reasonable or fair approach to stories, which is a reductio ad absurdum. Those in the audience who've been paying close attention will immediately remember the sections of this video where I and others have explored broader concepts in storytelling, from inferences to inciting incidents to supporting characters being knowledgeable on things that are relevant to the plot to characters losing control of their temper and saying things out of temporary anger that they've bottled up. Conflating these two types of arguments is an acute coping mechanism to shield oneself from the reality as to why one's opponent is responding to their argument by appealing to other stories. That person is correct. This standard that's being set is transparently bonkers if one stays consistent with it, and that this argument even needs to be brought up in the first place is indicative that one is not just innocently misinterpreted something, but actually lacking even the most basic understanding of fundamental concepts of storytelling. Do not be fooled. These arguments are not the same. Uh, all right. I don't know. I don't remember enough of this fucking stupid show. So, that was EFAP's take on Terriers. And it sucked! Like, what am I supposed to think when you got mad because... We didn't like your show. It wasn't about just not liking the show. I mean, there's more to it than <laughs> that, but... You say that, but that really is what it comes down to. I get incredibly annoyed when people get mad at me for saying something is bad because often they're hypocrites themselves. When I say something is bad, I'm being opinionated and a dick. Yet when they say something is good, that's fine and somehow not equally opinionated. Good and bad are equivalent words. The worst part is that apparently you aren't allowed to criticize this point because it's just their opinion. The fact of the matter is, once you say something is good, that is no longer just your opinion. That statement is an absolute. If you come up to me and say something stupid like, Call of Duty Ghost is a good game, that does not mean you just like the game, and that is no longer just your opinion. See, there's a big fucking difference between what you like and what is good. You can like whatever you want and really have no reason to back that up besides, I like it. And that's perfectly fine by me. If someone came up to me and said, I like Ride to Hell Retribution, I think they're insane, but I'd also have no issue with that because that's just an opinion. You can't be wrong about what you enjoy. However, if you came up to me and said, Ride to Hell Retribution is a good game, that's a completely different story. Unlike the word like, good is an absolute. And while it's still tethered to your own personal opinion, because not everything is definitively good or bad, you weigh things differently in your mind. When you say something is good, just like if you say something is bad, you need to be able to back that shit up when challenged by someone like me. Because if you say something is good and I disagree, I will fucking ask you why. Most of the time though, people cannot do that and it pisses me off. This happens all the time. When people get pissed off because I say something is bad that they say is good, I always explain to them why I think something's bad. Tangible reasons. I always have a reason behind what I say. Whether it's a game or a movie, I never say something is good or bad without reasons to back me up. As opposed to me just saying I like something. But other people, all they could offer is it's a fun game or that movie is funny. And these are not actual fucking points. Fun is subjective as shit. Actual gameplay mechanics aren't. So, how best to summarize both these criticisms by themselves and how the EFAP hosts and their fans have handled my disagreement with them? Well, they say that a picture says a thousand words. Why don't I use a movie clip? Not contributing enough to society. 
like, we talked about that in the same way that we would talk about basically anything that we're trying to analyze. Did you, though? I mean, if you insist, I'm sure you won't mind if people cite the quality of your arguments here as a reason not to take you seriously on basically anything. It's the job. No hard feelings. To everyone who's taken issue with these guys, but didn't want to dedicate the ridiculous amount of time it takes to dissect any of their takes at the level of depth they demand, you're welcome. There are no words in the tongues of man, elves, orcs, dwarves, or any Xeno species to describe how horrific this experience was. I don't think you should be making videos until you have a sit down and reassess yourself. Like, this was truly horrific. I don't understand how you have a following based off of this. A story is not subjective if the standard and the facts are things that can be objectively judged. Most films are trying to tell a story, and a story is a sequence of events. Those are the things Eva looks at and they present arguments to justify their overall take. What Southpaw and SK do is make big, broad statements with no arguments presented. You can't just say, this thing that's really popular is actually trash in a smug tone and expect people to agree or even take you seriously. There's a reason EFAP episodes are so long. Yeah, well, you know, that's just like uh, your opinion, man. The age of fucking around is over. The time of finding out has come. I don't think they've thought this through at all, and that the arguments on this fucking movie are terrible, but it's like politics, where they're so entrenched into this fucking position, and they have a million pieces of, of data that they have just mangled to match their perspective, that it takes 10 years to untangle these retarded perspectives. I really don't want to hear this excuse that these were just casual stream of consciousness comments on a live stream in response to a super chat, because for one, these aren't minor slip-ups that anyone could make while discussing something casually, and you should expect better out of who you listen to for assessing media than to make these baffling arguments in any context. But also, the vast majority of Discord screenshots that I've been showing across the video were taken from their server, posted within minutes of my Twitter thread, civilly stating, I simply thought they missed with this one. A thread which I wrote after their streams. If they hadn't immediately done that, if they hadn't insisted that they were really thorough with the show on their server and on Reddit as Mueller demonstrated later, if they hadn't doubled down on these arguments, if they hadn't reacted in the manner which they factually did, then maybe you could make this defense. It wouldn't be a particularly strong one, and I think in this particular context, it holds these guys to a significantly lower standard than what they and their audience hold others to. Like, if I had made equally off-the-mark comments about Civil War or Spider-Man 2 while just casually playing a video game, I don't believe I would ever hear the end of it from their audience. But given how EFAP responded to the most mild of disagreement or criticism here, I think this comes off as a rather pathetic moving of goalposts. Our points are airtight and thorough, but also if you take the time it takes to refute all of them, uh, we were just casually talking about it. The cold hard reality is that these guys made a lot of arguments that straddle the line between complete media illiteracy and truly profane ineptitude as critics and full-blown, willfully obtuse dishonesty, if we are to believe that they have any basic understanding of storytelling or the language of film. And then they insisted that this is in fact reflective of how they usually criticize things. Like, we talked about that in the same way that we would talk about basically anything that we're trying to analyze. If you want to accuse me of cherry-picking and argue that they actually had some compelling arguments I just didn't include in here, knock yourself out. I personally would have thought that spending this much time on multiple major points that they made would have clearly freed me from some bizarre obligation to address the rest of their nonsensical arguments. Because I haven't just nitpicked them on a handful of semantic or just plain inconsequential mistakes. I have addressed all of the pillars of their take, and if they actually had strong criticisms against the show, they should not have surrounded them with points as weak as these. It really it really is that simple. There's only so much nonsense you can spew before it becomes reasonable for me to say that you are a clown and your arguments are not worth any serious consideration. This isn't a poo-poo. I gave these guys and their arguments more chances and consideration than they deserved. They completely shat the bed and they shattered my ability to take them at their word on anything. These guys are fools and their fans who've chosen to engage in arguments about this show going off of nothing but their word are even bigger fools. People, especially in Mahler's audience, have dismissed my entire takes on things over fewer and smaller errors, or because they just really don't like that I badmouth something they love, but can't or won't explain why my references are inaccurate. I, on the other hand, will at least entertain your arguments and give them the respect I would expect people to treat mine with when I'm criticizing anything, even if it's something they have an emotional connection to, and will wait until I have a wealth of concrete references for why you're just grossly incorrect before I decide you're not really worth listening to on this thing. We are not the same. Don't be stupid. Me, Wolf, and Rags, and many, many other people have what you could call 
a talent, a gift, whatever, to be able to discern media down to its uh, composing parts. So, like, we could look at a scene. Well, where someone sees a scene, we might see um, a script instead. Be like, oh, look at the components moving. So, consider all the arguments about Terriers we've gone over. If you were a fan of these guys, you might be trying to wrap your brain around how they could have a take that is just this bad. You might even be trying to chalk this up to just an isolated incident, as I initially tried to at the start of this. It's just one miss from them. Who cares? After all, they've built up this reputation as these really reliable media analysts, and that's why their fans were so eager to just assume that whatever they did with Terriers must have in fact been reflective of how they analyze media in general, which the EFAP hosts themselves even insisted, and ironically, I even agree with that to some extent, because, yeah, for objective critics, how much they seem to care about certain things, or whether they will criticize something in bad faith or be overly charitable, is in fact dependent on whether they like something or they don't, which doesn't seem to be affected by whether it satisfies their so-called standard for internally consistent writing. Let me spell this out with a few examples. I'll start with Captain America Civil War. Flashback. It's my, it's my least favorite uh, of that, uh, that uh, era of Marvel films. I'll kill you. No, it's it is amazing. like it is because the whole film is just to set up that stupid fight. I will actually at the hit you. I will take your head off. And, it's, <laughs> and you have to admit that it is so clunky. I will break off your neck while on the floor. The best Game MCU theory? movie of Civil War is the best of the one. MCU. It's unbeatable. <laughs> no. the, um... Oh, Wasn't there gays in the film to talk about? Or were we mad about? Uh, Greg, <laughs> Greg, didn't you just not care about the movie? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, Roy, wait. Civil Did you War think is so good? It's suspicious. End of flashback. Now, I've referred to this movie a handful of times already to highlight a double standard that EFAP seems to have for it, but I've saved the best for last. Let me outline this tiny little part of the plot that just doesn't make any sense to me. Maybe someone in the audience can even help clear this up for me. So, the film's villain, Zemo, needs to get access to Bucky so he can get a mission report that the film later reveals was something he knew could tear the Avengers apart. There's questions to raise about that that I can get to in a later video, but for now, that's neither here nor there. Now, to do this, he is able to park a news van close enough to bomb the UN. Sure, whatever. I have experience. And this gets a shoot on sight order issued on Bucky. Now, setting aside why it is utterly nonsense for this order to be issued in the first place, instead of prioritizing bringing Bucky in alive so they could see if they can catch any potential co-conspirators or thwart any other potential attacks which would be fair for them to be at least a little bit concerned about, and how detrimental that shoot on sight order is to Zemo's plan, and the sheer amount of luck that Zemo now requires in order to see his plan through thanks to this order being issued, let's just talk about how Zemo plans to get this mission report from Bucky once he does miraculously get brought in alive instead of just getting shot dead. Zemo's plan is to get Bucky apprehended, taken to this intelligence agency in Berlin, and then arrive at the agency impersonating a psychologist who is dispatched from Geneva to give Bucky a psych eval. Zemo does this without wearing any type of disguise to make him at all resemble the actual doctor. Zemo's plan relies on nobody at this agency either knowing what this guy that they're expecting looks like, checking his ID, or having his ID on file in the first place. On top of this, he has an EMP delivered to the power plant that's supplying the spy agency with its power in order to knock out the cameras to the facility so that he can read those words to Bucky. But that's relying on not only the facility not having an emergency backup power generator, but also there being absolutely no guards going into the room at any point in the minutes it takes Zemo to read these words and get the mission report from Bucky, or even shooting at Bucky when they do show up. Not a great plan. This wasn't just some impulsive error made in the heat of the moment, nor is Zemo intentionally characterized by his stupidity. This was the work of a supposed strategic genius who didn't realize that if anyone did their job properly, then his entire plan would fall apart. Seriously, what was he cooking here? You do realize that it's a problem for Zemo to commit to a plan that is this stupid, and it's a separate problem that it actually works, right? And when Fringy decided to ask me about what some of my criticisms of Civil War were, just a couple of weeks before he started watching Terriers, I explained this one to him, and this is what he had to say. Right, but then to manage to impersonate him, and none of these people know who this doctor Doctor is supposed to look like. I mean, you definitely got a risk there, but like, this is a risk you gotta take if but you no. wanna execute on this plan. No, this isn't a risk. This is suicide. They don't like, they don't verify his identity no, no. with, so with like my, photo my ID. Is, when we talk about Zemo, what other option does he have to try and figure out what is happening on this mission report other than to try and find a way to get to Bucky? 
Fringy, I don't know if you are only pretending to not see what the problem is here, or you actually are too dense to grasp this. So let me spell this out for you. In order for Zemo to be willing to commit to the specific plan instead of thinking he was marching straight to getting arrested, he'd have to have known that if anyone at any step of the way was doing their job properly, then Mobius M. Mobius would have stepped in through a portal, said it's Mobin time, and hit them with his pruning stick, and then they would have been melted. The motherfucker read the script. This is not defensible, Fringy. I'm sorry. But but is the criticism that he's taken a risk? Because No, like, it's, it's not that he's taking risk. a risk. <sighs> I just love the smell of cope. It's not that he's taking a risk. Um, it's that uh, the people at Interpol, I guess, they are just too stupid to verify the, the doctor's identity. Like they don't they don't have a photo ID of sorts. They don't they don't know what the Theo Broussard guy that they have summoned to interview Bucky looks like. I mean, I can believe then, that it's possible. And the but, counter argument would be, what does what does Zemo have that allows him to get in there that would make them not question him? His face. Or a mask that makes him look like him. If he has, like, the paperwork or something. If he has stuff that you wouldn't expect somebody else to have obtained. And for what, a, and what damage can he do? Like, what, well, and here's, and here's your big question. Like, what, what would they expect would be the damage that this one guy could do? Because he can't unlock the cell. In the world of the MCU, which has many humans running amok in all kinds of advanced technology capable of all kinds of things, it doesn't matter. The Joint Counterterrorist Center wouldn't allow just anyone to access areas like where Bucky is being kept just because they don't think they can cause any damage. Like, well, they know he's... that he can't unlock the cell. And they have a camera on him. Not to mention all the guards that magically take forever to rush into the room, even though Bilbo orders them to right after the power goes out. All right, come on, guys, give me eyes on Barnes. Is, and I don't know that the power's going to go out because that's something that he planned. Is and the then defense, that's is the defense here that if they so if they know that he's not Theo Broussard, um, they're not going to do anything about him because they don't expect him to. To be able to to be capable of like much damage. Well, I mean, like imagine it this way: if we have like some standard prison cell or something, mm -hmm. or, or let's even go further than that. We're talking like some crazy serial killer, mm -hmm. and um, and there's there's a guy who comes in. It's like we brought in a psychologist. He's going to come in and talk to him. It's like, what do you expect that he's going to be able to do here? Um, Especially if you got cameras and stuff. I mean, I think that if you summon a, a psychologist and you know what the psychologist looks like and then he arrives and he doesn't look anything like the guy that you know he's supposed to look like, that's going to Why raise Why would they enough... know what he looks like? Because they know who he's, who they summoned. They summoned a guy named Theo I Broussard. I know who he is, they... but I know the name of the, like, the account I'm about to talk to, like, next week. I, I don't know what they look like, though. For some reason, I don't believe that this anecdote is remotely equivalent to this UN-affiliated intelligence agency not knowing what a UN-approved specialist looks like when they have summoned him. Again, I guess the question will be, what, Zemo has enough stuff with him to convince them that he is who he says he is without a picture. So what would be the thing that would tip them off in terms of, like, let's double check what you look like you have the paperwork and you can't do anything here it is standard for a law enforcement or intelligence agency to have a picture of someone's id pull up next to their name when they are brought up as a person of interest it's kind of important for the people who work in this field to be able to put a face to a name which is why you will consistently see this in any media featuring this field of work not only that, but Theo Broussard would be an approved academic advisor that the UN had on retainer. He would have to be thoroughly vetted in order to have a high enough security clearance to be allowed access to sensitive patients like Bucky. While it's reasonable to suggest that the rank-and-file guards would not recognize Theo Broussard offhand, it's highly improbable to suggest that neither Bilbo, nor Sharon, nor any other higher-ranking agent in the building would either. Even if the only glimpse they had of him was through this camera angle. Which, to be honest, why would that camera be placed at that angle? If there's a camera in there meant to monitor the interview, Viewer, then there should be a camera on the wall behind Bucky aimed at Zemo's face. This is also without mentioning that the computer system employed during ID checks would certainly have the real doctor's ID on file. While there are ways that a clever writer could work around this, maybe starting with just allowing Zemo to have one of these, or letting him be in contact with some moles who let him through, it is not reasonable to headcanon in anything that patches this, as the film did absolutely none of the groundwork for how he could have done it. A thing that EFAP surely wouldn't allow someone to do for something they don't like. And unfortunately, a solid chunk of the previous 25 minutes of the movie 
movie have been centered on this plan. And this plan being completely successful is what enables the rest of the movie to happen. What's especially funny is that EFEP has, correctly, called out this exact type of issue in other media. <laughs> yeah, like you can just show up here at the base. Yep. At the uh, well, I guess her, cl well, her clearance is still intact. Maybe someone checked and they're like, yeah, you're good. You can still come. I'm so glad you survived. We found the squad that you we were found with. They were all dead. dead. They were yeah. all shot in the back. There's literally yeah, that's nothing for you to back. actually have to clear past. Are you serious? This looks like something. <laughs> hey, ask for identification. There you go, you fuck. Finally. Now, please. You're done. Yeah, it's over. Their IT. Your squad was killed and you're missing. Yep. So, okay, beeping. Yeah, nice red. That's not good, I imagine. We've confirmed you have a face, you can pass. <laughs> <laughs> Is there a problem? You, you look very nervous. Oh, yeah. well, <laughs> I guess not. No, this guy has an evil face, too. Motherfucker. This isn't your sector. I can't let you through. And you are? I am the lead security on this level. Then I'm your commanding officer, and you will address me as That doesn't sir. mean anything. Yes, sir, you can't course, come through. Perhaps I should just inform the Grand Inquisitor of your insolence. What? No, you have protocols. That's not, that's not insolence. What's the that's point just... of having a rule? If that's a thing, so then why did he so even bother problem. stopping her at all? This is so stupid. It's more a high- I Just anyone like... wear a high-ranking uniform would be like, I'm in charge of you, let me in. Yeah, yeah exactly. why bother with any of it? What was that? This that was nothing. Why even stand? have the scene? If EFAP were consistent on this, this would be a major problem with Civil War's plot in their eyes. What do you think of Southport and SK's take on Civil War's plot being broken? They're I think wrong. wrong. Yeah. Yeah, I think they're wrong. Stop the cap already, I beg you. Captain America Civil War is the best film in the MCU. No, 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 no. Ah! I mean, I can believe then, that it's possible. So Fringy has no issues with believing that Zemo would take this kind of risk. A pretty generous way of putting it, because that implies that there's even a slim probability that it would work. Nor does he have any problem with believing that it would work against all odds. But, you know, nobody checked a car at the border. How absurd. It's clear you can't be objective. Zemo has enough stuff with him to convince them that he is who he says he is without a picture. You know... I've heard of far less desperate defenses for Jango Fett's assassination attempt on Padme. My personal perspective is, I think this scene is broken. I don't think this assassination makes a lick of sense. Uh, I think Zam is an idiot. I think the robot is stupid. Um, well, we, we I didn't think... even talk about the worms, really. Well, again, the, the worms, uh, there's not much to say about them, except that they are an unbelievably stupid method of assassinating someone, given what you're trying to do. <laughs> um, well, 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 so... Since I, I took the time to, to take this down, I wanted to at least bring it up. I have <laughs> heard like, the We must talk about the, the worms, Jolly. Uh, yes, yes, I just want to say, I've heard the defense that they're sentient, or at least semi-sentient worms. Oh, and that, fuck off. And that <laughs> no, I don't accept this. To kill Padme specifically. And so, what I did was I <laughs> find it. <laughs> um, and, and from the moment that one of the worms reaches the bed to the point where it gets killed by Anakin, there are 48 seconds that pass, which means that you no, have- No, I'm, I'm sorry. There's, there's as a whole- a uh, there's, a, there's a way funnier scene that I think you've, 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 you've not considered where if these things are sentient, then this must have happened, which is that Zam at some point sat down at a desk with these two centipedes and walked them through the plan, and they <laughs> nodded along. <laughs> <laughs> Just like, alright, man, boys, listen I, up. I ironically heard that. I think it was Anomaly Inc. actually who made that defense. Oh, of course it was. Oh my god. <laughs> was Just like, alright, uh, Fred, Fred, Patrick, like Fred, Patrick, buckle up, lads. I have a plan for you. Oh, you're gonna, no. you're gonna, you're, you're gonna lose your wormy mind to how great this plan is. They're like, after she lays it out for them, they're like, well, we'd clap, but we don't have arms, and also what? that's a stupid plan. Also, just again, I don't know how intelligent Anomaly Inc. thinks these worms are, but if I was the worms, I'd have had some real- This is like suicide mission stuff, right? This is like where I have pushback. Because she's like, the plan is to drop you in a room with the senator, and then you kill her. And I'm like, cool. Uh, what's my exfiltration like plan? Team, yeah, yeah how, am I, how am I getting out of this? And they're like, oh, you don't. The Jedi are gonna walk in and kill you. Well, I guess, I guess, um, <laughs> the sentient worms would be like, I guess we're gonna crawl back into the robot when we're done with our job. We're just gonna buy her. <laughs> And we're gonna leave out the and and just hope that all. Okay, you know what? I don't know why we're talking about the sentient world. This is such <laughs> bullshit. This is unbelievable. I love that explanation so much. I I'm gonna keep the I'm keeping those worms in my back pocket for other ridiculous explanations. Anytime in someone in a film, someone's like, "Well, this could have happened." I'm like, "Yeah, the worms from Attack of the Clones could have been in on the plan. They could have been clued in. <laughs> they were in on it, Jolly." 
flashback. You guys yep. have to be consistent. You have to be consistent. That's what we've been about this whole time since day one. And I know a lot of you guys got into this because we were dunking on TLJ, but you've got to be consistent. I mean, if you didn't know what you were signing up for, I don't know what to tell you. Things to, we don't we don't special plead here on EFAP. Doesn't matter what genre it is. Doesn't matter what tone it is. Doesn't matter if it was for kids. Doesn't matter if it's about space. Doesn't matter if it was animated. These are not things that we've ever said are valid arguments. And they are always, eventually, going to come for things you love. Things we love, too. I believe, yeah. Fringy, you, 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 you're a big fan of Winter Soldier for a while, right? I used to like it a lot. Now I don't. Um, yeah, it, it just happens. And it's okay, because it's like, you don't... Your identity is not <laughs> attached to these to these movies, the movies it's, it's you TV like, shows. Yeah. It's okay. Like if there was something that you really enjoyed as a kid, and then you find out it was really crappy, that doesn't that doesn't harm you to learn that. It, it shouldn't anyway. It should, yeah. It's fine because your identity is not these stories, which I guess can be hard to, especially when a lot of these stories are so like important to people. But it's not your identity. It's okay. There's, there is good stuff out there. There'll always be something that you can enjoy, like Blind Man, for instance. End of flashback. Civil War is not the only EFAP approved movie that has tangible contrivances like this that they would have and do often rip apart in other media that they just don't like. Obviously, there's Spider Man No Way Home, which I've shown just a handful of the ways they made some truly hilarious defenses they would not have made if they were judging it consistently. Seriously, I actually strongly recommend you check that full stream out if you're starving for some top shelf cope. So what do you guys think of the criticism that they shouldn't have chosen the statue because it's made of copper and Electro would like fuck him up because of it? Well, he didn't. Oh, I didn't know I that. Guess. I guess that's a fair point. Yeah. Um... I guess, well, Electro's a problem regardless. But also, let's take Spider-Man Homecoming, for example. I'm going to plagiarize my friend SK for what I think is the strongest point that he made in his video on the movie. Flashback. One of the things I was impressed then, with... There's, there's... But then it never deals with this whole idea that, like, there's this weapon smuggling operation going on. Like, we're using alien tech to... to Spider-Man literally stops it. Or yeah, he does, but against Tony Stark's, like, urging, against Tony's, you know, advice. Yeah, but Tony's Whereas recommending Tony that they deal... No, Tony recommended that the police take care of it. But then that's never touched upon. Like, he never just notifies the police and then deals with yes, it. Yes, he does. He calls like... the FBI and they turn up on the ship, and that's part of why Spider-Man fucked up. Does he? Yes! yes. This is he part of why him. people hate this movie for no fucking reason! <laughs> <laughs> hang on, hang on. Tony literally I, says I, I, to I, Peter, I, I, I did listen, I did care, he called the FBI. End of flashback. There's a sequence in this movie in which there is a weapons deal happening on the Staten Island Ferry between Vulture's men and a few other criminals. Now, it's worth mentioning that the reason that the Staten Island Ferry has not allowed cars on board since 9-11 has been due to risks of bombs being brought on board in cars. And if they were ever to allow cars back on the ferries, they would be getting screened for such items, which would guarantee that they would come across the equipment that Vulture's men bring for the deal on the ferry, including Vulture's wingsuit. This would pretty much prevent this entire sequence from happening. I wonder if they think this is a valid issue, or it's just a risk that Vulture's men have to take, like Zemo did. Or they think it's fine that there would be no one ensuring that no one was bringing a car bomb on board this ferry. Now, I repeat, this exact point that I've outlined is in SK's video, which EFAP themselves have seen, and when asked to cover his video, this is what they had to say. Probably not covering what if no, and the second one is, are you going to cover SK's homecoming video? Um... Hmm. Well, I mean, I... It's, well, I've seen it. I don't. And, uh, I don't. Yeah, I've seen it too. I, I uh, don't think it's very good. It's have, shit. But, I've also seen it. Not very good. Yeah, it was really bad. Um, uh, yeah, it's pretty bad. Really good yeah, EFAP. honestly. Yeah. What was that? Sorry. But uh, I think it would have made a good EFAP. Yeah, probably. Um, it would be a good way to explore, uh, sort of the, the specific like how Homecoming does, do a fantastic job of coming together. Um. It has. It made us appreciate that movie all the better. It really did remind us about how good Homecoming really is in terms of its construction and characters and stuff. There's so much that Homecoming just nails. Yeah, I, I yeah, the video reminded me of how much I liked that film. <laughs> Paradoxically, yeah. considering that the point was that it's terrible, but yeah, the well, arguments weren't very. What I find interesting is how much is omitted bad. in the video in terms of just 
the film scenes. Well, we're not, yeah, Swap we're not interested of, in talking yeah, about yeah. a lot of stuff in that film. We're just skipping past a bunch of context stuff that could be really important that we just, we don't care well, to talk about. We don't really care to talk about what's good about it. Yeah, my it's point just, was more so, so much isn't talked about because I imagine it's stuff that's pretty good. And I want to say, uh, he brought up a lot of valid f flaws that are in the film, but the thing is, like, these are, uh, th there's, there's like five or something in total. Which? And it's just like, the film does really fucking well. Um, so yeah. it's, it's still easily yeah, top tier MCU. Like, it's, if I was to oh, honestly rank it, it's probably top five, possibly higher than that. But I mean, I, I mean, if that video was meant to convince me otherwise, it didn't do very well. <laughs> Yeah. Now, I find that super interesting, that they thought it was shit, but also they didn't want to cover it on their podcast. That's really interesting, because SK, when I first met him, had made an 80 minute long video on why Into the Spider-Verse was not a good movie. And I spent about a month gathering references, going through both the movie and his video with a fine-toothed comb in private, and having thorough counter-arguments with evidence written down in a Google Doc that we were then able to recite on a 12 hour long live stream on my other channel. Which, incidentally, that audio you heard from Buzzax a little earlier was originally from after we finish going through that video. So Prowler spots Miles after he attracts their attention, and Miles was conveniently not spotted by the Prowler when he not only has the same clothing, hairstyle, and voice as Miles, considering he screams on a few occasions. But okay, so let's talk about this. Same clothing and hairstyle as Miles. Buzz, does Miles have a very unique sense of fashion or uh, or hairstyle? No, he's dressed like every other New York nigga his age. <laughs> No reason to believe Spider-Man killed Aaron Davis if he was seen to be clearly upset over his death, as well as the fact Prowler has a bullet wound and Spider-Man does not use bullets. I'd like to 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 I know what you're about to post. I know what you're about to post. I'd like to I'd like to post something in chat that fucks this point. You don't even have to do this. In his He's wishing for a gun, not for a bullet Yeah, in his intro, he fires a gun at the camera. No, no, no. In, yeah, in his flashback, he shows that he uses a gun. Hey. Also, also, no, 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 I'm not finished. Also, <laughs> Blonde Peter didn't use guns. <laughs> Jefferson explicitly says, I have an ABB out on a new Spider-Man. It was a really bad video, but we actually had an argument. You know, those things that are actually well-founded and not just appealing to personal feels. We absolutely could have poo-pooed SK, but we didn't. We actually gave his video its day in court. We thoroughly broke down why it was not a good video. It got us to highlight what about that movie is actually really good, and it helped us elevate people's perception of it after some were initially willing to concede to the arguments presented by the video. I find it so strange that if SK's video on Homecoming is just so bad, why not expose why it is bad? Why not actually make an argument. Because, as someone who used to think that Homecoming was really great, SK provided arguments, arguments that I didn't really have a counter to, and seeing that the EFAP guys just didn't want to make one was not exactly encouraging. These guys have built a brand on covering actually bad takes on media. I literally ended up on that podcast as a direct result of them covering one of those bad takes. The best case scenario here is that if SK's video is actually bad, and these guys actually have an argument for why that is, then they're just too intellectually lazy to say anything more than just, oh, it's bad, it's shit, and then expect their audience to just go along with it and take them at their word. I'm sorry, but I need better than that. I expect better than that. And you know what else I expect better from EFAP? The defenses that they will actually make when they aren't just talking about just how good the movie is without really making any arguments. I mean, in Homecoming, he doesn't realize that the stealth ship is taken by Vulture and a lot of stuff. He's not particularly competent throughout those as well, but... The reason why I didn't know that the vault, the vulture had taken the ship was because they made the high vacuum seal and then once they got inside they were able to deactivate the system. No. This defense leaves several factors unaddressed. Vulture had a high vacuum seal to avoid setting off the alarms? Okay. Now address the fact that nobody is monitoring the ship with cameras throughout this flight. Address how there are no armed guards or even unmanned Iron Man suits prepared in the event of a theft, despite everything the Vulture has done, as well as evidence of his organization, possessing alien tech weapons that were created with materials from battles with the Avengers. Address how this is a world with super-powered beings or people with highly advanced technology with their own goals or agendas, 
which can involve stealing dangerous technology from the Avengers, the high vacuum seal does not change the incompetence of the way that this plane is secured since any villain can just fly there, break through it, and steal technology without any repercussions. Even if they set off the alarms initially, there are no defensive measures in place to actually detain the thief. Oh, that's stupid. What would they have done if Spider-Man didn't show up to stop him? This deals great damage to Tony Stark's competence, considering he would be in the know of this transfer and personally make sure that his technology, especially his arc reactors, are very well secured considering how much he cares about the risk of his technology falling into the wrong hands. I saw young Americans killed by the very weapons I created to defend them and protect them, and I saw that I had become part of a system that is comfortable with zero accountability. Breathe. Easy. You have one last golden egg to give. You didn't learn your lesson last time. That's cool. We can give you a refresher course. To not ensure that his arc reactors are being transported safely and securely, is grossly out of character for Tony Stark, and it's beyond me that you think, haha, <laughs> Vulture had a high vacuum seal, covers this plot point. I guess as long as it doesn't go through the port of entry at the border, what's the matter, bro? Nobody used the high vacuum seal at the border. Moving on from Civil War and Homecoming being these obvious blind spots for these guys, Terriers isn't the only example of an actually well-written piece of media these guys have unfairly denigrated. Let's have a look at a set of their criticisms of the Batman, around a plot point in which the movie makes it explicitly clear that Batman speaks Spanish. I'm afraid his Spanish is not perfect. And this translates to you are El Rata Elada. Rata Elada. Rat with wings. And that a riddle left behind by Riddler was translated accurately, it's just that they had chalked up Riddler's use of L instead of La to a mistake. It's only after seeing what Riddler pulls off with Coulson at the mayor's funeral that they then think... You think you made a mistake? That's a made mistake. You... are L. Now, this is a fairly simple and easy to follow plot point if you are paying attention and giving the writer a fair chance to make their case. If you are watching casually or in broken up chunks, I can see how you might miss this sort of thing, but I tend to hold a person who's actually, like, a critic who makes money off of criticizing things to a bit of a higher standard. I expect them to actually pay some attention to what they watch before they then cast judgments on it. Now, let's see how EFAP covered this point from the movie. You're the rat. No, I'm not actually. Uh, I'm not. And then, they, they, then they're then they like, oh, they're, they're El Rata thing. And then he says, no, you obviously, like, basically, you guys obviously don't speak Spanish. It's La Rata or uh, whatever the whole saying okay. is. And, Thank goodness um, he's fluent, eh? Yeah. Um, yeah, but I mean, in the United States, I guess I can expect that someone might be familiar with Spanish. Like, I'm not sure that it's something that you need to be fluent to know either. Like, no, it seems um, pretty A word ending in A. It's I just generally... don't believe that's common knowledge. Yeah, that's more, not... more than um, less common knowledge. Sure. I think I think it's weird that Batman doesn't know this and Penguin Agreed. does. I think Batman I should know this. Mm -hmm. Um, what like that it wasn't a mistake that he should have made? I'm yeah. I, I think if you're gonna write well, it to for any one of these three characters to know this, be like probably Batman. Would it be probably Batman? Why would we say that? Because I don't see I any like why Penguin probably. would know it. He's he's got very much different interests in life. Batman's like world's greatest detective. I figure he's probably aware of a lot of things through different languages. Um, I would expect well, Penguin to know some Italian. Yeah. Uh, yeah, maybe. Um, but but it is worth noting as well that um, it was uh, it, I, it was like Alfred who did it, and I guess it would be does Bruce have any reason to like doubt what Alfred concluded based on what he was able Ooh. to put together? That's actually something I was trying to ask earlier. So does that mean had Alfred used, I don't know, better translation tech, this just wouldn't have happened? Um, uh, probably. Sure. I mean. Because because he says like oh my Spanish is not that great so, but I think this is what it says like oh maybe we should double check because like, they have yeah we're we're in we have internet right yeah, yeah instead <laughs> of going this is what this means right well uh, double check well, and, yeah. and we have apps on our phones that can translate um text, well, and we just talked like, about augmented reality how it could yeah. very commonly yeah. be understood by a lot of people in America and it's like yeah do you have a friend maybe <laughs> just someone who is I don't know like there's a lot of things you could have done you instead know, of a going senor or senora yeah, I guess why, it's, in why, code, it's in a code. Like, no one can decrypt it. It's Spanish. Well, well, so, I guess the, <laughs> it is an alien tongue. That's spoken by man, the race of men. He could have talked to Riddler straight away then, if Alfred had gotten it. 
Right. If he had figured it out correctly, yeah, he would have been able to talk to him straight away. So they acted as though Batman doesn't understand Spanish, even though the film demonstrated he does. That's why he's the one who tells the audience what Rada Alada means in English, that Alfred didn't translate it correctly, when we know he objectively did translate it as Riddler intended, that Alfred said his own Spanish was broken, when he said Riddler's was. Afraid his Spanish is not perfect. And they also seem peeved that an iteration of Batman who was clearly depicted as a rookie in his second year is not living up to some reputation as the world's greatest detective, which they apparently expect him to be able to do because that's how the character is in the comics. Now, that's directly at odds with what they usually say about allowing adaptations to be their own thing rather than being measured up to what they're adapting. But that's besides the main point I'm bringing up, which is that these objective critics all missed these very simple pieces of information and then did a disservice to the Batman by complaining about this on their Circle Jerk livestream, which is extremely funny considering what they will excuse about actual nonsense that is pointed out to them either by their chat or by one of their friends when it shows up in something they like. The unfortunate reality of this is that even if their arguments were correct, this would absolutely pale in comparison to what I've pointed out in both Civil War and Homecoming movies that they think are great. So I guess those sorts of things are inconsequential. But oh god, if only Alfred used better translation tech, then Batman would have been able to talk to Riddler sooner. It's just all around embarrassingly inept analysis. That's not to say that they don't get anything right about the Batman or anything else they talk about. Obviously not. But like, if they're capable of making arguments that are this bad, I'm not particularly optimistic that they make enough valid points that bring down my own score of the film. Not to mention, I'll probably get less grief from other critics and their rabid fanboys when I tepidly disagree with their weaker points. There seems to be no sign of intelligent life anywhere. You used to make videos debunking cinema sins. You have become the very thing you swore to destroy. It's fairly common for people who don't like EFAP to compare them to cinema sins, which is a comparison that they resent so much that they'll put it on their 6x8 bad faith being card with over a dozen redundancies and numerous things that aren't even bad faith in the first place. Because they insist that this is just dismissing when they make valid points for why a story's cause and effect hinge on the plot either contradicting its own rules or characters making actually brain dead decisions. Like this. Oh my god. To use super speed effectively. What is wrong with you? What just happened? What the fuck? What just happened? What the fuck just happened? God's name did I just witness? But... Having actually engaged with their arguments here, I am left wondering what makes them meaningfully any different, let alone better than CinemaSins, if they are this bad at analyzing media or judging it fairly. I mean, you guys do realize that many CinemaSins fans that acknowledge they will often get points wrong say they still watch them because they do believe they get things right a substantial portion of the time, right? Their fans will try to distinguish themselves from CinemaSins in a couple of different ways, one of which being that they limit their scrutiny to focus on things which actually have an outcome on the effect of a story. Do they, though? Did he just use a... Yeah. The detective's ID? He did. Fuck, that is risky, dude. That might be a felony. Okay. What? This happened in... You can reclaim your vehicle. What are the fucking odds? <laughs> Have a great day. Oh, of getting towed and OB, dude? Right. Like, I, I think that's relatively likely. That's bad that's like, Within, though, within like, 10 minutes there, of parking? Yeah. That's... It's Linda's talking about his Montague development. It's a crock of shit. He gets the state. He so did that after. To build a resort okay. It's not even happening. What is? Yeah, you got a phone call after doing the act. Linda's killed. Man, that's unlucky for him, huh? Fine. I mean, that's that's yeah. the inciting Linda's incident, basically. Then do something about it, Mark. Do something. What exactly do could he do, it. though? If he doesn't have probable cause. I mean, Hank's upset. But, so, Hank was a cop before, yeah. right? Yeah. So he knows this, that, like, that's not how it works. Well, yes, but he's upset. He just saw his friend dead. So, he forgets about how, like, it works? I mean, they, they like, why to... is he not being investigated for tax evasion? Either he, either he's evading taxes, or he lied under oath. Perjury. Oh! Oh, Was that a gun? Uh, 
Ay, ay, ay. The other distinction they try to draw between themselves and Cinema Sins is that they are much more accurate than Cinema Sins. Are they, though? I think we all know the answer to that question at this point. Be ashamed of who you are. Take it from someone who loves to get pedantic about plot holes, folks. It is not at all unfair to compare Mahler to CinemaSins. He is just as bad at what he sets out to do as CinemaSins is. The only meaningful differences that I can currently glean are that he's admittedly far more charismatic, but also far more pretentious and delusional about both the depth and precision of his observations, and his content is far more time-consuming. But sure. Put that on your bad faith bingo card. Instead of any of the dozens of legitimate styles of bad faith argumentation that these guys actually do use against others. I had a big section written in my strip talking about uh, EFAP's playbook and the way in which they use bad faith. Like looking through the bad bingo card, it's like almost half of these things are not bad faith. Just because something can be said in bad faith doesn't mean that it is bad faith. Okay, so an ad hominem argument is bad faith. But like someone saying the story is good because it's themes is not a bad faith claim, but it's counted as bad faith in Meme Repository's bad faith bingo card. The, the movie like, is good because there's no plot holes. Is that bad faith? Things that can be said, like, as an honest, like, someone who honestly doesn't actually give a shit about plot holes, that's bad faith, apparently. It's like, this is what you people fucking do, is you label people as bad faith without bad knowing faith. what bad faith fucking means. In this card, I'm like, where is, where's appeal to ridicule? Where is Gish Gallop? Where's Poo Poo? Just heard South Park to say Poo Poo, it's poo -poo. very important. <laughs> yeah, <Where's poo> -poo? <laughs> I'm, I'm so glad we managed to get that bit through. It was crucial. Yeah. Without that word, we would have understood hard. nothing. That's Where right. is the poo -poo? audio test with South Park scene? No audio, no audio. No. what the fuck? Well, now Man, I'm they didn't get to unhappy. hear me say Poo Poo. Let's hear them no. s hear me say Poo Poo. In this, in this car, I'm like, where is, Where's appeal to ridicule? Where's poo poo? All right, do you, do you guys hear that? Is everything good? I, I'm talking to the audience here. Do you hear me ask where poo poo is? Where is poo poo? Where, where is, is poo poo? I'm a grown fucking adult. Hey, they heard poo poo. This shit. They heard it. Yes. Yes, they heard it. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. yes. All right. Hell yeah. Fucking All right. So, Seth, I can tell you exactly where poo poo is. We're currently having to wade through his nonsense. <laughs> Well, no, this is the thing, is is Poo Poo is the name of like when you're just uh, basically go like, ah, oh, that's just too ridiculous for me to even take it seriously. <laughs> no, Poo Poo is Winnie the Pooh when he's got dementia and can't remember his name. <laughs> <laughs> Winnie, the Winnie the Poo Poo blood, honey. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> I'm getting hungry, I'm getting hungry for on, a Poo Poo platter. And then they eat the Poo Poo. Now, there's this perception of Mahler that's been built up in his audience that he is a stickler for consistency, to the point that he is willing to take a break from talking about Star Wars to then talk about other YouTubers being hypocritical. Even if his examples of that hypocrisy aren't nearly as strong as he thinks they are when you're actually paying attention to what is being said, independently of how he frames it. Whenever someone says they're a fan of Cosmonaut Variety Hour, just ask them which Cosmonaut Variety Hour they're a fan of. You might think it's a little strange that I'm judging a comic book movie based on the comic that that it takes its material from, because I usually don't do that. I usually like to judge these as completely separate stories. But when the comic is done so much better than the movie, it's hard to ignore. Don't hurt the face, I'm an actor. No, oh, my stupid, corny, cartoon villain wasn't represented the same way he was in the comics. Yeah, well, get over it, alright? I read a lot of comics, and if I got mad every time something was different, I would have died of a heart attack back when I saw Fantastic Four. But when the comic is done so much better than the movie, it's hard to ignore. Yeah, well, get over it, alright? He has serious trouble sticking to any position. There are some people who are claiming that it is impossible to blow up a fleet by slamming into it with the hyperdrive. To those people, I have this to say. You're a creep! Go away! We're having a good time until you showed up, jeepers! <sighs> no, but all joking aside, shut the f up, you goddamn idiots. It's a movie about space wizards. There are no f***ing rules. Stop making shit up to be mad about. Analyze a film like a regular person and don't pick apart shit with made up fantasy facts. The new Inquisitors use their weird gimmicky lightsaber to fly like a helicopter. I'm sorry, but this is ridiculous. Anyone who takes this show seriously needs to just look at this. Imagine if during the fateful battle between Luke and Vader, one of them twirls their sword around and flies away. That's not how the force works. There are no f***ing rules. Stop making sh 
up to be mad about. That's not how the force works. I really think people have been giving Rey a very bad rep for some pretty bad reasons. Most people just say they don't like her because she's too strong, but I don't know, it doesn't bother me. I personally don't really mind seeing a character who is good at things in Star Wars. All the other main characters in Star Wars are really good at stuff. Oh, how come Obi-Wan can defeat a Sith Lord all by himself when his master couldn't even do that? How come Luke is really good at using the Force without getting any training? Sabine is a walking Hot Topic ad. She feels like the forced strong female character. She couldn't be more Mary Sue unless she was also Force sensitive, which at this point wouldn't even really surprise me. People just say they don't like her because she's too strong, but I don't know, it doesn't bother me. She couldn't be more Mary Sue unless she was also Force sensitive. Uh, what do you three have to say to those who accuse you of being inconsistent with your standards? Oh God, we're only That's human, okay? I always hate women. <laughs> <laughs> I just find it funny I that, like... I don't understand that as a question. How do you respond to being wrong. wrong occasionally? I mean, yeah, that's pretty normal. I don't mind being wrong occasionally, or biased. I, the whole aspect of what we do is to try and say to work on avoiding that. Yeah, as best you can. It's not, yeah. it's not like it's... You, you can never be perfect on that. It's so, like, it, we talk about it all the time, and yet, like, it's it's not really understood, I don't think, sometimes. It's like, if we if we have to watch three films, one's a sci-fi horror, one's an action-adventure, and one's a romantic comedy, I immediately have the feeling, I want to watch the sci-fi horror first, and then the action-adventure, and then I guess I'll watch the romantic comedy. It's like, that's already unfair to the romantic this comedy. It already is unfair, because you should be... Well, ideally 100% complete and utter, like, impartiality to all of them, but I mean, human's gonna human, you know? Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I understand myself on that front, and I make mistakes, that's totally fine. I don't mind at all. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, so yeah, I guess on the, on the point of how do you feel that someone has pointed out you're not fully consistent, I'd be like, yep, makes sense. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know what it means... I don't, know, I don't know what it means to be 100% consistent. I don't, I don't even know how someone achieves that. But you know what? We try to but stick to standards. We try. Yeah. Now, sure, perhaps Cosmonaut is a major hypocrite if you pour through his entire catalog of videos, but the examples that Mahler used aren't really the best at supporting that conclusion, even if I might not agree with him on some of the things he says there. That being said, even if Mahler isn't the sharpest at comprehending someone's points and then gets angry at them for whatever straw man argument that he constructs, it's clear that he at least cares about people being consistent within their own standards. I'm sure he's receptive when his own audience or friends holds him accountable in a similar manner. When I read that he called his server to action of finding any and all clips of EFAP to bring us down for hypocrisy over what we said on Terriers, I figured it had gone way too far. I confronted him about it and he apologized. We hashed out the situation in as civil and private a way as I could muster, and that was it for me. I was out. Oh. Well, guess not. Daronic. He could spot hypocrisy in others but not himself. Setting aside the blatant hypocrisy there, how in the fuck are you this averse to one of your friends criticizing you for being inconsistent with your own standards in the same manner you try to do for other creators, when one of your first major criticisms of this show had to do with Mark not enforcing the law against his friend and former partner to the same degree that he would for a total stranger? Besides, I mean, That's... man, if you're my friend and you do that, I ain't, I ain't fucking saving your bacon. You literally poo-pooed that idea as if it was patently ridiculous like the two worms in Attack of the Clones being sent or any of Fringy's defenses for a serious issue in Civil War. I'm suggesting Mark would never let a murder suspect escape thanks to a hunch Hank has. I think higher of the character. But there we are. Well, that's nice, Mahler. But I'm afraid that Mark is no more biased towards his friends than you are towards your friends. Some of them, anyways. I will fuck you like a pig! So hey, Mahler. Apparently Jack, uh, Saint, and Shad are having a go at each other since Jack just uploaded a response to Shad. Are they fighting over swords? They <laughs> fight over... I was about to say Simpsons for some fucking reason. Uh, Mario. Um, and I watched... I uh, actually checked it out, and Jack did exactly the same thing to Shad he did to me. Which is... Say, for example, like Az says... <laughs> this is a good example. Resident Evil 4. Oh, it's just such a great remake. Great gameplay. Great atmosphere. Great graphics. Great performance from everybody. Ada Wong, not so much. And this one goes, Ads, what the fuck? Why do you hate it so much? <laughs> yeah. And they, they chop out that one bit and they say, you see, Ads is just shitting all over the game. What a piece of shit. He hates everything. 
So Shadowversity doesn't like the Super Mario Brothers film, and when asked what his issues are, his literal first complaints pertain to the woke ideology he says is reflected in the film. These are, incidentally, the same complaints he expressed in his initial reactions to early material shown of the film. Yeah, female character, competent, he's such an idiot, I, why do I have to put up with it? Holy crap, this is freaking going woke. It is. He's mixed in his trailer review with his movie review. Apparently I, I tricked people into thinking was all one video uh, because of this zoom that I did in, in one of the shots. Which is weird because in a different part of the same segment, uh, you can clearly see I showed the full zoomed out shot anyway. Now obviously I know that in the Knight's Realm there may not be the, quite the same level of cinematic education. In cinema, there's this thing called the establishing shot, okay? Which is where when you first show something, you try and get the whole scene, and then when you have other shots, you might put a focus on a particular thing at a particular moment. Well, that would show I'm not an honest actor in this. I'm approaching it in bad faith. Which you actually see uh, many times in my video, and usually in my videos, it's a kind of it's a kind of common thing that everyone does. Uh, which I guess Shad didn't think was worth mentioning, uh, even though he made a whole point about it, as a criticism. Why would you do that if you weren't a scumbag? If you weren't a dirty knave? When Sir Shad saw Mario be a bumbling slapstick character and then get upset about it, that was only because that was his instant immediate reaction. This is just a normal way to respond to seeing the Super Mario Brothers movie trailer. I think this is the thing that frustrates me with this. Okay. This is the part where she tries to say, They? What, what are you talking about, Peach? You, you know, wearing pants. She, she's wearing pants in the film because she was on the motorbike. D is she aware that this is us reacting to the trailer and we don't have that context? <laughs> Because when we had that context, did we criticize her wearing No, we didn't. Makes perfect sense she's wearing pants. Not a problem at all. Didn't even come up. Wasn't on the radar in our review as a criticism because we knew by context it didn't matter. But in the trailer, we didn't know that. It actually looked like they might have been removing the dress entirely, or at least most often, so to have her more often wearing um, uh, you know, the biker yeah. outfit. It looks like. Looks so, like. Does it? Even though, like. Does it share? She's in the dress like several times. Oh my god, okay. Bowser is coming. No problem. Shut up, get it up. There's a huge universe out there. Whoa. No pressure. Scummy, lying, dishonest. We've not seen the, the movie wasn't even out! You genius! You very smart person! <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Oh my goodness, these people, right? I just, I just love that she thinks she's making such a great, intelligent take here when it's making her look like such a silly person because the movie, the, the, the video you're acting to, we had not, the, the movie wasn't even out and she's appealing to the movie like, in the movie, you would see why she's wearing pants. The movie wasn't out, do you see how dumb you look? Shad, I think it's precious that you think it's like laughable to sort of poke fun at you because you saw Peach in pants and without context got upset about it. Shad, the unfortunate reality is, in this case, um, people think it's funny that that was your reaction and that you needed justification later on for Princess Peach's pants. That's the thing that's ridiculous. This is pissing me off. You were so distracted about being angry about seeing her in pants and oh, girl boss, right? That you didn't even pay attention to the fact that in the trailer they show her riding the motorbike. And I understand it's a blind reaction, but that again, Hammer Holmes, Hammer's home the point why was that your immediate reaction that is what is being pointed out because it is clearly showing that you have a weird bias it's almost like you're <laughs> letting your woke ideology infect everything that you watch which is the the tiny little point that i was wanting to make that you are completely restating in this video and these combined statements to make them sound like they uh they just despise the movie through and through because peach is 
not always wearing a dress and stuff like that. The 5 out of 10 was just, it has poor writing, the payoffs weren't as great, I don't think Maria had nearly you know, as fun uplifting heroic moments and the story was very bland. What was the poor writing and why were the payoffs not great? Wait, wait. Okay. Was it because Peach is a goal boss and Mario is too goofy? <laughs> Because that's what you say in the review. Okay. They could have made it more competent, but still have the damsel in distress element that can really empower the heroic character to step up and save the day. Hmm. But they didn't have that. He's a punching bag, and then he gets given a superpower, and because he has that superpower, then he wins. Why are you making me fact check your Super Mario Brothers movie review? Why are you lying about your own opinions about Mario? Yeah, okay. and it's it's the kind of uh, back in the day, like we're talking 2018, I think, is when EFAB like first started up. He like took my videos and chopped out basically like all the context around at any point and just be like, this is all he says about movies. And all I did was just like, okay, so we'll just go to it, rewind 10 seconds. There's the thing he said I didn't say. And we just did that for like 10 hours. It was ridiculous. And I was just like, this is fucking pathetic. Kind of like how at one stage he makes this point about me not showing clips alongside the things I'm saying. Uh, in a segment where he cuts the clips I am showing alongside the things I am saying. Mario is a woke film filled to the brim with wokeness and woke messages. Did we ever say that? Did I ever say that? Because, you know, this is the perfect time to show a clip of me saying it to demonstrate me saying the thing that you're claiming I'm saying. Represented here by the Knights Guild. Holy crap, this is freaking going woke. It is. I'll take my kids to watch. And I was like, no, like I don't support subversive woke crap. He's showing our clips and using us as a direct example of people that are saying Mario is a woke film filled to the brim. One end of the spectrum, we have the true believers represented here by the Knights Guild. The Knights recognize the Super Mario Brothers movie for exactly what it is. You took my clips out of your video trying to expose me for not including clips. Uh, and then shows the clips later anyway, so we can make a completely different point out of the exact same segment. No, like I don't support subversive woke crap. Which I don't, but he is trying to say that that is my opinion of the film, that the film is subversive woke crap, when this was my worry that it might be from the trailer reaction. It is the fact that based on this trailer, you concluded that this was subversive woke crap. That is the thing that was being pointed out. I'm sorry that there are clips of you that look bad, but... Yeah, those are that this is you actually expressing how you felt when you saw Mario get hit by Bullet Bill and Peach uh, wearing pants and having a goal boss voice. In summation, <laughs> Chad, having watched your trailer reaction and your movie review, uh, you were worried it was going to have goal boss Peach and emasculated woke Mario. Uh, the movie did have those things. You can't have a, a man save a woman now. It's Noise me. Unashamed of making Peach and it's such an insufferable girl boss. And you continue to dislike it. I'm sorry for misrepresenting you. Very likely is taking Paul out of context as well. I haven't seen the full context of those clips, but because he's so willing to take things out of context and deceptively edit it, we'll see what he does. Why are you trying to like sit on this high horse about me taking you out of context when you are literally removing the clips that I show? And the only way you get away with it is because you're appealing to an audience that already agree with you. Yeah. That you're feeding them what they want to hear, not, like, reality. And mm. yeah, Shad had to go through all of it as well. He's like, uh, Jack sold him down pretty hardcore. Besides, I mean, That's... man, if you're my friend and you do that, I ain't, I ain't fucking saving your bacon. <laughs> what a story, Mark. Jack did exactly the same thing to Shad he did to me. Flashback. He summarized it as, um... Sad bits make me sad, the funny bits make me lol, and the film is objectively good because it's good at elaborating on stuff from previous Marvel movies. Okay, and they're, they're, they're gonna play the last six minutes of the Infinity War video now, This is right? good, yeah. I'm not necessarily suggesting at this very moment that it's an inaccurate take, we'll speed it, up. it could be down to semantics, but we're gonna check out six no. minutes of my video on Infinity War. Um, because he specified six minutes and it's going from the moment plot summary ends. But yeah, this feels embarrassing sometimes because I'm just like, showing my video, but the point is to sort of explain why he's, uh, Got a bad take on it, not just to be like, guys, watch my video. Um, so here goes. Uh, according to my timestamp, it ends at fifty fifty. So, it was the longest take.
It's horrific. The powerful intelligent mm. and heroic vision. Died. So remember, folks, this is uh, Mueller showing that his videos are, in fact, not mostly comprised of summary. So consider in your brains how much of what he's about to show is, in fact, not summary. As a man. But perhaps the most impactful moment goes to a particularly powerful road being drawn to its close. Tony Stark has been through a lot in his series of films, finding that he must balance his urge to protect Earth while living the life of a man. What if I didn't? If you didn't? Yeah. When you finish? Leading him to protect his power, nuke his power, automate his power, submit his power, and finally, to keep it as insurance, to maintain a safety net if ever he or his loved ones were attacked, but never in pursuit. Once he knows that this coming attack is what he's been waiting for for six years, what sent him into anxiety attacks, what has consumed him since he saw his vision, he fights it to the point of leaving Earth's solar system and to the realization that Pepper, the person he loves the most, will never come between him and his will to prevent the suffering on a universal scale. This is very much the reflection of Thanos himself. With all that happening, it's tough to realize that Tony has also dealt with the fact that his dad didn't love him as much as his work, his mother, or himself. Hell, he loved Cap more. Tony then sees the tape in Iron Man 2 that tells him his dad considered him his greatest achievement and his work was all intended to be left to him. His dad absolutely loved him. Tony couldn't share any real moments of closure or love with his father despite his desperation because they were killed by Hydra in an attempt to steal his formula. This destroyed what made Tony so callous as a man in the first place. He needed to reevaluate the man he'd become. Moving on to Civil War, he treats Peter as his surrogate son, brings him in only to tell him to leave the second he is visibly hurt. Tony is looking to ignite that lost flame to get that relationship he's pined for his whole life, taking a positive step in that direction. In Homecoming, he keeps him in what is essentially a box despite Spider-Man's raw strength. He only wants him fighting low-life criminals because it's safe. And he's a child. Mr. Parker. Got a sec? Uh, I'm actually at school. No, you're not. Nice work in DC. My dad never really gave me a lot of support, and I'm just trying to uh, break the cycle. Uh, I'm kind of in the middle of something right Don't now. Don't cut me off when I'm complimenting you. Great things are about to happen. What is that? Uh, I'm at band practice. That's odd. Happy told me you quit band six weeks ago. When Peter succeeds, he congratulates him, shares with him that he always wanted this kind of relationship with his father, that he's proud of what he's doing. But then, to subvert Tony's security, he lies while trying to get involved in something Tony told him to stay away from. Peter wanted to go behind Tony's back and avoid what was essentially his protection, his care. I tell you, stay away from this. Instead, you hacked a multi-million dollar suit so you could sneak around behind my back doing the one thing I told you not to do. Those weapons were out there and I tried to tell you about it, but you didn't listen. None of this would have happened if you would just listen to me! You know that I was the only one who believed in you? Everyone else said I was crazy. Sorry, uh, that was very disingenuous of me. When I said summary, I also meant summary and just clips of the film. <laughs> Kid. He was furious and he took the gear back. Peter didn't deserve to have it if he wanted a thrill seek. But Peter saves the day and Iron Man's actual equipment from Vulture without a suit and reasserting that he only wants to do good. Lying was the way that he saw an opportunity for it and that's why he did it. Peter is reinstated and the relationship is strong once again. In Infinity War he decides to help because he can. Despite Iron Man's attempt to stop him he even goes on what can be assumed as a one way trip because he wants to help people. What if somebody died tonight? Different story right? Because that's on you. If you died, I think that's on me. I don't need that on my conscience. Tony wants him gone because the last thing he can bear is watching the kid get hurt. And so, echoing the dream he has in the opening about a child with the woman he loves called Morgan, taken away in a moment, Tony has to watch as Peter is slowly turned to ash in his arms, begging to stay with him. All in a handful of seconds, Tony loses one of his Avengers. He sees an innocent boy trying to save lives perish. But most importantly, he has that new and loving fatherly connection severed again, and there was nothing he could do to stop it. But it falls on him. Everything falls on Tony Stark's conscience as he was alive to stop it, and he couldn't. Tony now loses the son he never had, the team he'd built to protect the world and the universe itself. Nothing he could build or prepare could prevent it. After six years of it festering in his head, his nightmare has broken through. Tony is frozen, unable to emote. He couldn't accept it before, and now it's real. Everything has fallen apart. This is it. Pair all of this with Tom Holland's heart-wrenching performance, selling a Peter Parker that has begun to feel death coming after watching all the people he just saved turn to ash. How you doing, chat? Having a good night? I don't know what's happening. Thank you for joining us. Are you enjoying this deep analysis? He begs Tony not to let him go again and again while failing to stand, fading away in his arms. The scene was incredible. The film itself is a culmination of many run stories and characters dealing with very kind of <laughs> He says nothing he more than the scene is incredible. That's his, that's his conclusion. I can't believe characters they're straw manning themselves. <laughs> I can't believe Mauler to took Mauler out of context. Many characters having to sacrifice what they've come to love for the greater good. And the death, the rampant cold death of so many beloved characters. The credits of this film play like an obituary. The audience was dead silent. A respectful end to a Like, were they uncomfortable with this part? Were they just like, shit, this is all summary? <laughs> those Avengers are a large portion of what remains for the heroes. It's Each hard to watch. Like, are they, do you think they're sitting there thinking like, okay, Maul is gonna make a point now? They're like waiting for it. Or are they just like, shit, he's only summarizing. Choose what being said to save the day, to pass over the Marvel mantle to the new heroes that have been lost. 
This isn't just a celebration of one film and its achievement to bring together so many other properties with weight behind them. This is a celebration of what has been accomplished with 10 years of character writing. 10 years of trying to create something that people could become enamored with. It spans completely different personality types, completely different plots, completely different settings, completely different worlds. Directors having their style blasted through with writing having space and quality to shine. Incredible performances combined with special effects to support this comic book world's realism. All of this took talent, time, effort, and passion. Marvel should be fucking proud of themselves. Drama and comedy are a tough balance, but throughout Marvel's series they have shown they're going to shift it in one way or the other. With Infinity War being no exception. This is not an entirely morbid affair, and it does benefit from that. I'm Peter, by the way. Doctor Strange. Oh, you're using your made-up names. Then I am Spider-Man. Instead, we are going to open Wakanda to the rest of the world. This is not what I imagined. Why did you imagine? The Olympics? Maybe even at Starbucks? Cool. So cool. We have Rabbit, Tree, Squidward, Blanket of Death, Kick Names, and Take Ass. I am Steve Rogers, the baby of a pirate and an angel. What was she doing up there the whole time? I'm gonna blow that nutsack of a chin right off, and who could forget? Motherfucker! This film was an event, a triumph. Each of the crew and cast involved deserve a pat on the back for bringing a 10 year path to an incredible peak. I can't even tell you about all of the amazing details this film has, aside from what I've already discussed, nor will I share any flaws. I don't know if you noticed, but this assessment is extremely biased in one specific direction to complement my other recent work. In and there we go. And yeah. yet, not inaccurate for me to say that he thinks it's objectively good for these reasons or that reasons. Man, Mahler, you did our research for us. Like, that's so, that's so considerate of you. So this is the, the fundamental issue here, is I think this is where we're never going to move past this. I think a certain amount of Mahler's fan base are always going to see this as us being disingenuous, because from the clips you, you've just seen, um, they're going to say this is an own, like we've you've demolished Jack. I think this is the best. If there's anything I want people to take away from the stream, it's this this portion. Because I think it should be abundantly clear that what we've just seen is summary, summary with like very little interspersed parts. When Moore says, and that's good, or like, and this is this thing's good. Um, sometimes he might go as far as to summarize two things next to each other that relate to each other, but this is still just like a book report, at best, that there's no analysis here. Um, but Mauler's fan base has considered, considers this an own. And in fact, everyone in the voice chat considers this a demolishment of how disingenuous and l like the levels of deceit in, in our video. And I just don't know what to tell them at this point. Um, it's, a, it's a tricky situation, I guess. Apparently, uh, apparently Jack's a... Uh getting a little bit out of shape by the fact that we just watched all that. Yeah, he's, he's tweeted apparently that apparently not all of that was actual conclusions. Apparently, wow. uh, apparently so... he meant six minutes to spread across the whole video. I meant <laughs> okay. that, yeah. Okay. Um, That's what he tweeted. Whatever, Jack. Um, so the... What do you think the overall point... Um, what, how, what, what do you think... What's your take on what you've just seen? My take is that I'd like you to narrate audio, please. My, I, I think what you're trying to get across here is that... I think I almost said it. I, I might just be recording you because you kind of say it yourself. This is a culmination of previously established events, and if you don't bring those events, you know, to the forefront, if you don't tell people, this is what's happened, this is what happened here, it took us 10 years to get here, and this is the result of all those things happening, this is the payoff for all the setup, for all the development, so it is extremely important that all of that stuff that happened before is taken along with this. I don't know if anyone else wants to say anything, because I was just going to say, like, uh, the idea, because that's yeah, I mean, one of the actions I do Summaries are important, that's so why Wikipedia exists. Thought, I, I, feel, um, I feel like, I feel like I'm having, like, um, an ego no. death. I'm sure. That, I'm I, sure that a lot of people in chat can sympathise right now. Uh, this I, was. I wasn't. I wasn't aware of this. I think it was just after this that I gave up because I was seeing his chat just like, wow, wow, Jack just got fucking demolished there, and I was like, what are you watching? I don't know. Back in the day, like we're talking 2018, I think is when Efab like first started up. He like took my videos and chopped out basically like all the context around at any point and just be like, this is all he says about movies. And all I did was just like, okay, so we'll just go to it, rewind 10 seconds, there's the thing he said I didn't say. And we just did that for like 10 hours. It was ridiculous. And I was just like, this is fucking pathetic. Infinity War is admittedly a kind of unfair example. Mauler really does phone this one in. It's just mm -hmm. running through the film scene by scene. Oh, and... damn. So, wow. Like, the, this is a genuine response to this, Jack. Kindly fuck you. Simple as wow. that. Uh, I worked really hard on that video. Oh. And it's something that I consider work hard all closer to me for media than a lot of uh, I'm standard sorry. I don't know. I really care about. I, I don't know, so. dude. Like, also, Mauler, like, I'm sorry to say this, but you know The Last Jedi, the film that you despise? Um, tons of people work really hard on it, so fuck you for criticizing it. Like, I'm sorry. I'm sorry you worked hard on your video, I guess, apparently. Uh, Maybe it needed another redraft, I don't know. End of flashback. Right.
So you were always like this. There's a, a friend of mine who I share very close perspectives with, but he loves Iron Man 3. I hate Iron Man 3 with a fiery passion. So we're setting up a time where we're going to be able to discuss it. We'll both watch it, and then we'll both you know, have a conflict of ideas, and one of them is going to win. This is a person who's very on board with the perspective about objectivity versus subjectivity. We're going to come out of it as one of us is probably going to be like, okay, I was, I did have a bit of awkward, I, I didn't have the right information on this. That's that's kind of how it goes. Um, the, right. I, but, but I kind of like disagree just with that assumption, right? That one of you will win and that one of you should win, right? Like, oh, that well, shouldn't really I, I use that point. word. I don't want to, I don't want to like frame it as if it's a fight. Like I, I'm actually, we don't look at it as a, a win loss. We look at it as a gaining knowledge gaining perspective. NEFAP Civil War debate against South Pole when? Right. I, 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 well, I can... For, gonna... for their sake, they don't want that to happen. Oh, they said I meant Civil War. I, sorry, I misunderstood. I thought they meant like a Civil War debate over the fact that it's Terriers, but they meant a debate over Civil War, which I, I, I mean... I assume that's what they meant. Yeah. Uh, like I said, for their sake, they don't want that. Why would they not want that rags? Because they'd get slaughtered publicly, and that's not good for their image. Get the fuck out of my sight before I demolish you. I just wish that everyone was a little bit more critical of the content they consume. There should not be a single YouTuber that you agree with 100%. At that point, the truth doesn't seem to really matter anymore. Once again, I'll have numerous mistakes and poorly worded moments throughout this whole video series, and I look forward to hearing everyone's thoughts as the series is released, because I am very fallible, as is everyone else who makes content like this. When he says they got a lot wrong for them, please don't take that shit seriously. We've argued with Southpot, SK, Sophistic, and many others. Fringy and I have been airtight outside of semantics or clarifying details. So why do people do adamantly defend this show? I'm still trying to parse that out. Because they said something and now are forced to admit they were wrong or dig themselves deeper. Imagine not being able to handle being wrong. Now, there's a problem I've been rather consistently seeing from EFAP's audience whenever they talk about me or Terriers. The default assumption they've been making is that EFAP could not have possibly had a bad take, that they must have been correct, and I was just angry with them for criticizing it at all. So I'm just butthurt that my sacred cow was slaughtered. The problem with this narrative is that from the beginning, my issues with their arguments have been that they are grossly inaccurate. For reasons I hope, I've done an adequate job of elaborating in gory detail for three and a half hours. And I've especially taken issue with their bad faith arguments against others about the show, myself included. But apparently I am not allowed to talk about this, according to people who have never watched the show for themselves nor could they even be bothered to do so before getting engaged with the discussion at all. I've seen my character get completely assassinated by this crowd over lies, but I'm apparently just not allowed to fight back against them. The idea that this whole thing has helped open my eyes to just how bad the EFAP guys actually are at their jobs has been framed as indicative that I think Terriers is above scrutiny. But like, given the degree to which they were extremely hypocritical, dishonest, cruel, and thin-skinned, I'm sorry, but how exactly am I supposed to continue respecting these guys at all? You guys do realize that respect is earned, correct? you can lose it just as much as you can gain it. The EFAP community has repeatedly refused to argue why I am wrong about why Mahler's take on the show is bad, and instead opted to just make ad hominem arguments in order to discredit me whenever they're not just echo chambering my criticisms of EFAP out. Which comes across as though they seem to think EFAP are off limits to criticize, while then falsely asserting that I think Terriers is off limits to criticize. Don't tell me I can't say what I'm saying, tell me why what I'm saying is wrong. And if you think that I'm the only person who's been on EFAP who could possibly be bothered by this community of so-called objective critics abandoning any shred of a focus on factual accuracy in pursuit of irrationally fulfilling their personal feelings, think again, because I have a friend who would like to have a word about these people, who has a pretty solid bead on when others are being insufferably inconsistent. I don't know, Southpaw. I'm quite taken aback by how people from this community, of all communities, suddenly prioritize how you reacted over the references you brought up to prove why the criticisms are bad. And I finally get to say that now that I've binged the show. Like, are you fucking kidding me? Fringy, the only way you could have recounted this scene the way you did is if you watched it in 144p after getting your eardrums clapped by Homelander with a stick up your butt. I'm also blown away by how the community suddenly 
cares about how long ago this started and that Southpaw should stop talking about it, as if that's somehow relevant to whether or not EFAP's criticisms were bad, because if that actually mattered, then I hope you take issue with my videos. I say some serious apologizing is in order. Oh yeah, and Fringy, your Civil War defenses? They suck. They sound like defenses EFAP would laugh at had they'd been made by a creator outside the community. Uh, nobody checked the ID at the lobby. <laughs> If you ask me, it looks like EFAP has become a bit of a sacred cow to these people, and I committed the cardinal sin of not agreeing with their bad faith criticisms. I should have just automatically agreed with whatever they had to say, or I should have just kept my mouth shut on the matter. Well, I'll have you know that sacred cows are my speciality. They are not yours to slaughter. Setting aside the blatant projection from this fanbase, I'm honestly quite disturbed to see so many people dilute the term sacred cow in the manner they have, as if it is suddenly Shut wrong up. to get aggravated by someone who is misrepresenting art with inaccurate criticisms and then getting impossible to reason with. People who aren't really fans of either me or SK might actually relate to this if they look into what SK recently said about the Incredibles. Yeah, I'm not really convinced by his arguments at this point. Maybe he has some better ones up his sleeve. On the flip side, every last person who has bothered to look at the show and then looked at EFAP's criticisms of it have come away with a realization that EFAP are either dishonest or just plain media illiterate and aren't worth listening to. Why is that? Well, it's because not everyone who watches EFAP has attached a significant portion of their identity to these guys being right all the time. There are people in their audience who are genuinely interested in the truth and are willing to put in the work to find it, even if it means risking a dreaded realization that their favorite YouTubers don't live up to their own vaunted standards. I would bet this even describes a fair number of their fans who clicked on this video. Even for folks who didn't really love the show, this has caused their admiration for these folks to crumble. <laughs> It isn't really possible for them to value what they have to say about art, especially for those who had initially ignored the show on their recommendation and then realized they were urged not to watch what is, by all accounts, a quite well-written, well-acted, and entertaining show, in tandem with their indefensible mistreatment of a friend, and their refusal to own up to any of it. But that all requires them to first ask a question that not many of their fans seem to be willing to ask in the first place. What if they were wrong? It's not like EFAP has never had a bad take and then written off all dissent as people just butt hurt over valid criticisms made about a secret cow of theirs, but for whatever reason, much of their fanbase really couldn't have entertained that was a real possibility. No, of course EFAP couldn't actually be this wrong about a TV show, right? They certainly have a better track record than Southpaw anyways. I'm going to just take their word for it. Several months later. God, Southpaw is still bitching about this shit? It's truly unbelievable how butthurt he is that they just proved his sacred cow is terrible. So, it's come to my attention that the most diehard loyalists of Muller and EFAP, the ones I don't expect to ever be able to reach, do not know what the term sacred cow actually means. Just add it to the ever-growing list of things that they fundamentally don't understand. For them, it is a thought-terminating buzzword that they've appropriated so that they don't have to entertain the possibility that they might be incorrect. They've basically redefined it to mean anything that you are personally attached to, when in actuality it's a fairly useful term that describes a very real phenomenon that isn't hard to come across if you begin poking into the right things. Or wrong things, rather. That idea being that something is just considered off-limits to criticize, even if the criticisms are valid. You see, it's one thing for someone to just wish to personally abstain from a discussion, but they leave others alone and allow them to have it. That's not really what comes to my mind when I think of a sacred cow anyways. Now, if you love Spider-Man 2, as most people do, and haven't really noticed any issues with it in regards to plot holes or internal consistency, and you'd prefer to remain ignorant of them, that's perfectly fine. There is no shame in wanting to avoid looking at or hearing criticism directed at something that you enjoy and do not want tainted for you. And it's also fine if the lens through which I perceive media isn't compatible with 
with yours. You see, sometimes people get a bit defensive of what they love getting criticized to the point where they jump to personal attacks or they make defenses that they wouldn't be making if it weren't for a pre-existing bias for it. I mean, you definitely got a risk there, but like, this is a risk you gotta take if but you no. wanna execute on this plan. Or they'll even outright insinuate why you shouldn't be criticizing something because it's some unfalsifiable, universal truth that something is good, rather than just making a sound argument for why you're wrong. To say something is objectively bad um, is disingenuous uh, because you have, for one, nobody can really be that objective. Everybody has bias, however slight they do because we're human it's fine 12 seconds later but there are certain universal truths there are certain universal truths um batman the animated series is the greatest animated series committed to television you could not like the series but it's still the greatest of all time you could not like ice cream but you'd be wrong you could not like puppies but you'd be wrong these are universal truths you might have some honest, perhaps even totally airtight criticism against something, but you're dealing with a fanatic who's just chosen not to accept your perspective as a valid one. Well, would you say that this is a flaw in the movie? No, the movie is perfect. It's not perfect. It is perfect. Uh, why is it perfect? Goodbye. However, sometimes the person you're arguing with is refusing to be reasonable, and their criticism is either factually inaccurate or it's setting a ridiculous standard for how we approach media. Because to reiterate what I said earlier, I have no idea what sort of media actually would hold up if we were to criticize it in the same manner that EFAP did to Terriers, considering how they called anything and everything under the sun convenient, even if it was an inciting incident, made up how things work in the real world, and ignore incredibly simple characterization and framing. And I can only hope you might see how incredibly obvious that's been for me from day one at this point. On my server, I called for people to criticize things that would actually survive the level of scrutiny that EFAP are believed by their fans to apply to all media, using the kinds of arguments that they were making for Terriers. As a way of demonstrating what that looks like, why don't I pick a movie at complete random? I promise this isn't going to end up highlighting any hypocrisy or anything. Anyway, Let's critique Mission Impossible Fallout. Hunt should have told the president slash organizations more. He should have been more critical of Cavill. He should have been using more weapons in all of the scenes. If Hunt cared about people so much, he shouldn't have let the people steal the stuff in the opening. If the terrorists wanted to do their plot so much, they should have tried harder. How much time passes between each scene? It's a plot hole. Why doesn't Hunt get replaced by someone younger? Why is there so many new characters when we have so little time to understand the ones we have? Alec Baldwin gets shot when he's supposed to be trained? Plot hole. What's the point of cameras if none of them picked up anything? Why bother? with guns if you miss? Why is there oxygen for people who die anyway? This is something I'm hoping to coin, but it's a branch of derangement syndrome. You hate a story so much, you just ask questions like a machine gun. They all have answers, but you are convinced by the fact that you asked them that you have a case. To the point that you will honestly ask why Spider-Man is keeping his identity a secret from Aunt May. What the f Oh. Oh wait, this was what Mahler said less than a fucking year before unironically developing Terrier's derangement syndrome. Oh, whoops. Whoopsie. Flashback. I think this divide in the fan base is the reason that Southpaw is somewhat of a divisive figure. Whether right or wrong in his analysis, he tends to only go after media traditionally well-received by audiences, like Spider-Man 2, meaning he immediately alienates the group of Mahler fans who simply like having their emotions validated. So, uh, quick clarification, with, with Southpaw, it's not about, like, finding things people love and destroying them, it's, he's, he's got a, he's like this in microcosm today, he, he very much believes that a lot of people in the EFAP audience are very hypocritical. Now, I can't think of any reasoning for why he might have concluded that in any way, shape, or form. It's not like that's something that this very comment is essentially addressing, because it's way more mm -hmm. common for people to hate, like, one thing every once in a while. Uh, the less common is people like what the, the, you've seen on EFAP, where we're basically like trying so hard to maintain all the standards we basically try to create to make a foundation for the discussion for all these different types of things, which is like, oh my god, this thing fails, this thing fails, this thing fails. There's like Man of Steel, for example, like those people I'm pretty sure in our community were very pro Man of Steel, and then we covered it extensively we were like this was really bad by the same metric we used that likely brought a lot of you here in the first place being the last jedi like so either you can commit to yeah okay well that's not bad and it's because tlj isn't really that bad either and that we need to find a different system that makes it so that tlj is bad while man of steel is good like good luck with that Honestly, wish you all the best, mm -hmm. but that's not all we do here. We're, we're very much about the whole consistency thing, as in like cause and effect. We love that in storytelling. Oof, gorgeous, it's wonderful, tough. tasty.
end of flashback. This idea that as a rule, people are never allowed to get aggravated by criticisms towards what they care about is bunk. Universal law is for lackeys and context is for kings. I'm afraid that not everything is a sacred cow, folks. Sometimes criticism is just wrong, or it sets an untenable standard that no media at all can live up to if applied consistently. And if all you can say in response to someone pointing that out is that they just have a sacred cow instead of actually engaging with their argument, then I hate to tell you this, but you are the person with a sacred cow. Whether that sacred cow is yourself or some object of parasocial affection. So, to review. These guys are allowed to infer that others are being intentionally deceptive, but if you make the same inferences based on the same exact criteria they go by, you are being bad faith. They are allowed to gang up on you in a live debate, shout over you, and belittle you, but you are not allowed to withdraw from further discussions from them in which they are acting toxic and unreasonable. They are allowed to then snipe at you several times from their live streams by misrepresenting a show that they have even recently acknowledged that you love and see as important to your credibility as a critic in private. But you don't get to have a right of reply, even if you are a lot more civil than they ever were. They are allowed to victim blame a character who was quite literally raped based on the criteria they've accepted for other movies in the past, and even laugh about it in the process. But if you describe it as victim blaming, even if you are willing to attribute it to ignorance, well, you're acting in bad faith, and you're calling them rape apologists because they just didn't like a TV show. They are allowed to throw a tantrum over you not agreeing with them. And if you decide to stop talking to them as a direct result of their asinine behavior, well, you torch your friendship with them just because they didn't like a TV show. They are allowed to accuse others of being bad faith without any elaboration, but you are not allowed to declare that they are being bad faith when you have cut and dry examples of them employing the handful of actual bad faith arguments that they did include on their 6x8 bad faith bingo card. They are allowed to go on tangents in the middle of their Star Wars videos to point out other content creators being inconsistent with their standards, even if their references are faulty and missing contextual differences that are even present in the clips they use. But you are not allowed to assemble a team of people willing to trudge through portions of their enormous library to find examples of them clearly being inconsistent with their standards, even though they just ripped into you for allegedly being a hypocrite based on completely factually inaccurate references barely even a week ago. They are are allowed to point out why a standard is silly by referring to a universally well-regarded piece of media that the standard would apply to. But if you try to do that with them, that's whataboutism. I have to ask, is this what objective criticism looks like? It is simple. You present the objective criteria, then you satisfy the objective criteria and reach a conclusion. Your emotional experience didn't enter into the equation whatsoever. This should highlight the issue of in my opinion being used arbitrarily to stay off criticism when criteria isn't clear, or when it's downright contradictive. It's as if they believe an opinion can never be refuted. Aside from that issue, when you make these statements and you don't bother to back them up with any evidence or argumentation, instead opting for the safety net, in my subjective opinion, you are not only creating content with the amount of substance that is on par with a thumbs up or down for each subject, you have also admitted that you have so little faith in your own perspective that you had to put a preemptive screw shield in front of it. But don't assume that I'm immune from this. I am absolutely guilty of it too. It's just something I try to avoid when writing and it makes the process much longer, hence why I still haven't said it in other than quotations yet. I understand though, holding a position like The Last Jedi as a masterpiece of a script is rough without saying something like, in my opinion. But to then use the definition of opinion as a preventative measure from evidence that counters that position is ignorance in its most classic form. Essayists will forget forget about the facts that ruin their narrative. We all have a narrative, mine is trying to get to the logical baseline for every element in a script under an objective writing standard, and so I provide you references that are researched and my opinion is rarely relevant because I have to follow what is seen and heard, and then relay that to you guys, which is essentially Quinton's biggest mistake. He thinks I am sharing my opinion of The Last Jedi when I say there are contradictions in the script, despite referencing many of them, and I can't blame him because he is yet another person who uses opinion as a shield from criticism, but I don't. That judgment was objective, supported by references. If it is inaccurate and based on faulty information, then please scrutinize me. It will improve my work. What it won't do is prompt me to say, it's just my opinion, leave me alone. We kind of just want to be left alone, which you are just for some reason adamant about not doing. Hypocrite!
Crit. Upon close review of all of these staggering contradictions that compose this entitled and frankly incoherent mindset shared by not only a significant swath of fans of this podcast, but also the hosts themselves, I can safely conclude that there is little, if any, consistency to be found with these guys. They will make up problems that no rational person would get fussy about to complain about media that they don't like, even if that media would actually satisfy their standard for cause and effect and internal consistency, while making defenses that are worse than a lot of the ones they mock other people for making once it's something they love on the chopping block. The unfortunate reality is that they are far more driven by their irrational emotions than they are willing to admit. And it's fine to have these biases, to have these blind spots for what you personally love or get something out of, even if it's not really logically consistent. Just don't turn around and do this. Meant for a window-licking populace trained to simply ask for more just seconds after chowing down on the most recent sterilized, drug-tested, soulless cardboard cutout of what claims to be a story. Especially when you'll pay lip service to the idea that you are totally fine with people liking something. We hold each other accountable for the proof of the statements we make, and of course it is completely valid to say that you do or do not like something. Well, he, he fucking I don't care. likes terriers. I don't hey. care what he has. <laughs> It's okay to like whatever you want, but if you like what I don't like, you're a window-licking consumer. I'm sorry, but these are two mutually exclusive sentiments, and as soon as you begin bludgeoning others with the latter, that just opens the door for people to criticize you, and those who blindly worship you, for being willing to settle for mediocre garbage, like the bottom-tier sludge, with less clarity or depth than the average puddle, that you have the gall to try to sell as analysis. However, setting aside the poor media literacy, the hilarious inconsistency in which they are willing to be either overly charitable or quite nakedly unreasonable, and the cut and dry dishonesty in how they talk about things, there's another layer about this whole sorry saga that's especially disappointing, which is that despite supposedly being all about back and forth discussions on media, they, and especially their fans, really don't like the idea of me criticizing them, as evidenced by their lack of ability to actually argue why I am incorrect, and instead just insisting that I shouldn't be criticizing them at all. Which is a strong indicator that these people aren't actually interested in discussion or arguing based on references. They would much rather live in an echo chamber where they never get their positions truly challenged. And they're entitled to just not listen if they don't want to, but they go beyond that when they then try to argue that I should shut up. Shut up! Shut up! Shut the fuck up! A large swath of EFAP's audience has, in essence, made it abundantly clear that they don't truly believe in someone having a right of reply. All of their pomp and bluster about internal consistency being key to their investment in stories, and being willing to hash out disagreements in good faith, are in fact a pair of big lies. Lies that I believe they are delusional enough to have even truly convinced themselves of. And I don't believe that this is just down to a few bad apples that are bound to be in most or all communities. You are lying to yourself if you think that the hosts themselves have absolutely nothing to do with encouraging this attitude by echo chambering out any criticisms directed at them that are actually more substantive than these weak sauce, low effort digs that people usually throw at them, such as the mere length of their content, or when people complain about the one stream they did responding to Jenny Nicholson out of hundreds in which they've almost exclusively covered men. These guys puff their chests and act as if those are the only arguments that people can make against them, yet when they finally get what they seem to ask for, they just pretend that these harder criticisms against them don't exist, or without making an actual argument argument, just tell the person to shut up. SHUT THE FUCK UP! This is about far more than just someone having one bad take or just not liking something. This is an outright betrayal of the principles that, back in 2018, I was under the impression that these guys truly did have. So. A betrayal that is completely unbecoming of a person who allegedly cares about media being criticized accurately and fairly. There is a quote from a French philosopher, whose name I refuse to risk botching, which, with the most minor of paraphrasing, describes this crowd perfectly. Never believe that the EFAP hosts and their fans are completely unaware of the absurdity of their replies. They know that their remarks are frivolous, open to challenge, but they are amusing themselves, for it is their adversary who is obliged to use words responsibly, since he believes in words. EFAP has the right to play. They even like to play with discourse for, by giving ridiculous reasons, they discredit the seriousness of their interlocutors. They delight in arguing in bad faith, since they seek not to persuade by sound arguments, but to intimidate and disconcert. If you press them too closely, they will abruptly fall silent, loftily indicating by some phrase that the time for argument is past. These guys can delusionally insist that they are 
objective all they want, while everyone in the real world will see them for what they really are. Cringe. There's no other word for it. This makes me cringe. It's embarrassing. Now getting back to realistic critique, I think a pretty reasonable criticism of a story is that it doesn't exclusively cater to my demographic, and by my demographic I mean pretty much just me. Franchises can only survive by solely pandering to the most hardcore and specific set of fans, and all other voices should be shut out and ignored. All stories belong only to me. I think everyone can agree that's a pretty reasonable position to take. Besides, my money is magically worth more than all of these underrepresented people with cash to burn on entertainment. and will take pretty much whatever they can get at this point. Don't listen to those people. Only listen to unpleasable media warriors with niche followings who scream the loudest obscenities on the internet. You can tell these people are worth listening to because their laundry list of story sins include the most petty nitpicks. Even the mightiest of franchises can be failed by a thousand cuts. I'm sure my list of nitpicks makes me look smart and deep but not that I have no attention span. Yeah, it can't be that I lack an attention span since I spent so much time mad that the story doesn't establish Established plot, setting character, exposition, tone, foreshadowing, plot twist, climax, central theme, symbolism, and established pacing in the opening sentence, and therefore is a failure of a story. Jeez, what would you people do without me to tell you to stop having fun? People might think that teasing out mysteries is good writing. Thank goodness for the brave internet warriors with zero suspension of disbelief to save us from enjoying things. Just like me when I point out that because a story twist occurs that was heavily foreshadowed, this means that obviously the story has failed to surprise me and is therefore objectively bad. A real writer would have simply pulled the story element from nowhere to truly surprise the audience rather than feed them clues. I can't believe the author is that stupid. I'll leave a tactless mean comment and that'll put them in their place and impress everyone. In fact, lack of tact is a key advantage, especially when one understands one essential thing. The verboseness of an analysis is directly proportional to its validity. Why be concise and communicate a point succinctly and clearly when I can instead drone on and on and on? Hammering home a single point can be effective when it comes to critique and reviews to stress the importance of it, which is why it's fine to completely go overboard and belabor the point well past its expiration date. I don't like to roll this out very much. It's one of the worst shows I've seen. Uh, I wouldn't recommend it to anybody. No, would I? Uh, one of the worst I don't, you've I don't, seen. One of the worst I've I seen. I would recommend um, it. Now, I've seen, especially if you put me and Fringy together, we've seen a lot of shows. We're, we're talking yes. an unholy amount, potentially. And if there were percentiles, yeah, this one's easily in the bottom 20%. Um, yeah, I would, uh, I would much sooner recommend, if you want a procedural, just watch Law and Order. You'll get a lot more out of Law and Order. I like Barry. I'd rec No, I don't like Barry. At all. <laughs> I would recommend Barry. I think a lot of people would get something out of that show. I think a lot of people would enjoy it. I think it's a show that has good scenes in it, some great scenes in it, and potential. I don't see that in Terriers. My turn. I do not see what is so valuable about what these guys have to offer as critics. They not only consistently misread media, they even seem to do it willfully. And then when you try to offer good faith pushback, they will talk down to you in return. Then, after insisting that the reason you can't see what their problems are is because it must just be too close to your heart, and initially seeming to agree to disagree, they launch at the first opportunity that they get to shit on you by proxy publicly. And then, when you respond to them without even hitting them back, they get extremely defensive and act as if you were attacking them, reversing victim and offender. If they want to complain that I turn this disagreement over a TV show into a hostile one, all I have to say is that they have done that themselves. They like to argue in bad faith. It makes them happy, as well as the audience they've cultivated, which will eagerly declare anyone who doesn't participate in their morally and intellectually bankrupt circle jerks to be bad faith. You keep using the horde. I don't think it means what you think it means. At the end of the day, no matter how much they may try to project onto others, that's never going to change the fact that EFAP lied about someone's art, and their fans let them get away with it. Good thing, too. You were this close to getting mad over a top. <laughs> Terriers, for folks who've actually watched it, is just a fun, obscure, black comedy drama show with strong character writing and a story with a pretty firm chain of cause and effect. Even if there's the very occasional contrivance you can point out across all 13 episodes, and I've seen enough success introducing it to people who wouldn't have heard of it otherwise that I can say there's like a 95% chance that you'll really enjoy it if you give it a shot. There's absolutely no reason it needed to be turned into some sort of political football black sheep where people have become absurdly invested in trashing it, despite never having watched it in order to defend EFAP, rather than just entertain the idea that they may have missed here, which isn't by itself some unforgivable cardinal sin 
for a critic. I know that I didn't think that them missing even to this degree was enough to automatically write off a friendship or a willingness to hear out what they have to say about things in general, but considering just how much I tried to avoid attacking them in my initial response to them, and how personally they took this thread anyways, and how within 16 minutes of my thread getting posted, they rushed to their Discord server to have this truly surreal cope session about what I and others had said about these insane arguments they tried to make, and spent a day trying to pressure me into a call so they could harp on me over just the most minuscule criticism I could have made about their points, it couldn't have painted a clearer picture that these guys are not only capable of misrepresenting what they are talking about, to the point of actively lying about it and unfairly denigrating someone's story, but are also insanely obstinate and just plain bad faith and can't be reasoned with when they are wrong. Which, in my opinion, says a lot more about one's ability as a critic than whether I agree with you all the time or I just generally agree with you on things that matter to me. If I catch you being dishonest and being a thin-skinned bully at the sight of the most tepid criticism I could make about your dishonest take, then there's other critics out there who are more worth my time, even if I don't agree with them on any number of things, who at least when they say things I don't agree with or are even factually wrong, I can at least see where they are coming from. I can see how they can come to their conclusions, and they aren't hellish to disagree with. I could have just bent the knee and conceded to these bullshit arguments. But to me, some things are just more important than the clout you might get from orbiting some narcissistic e-celebs, who won't even be relevant in a few years anyways once more and more people are exposed to just how bad they actually are at what they have set out to do, unless they stick to solely trashing the lowest hanging fruit, things like the most basic of principles and integrity. I would much prefer to fade away into obscurity than tie my identity or worth to people like Mahler and his friends. If their take on Terriers is truly reflective of how they criticize things, as they and their fans have rabidly insisted. If that is the hill they wish to die on, rather than just admitting they missed to a degree more impressive than most people they've covered, then so be it. If their fans wish to tie their identities to these guys' credibility to the point where they will bash something they've never seen, that they might just end up liking a lot if they do end up seeing it, that's just going to be on them. If their friends wish to just pretend that everything is okay because clout matters more to them than the truth, that's going to be on them. I personally would much rather have a tiny little channel where I can talk about whatever I'm passionate about, uninhibited by some need to tow a party line, lest I subject myself to the irrational rage of some lonely, hateful, and just plain cruel internet trolls who lack even a shred of integrity or compassion for anyone besides themselves, who make their own intellectual shortcomings everyone else's problem by throwing truly delusional tantrums about things you've never said. But why should I run the risk of strawmanning them, when I could consult with a now former fan of EFAP who initially had this perspective before he then spoke to me? Hi there, I'm Bleebo Daggins, aka the guy who left that extremely cringy comment Southpaw showed earlier. I'm not sure if I can sum up my involvement with this whole mess better than he did, so how about a little bit of expansion? I've been a big fan of EFAP and Wolf even before that ever since I came across Mahler's primary YouTube channel back in 2018. Like a lot of people, to say his videos tearing down The Last Jedi were indescribably influential on my day-to-day -day film criticism would be a vast understatement. His metric for analyzing a film's internal consistency was instantly appealing to me, like I'm sure it was for a lot of people for a variety of reasons. It seemed thorough, offered a deep look into a film's plot and character, not often found to the same degree in most other YouTube critic channels, and it gave many of my own views on film a sense of validation. I realized that to some degree I had always been judging movies objectively, but going down the extensive rabbit hole of watching every single one of Mahler's unbridled rages, long critiques, and EFAP streams allowed me to better refine my own critiquing style, and put more words towards my feelings about film analysis in general. Mahler himself said that he started on YouTube because he was dissatisfied with other creators, and sought to do better. And I still believe, after all that's been covered today, that he did. Even after numerous talks with Southpaw, even after coming to see and agree with his side of things, even after seeing my once sacred cow EFAP slaughtered and shown for the liars, manipulators, and utterly incompetent critics that they are, I'm still not ready to throw out everything that EFAP was. Perhaps it's just the lingering fanboy in me that's unwilling to let go of all the good memories I have of watching their videos, or maybe it's just that they really were once something special and have simply fallen from grace. I remember being rather displeased with the YouTube film critic space back in 2018, and EFAP seemed godsent at the time. Finally, I had a group of people whose views aligned almost perfectly with my own. People who enabled me to better appreciate the films I loved for their objective quality, 
and better explain my disdain for the films I despised. A big reason why Southpaw felt I should make this section is because of how deeply entrenched in their fanbase I was. When I was first properly introduced to Southpaw and EFAP 112, I can't exactly say my immediate impression of him was... fantastic. He definitely stirred up the community by defending the writing choices of The Amazing Spider-Man 2, and in the same stream opening up about his take on Spider-Man 2's writing being dog shit. You could feel the change in the air that day. EFAP's objective metric was at that point used solely to praise the movies that the fanbase loved and tarnish the ones they hated. But now this guy's showing up using the same kind of objective analysis to poke holes in many people's sacred cows? At the time, I hated it. He was my least favorite guest on EFAP, and it seemed to me that he was just a guy who got off on the idea that he stirred people up with his hot takes. And believe me, you could tell a lot of people in the community felt the same way. And that's part of how this whole controversy was even made possible. EFAP's viewers, and possibly the hosts themselves, were brewing an underlying hatred towards Southpaw, whether they were aware of it or not, and many jumped on the opportunity to rush to conclusions that best aligned with this hatred as soon as Southpaw went at odds with the hosts themselves. I'm ashamed to say that I was guilty of this myself. I only first heard of his separation from them when I came across SK's video on my recommended page. Like many others, I wrote off practically everything I heard in that video as Southpaw just getting mad over his sacred cow getting slaughtered and blah blah something mad over a TV show, and then I went about my day. I suppose I just wanted to continue watching EFAP unimpeded by the idea that they were actually horrible people, and that I would need to seriously reconsider my own method for critiquing media, which admittedly is highly based off theirs. Now please keep in mind that part of my perspective came from the fact that I don't have a Twitter account, and therefore was blissfully unaware of what was going on there. I tried my very best to stay far away from that intellectual Bermuda Triangle for the sake of my own sanity, and have succeeded thus far. I also joined Mahler's Discord rather late and practically missed all of Mahler's conversations regarding Southpaw, not that I really would have noticed them anyways. Even after joining it, I'm borderline inactive, so I probably would have missed them. However, the most important reason why I was so late to the draw with all this was because of where the bulk of EFAP's criticisms towards the show was hidden. And yes, hidden is the correct word to use here. Mahler and company's take on the show debuted in the Super Chat section of EFAP 151, and then subsequently the Super Chat catch-up that followed it. Now, I admit, as someone who's seen literally every EFAP at least once, I usually skip the Super Chat portions. Ain't nobody got time for that! The EFAP hosts themselves know that the view drop-off for the Super Chat catch-ups are staggering, so forgive me for being suspicious as to their intentions for only mentioning the show in passing during Super Chats, instead of dedicating a stream towards it. I mean, it wouldn't have been the first time EFAB did a stream dedicated to an obscure piece of media, so why not? I understand I'm getting a little conspiracy theorist here, but the main point still remains. If you're wondering why so many people are interested in calling out Southpaw, yet none of them have actually seen the show themselves, that's why. Hell, I'd even go so far as to say that most of the people who say all this shit about Southpaw, having his sacred cow slaughtered and all that, haven't even heard EFAB's criticisms of the show in full. I know at the time I didn't. Obviously, missing the bulk of what they've said, or not getting a proper idea of the timeline of events would skew anyone's perspective on the matter, especially if they're coming from a biased perspective to begin with. But unfortunately, this fight has become little more than a battle of hearsay. Hopefully, this video changes that. I left that comment on SK's video fully indoctrinated onto EFAP's side. When I was invited onto their stream, I was surprised. I went into it thinking I was 100% right, and was ready to change their minds. Once the facts and receipts were laid out to me in proper order, it became increasingly difficult to go to bat in EFAP's favor. If you've seen that stream, then you've pretty much watched live my entire opinion of them shaken to its core. I've always had some problems with them, and was always willing to admit that they had some bad takes, but nothing like this. After that stream, I had several private conversations with Southpaw that further enlightened my perspective on things, and now I'm at a point where some serious introspection is in order. I still believe that any piece of media's quality can be objectively analyzed, but is it perhaps time to reevaluate that? Will I even continue to watch EFAP? Probably. Unfortunately, it's very hard to break out of the habit after these guys have been one of four YouTube channels that I actually regularly keep up on. Maybe it's a matter of separating the art from the artist, or maybe I just can't let go. Regardless, if I ever do watch them in the future, it'll strictly be for entertainment value. Hi, Editing Bleebo here. I wanted to make a slight adjustment to my little spiel. When I wrote that part, I was genuinely under the impression that I wouldn't be able to break free from the habit of watching every new EFAP. It was then that I realized that my watching them had less to do with entertaining myself or trying to better myself as a critic, and more to do with satisfying what could best be described as an online addiction. I finally found the wherewithal to stop watching them after checking out their Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 stream. 
Holy Christ, their take was so bad. Seriously, guys, watching these people is bad for your brain, and bad for the sake of online film criticism. Every new like, view, or subscription they get is a disservice to everyone's time and intelligence. Please, don't be a part of the problem, people. I no longer value what these guys have to say about film analysis, and neither should you. I guarantee you that anyone, no matter how deeply entrenched in this vile fanbase they are, can have their minds changed after just looking into this matter with even the slightest amount of depth. Hell, all it took for me was just talking to Southpaw and SK. There's absolutely no reason why any of this had to happen to Southpaw. He's had to face harassment, disgusting accusations, and downright slander because of the lies that EFAP has spread, and they genuinely expect him to just let it all go and accept it. Their continuous silence on the matter is despicable, and unfortunately very well calculated. They're taking full advantage of the fact that this all spawned from a show that nobody's watched and is about a guy that a large swath of the fanbase already hated. Fuck them. None of you listening to this need to defend these scumbags. Genuinely, thank you all for listening to this. And thank you, Southpaw, for allowing me to share my perspective on the matter. I hope everyone hearing this has a lovely day. The members of the EFAP audience, whom I've spoken to on this matter, invariably will fall into one of two camps. There are those who are interested in treating a discussion about media seriously as they ever have, who do care about what the facts and the arguments are, and do truly believe that EFAP are equally subject to criticism and scrutiny as anyone they've ever criticized. I've spoken to a lot of them personally. You'll probably see them in the comment section as well. There's a second camp, however, which has been impossible to ignore, as small as it may be. It's a very vocal camp, one that doesn't care to listen to both sides of an argument, that refuses to engage with me beyond abusive ad hominem arguments and deflections like, oh, you're still not over this after two years? Spider-Man's about to come out! As if there's supposed to be a time limit on when it's okay to dissect a gish gallop with this many bad arguments, or when I have a right of reply after consistently catching flack from this particular camp of EFAP's audience over seriously distorted perceptions over what actually happened. Real solid counter-argument there. Like, I'm sorry, I thought these people had characterized me as some contrarian who blindly agreed with anything Mahler said. Why am I now being vilified for criticizing this objectively nonsensical hot take from Mahler in the name of defending something that my opinion on aligns with the vast majority of those who have seen it? some contrarian I've turned out to be, in the same manner I have done with others in the past. What, because it's taken me two years to get this video out? Do you guys not realize the truly staggering number of layers of insanity that I've been having to peel back, and how time-consuming it is to fetch references of this podcast being inconsistent with the standard they applied here to make these criticisms? Of course that's going to take a long time to highlight in a cohesive manner. That seems to be by design with these guys. But these same guys get irritated when all someone has to complain about them is their length. Or their one stream responding to Jenny Nicholson because it supposedly went for 11 hours. Or erroneously claiming that they just shriek about media being woke purely because of the politics of who they mingle with the most, when the reality is a bit more nuanced than that perception, which I'll even come out and say that for all of their issues, and there are many, is a frankly unwarranted claim. Well, particularly at the end, when we know the, the way to change everything is just go, oh, I just renounce my wish. Yeah, that's just, uh, as easy as that. Everything goes back to normal. <laughs> it's like, wait, I don't even... Mm, okay. Ah, uh, yes, things, the normal default normal state of this universe. Pedro Pascal still has an Asian child for some reason. Well, an Asian, Asian wife, woman. yeah. But that's never shown. Nothing, none of it's explained. None Plot of it's ever shown pretty, explained. I, I think that's a pretty reasonable inference that if your kid <laughs> no, is partially it Asian, it could have been adopted. It could have been, you know, the, but that's the because they difference. just wanted to, they just wanted to have diversity kid in for some reason. I don't care about having an Asian. I actually like that kid. None of it. At least yeah. show. At least just be consistent and show the fucking wife. Do they, I don't think let they ever do show the wife, right? Let right? her drop off the kid so we, so we understand. Otherwise, the you wife just left him because of his pursuit of, you know, fame and power. And yeah, I think... And all that stuff, I thought. I'd have to watch it again. I can't remember if there's lines for that about if they broke up because of his obsession with, like, making money and shit. I'm assuming that's just yeah, what... Yeah, but, but, he's, but the kid's still there. The kid still turns up. So he's got to get from A to B somehow. The kid? Yeah, his his son. His son doesn't live. Oh yeah, him, no, of course. He? The wife probably fucking ferries That's, him or whatever. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, just 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 have the wife drop him off, and then at least we've got a a, a bar. Wait, so you you said you'd be much happier if the wife dropped him off? If she was Asian. Yeah, yeah. At least just to be at least just to give a thread because it's just a bit jarring. Well, I assume because I know how humans work that if your kid is half Asian, then you had sex with an Asian. Maybe. Assuming you're not Asian, or else he'd be full Asian. But it don't, don't you just think it's weird? No. No. Wait, so <laughs> so I, 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 I don't, I, I don't know what the weird part is. I'm very lost. Uh, what, what, 
I just thought we don't have weird. visual confirmation weird. No, it's that the wife is it's, it's 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 when you're in it right. Okay, we look. We're dealing in this this weird superhero world uh, that's a pseudo '80s that isn't the '80s at all because it's '84 and half the stuff in it in it came after '84. But never mind, don't worry okay. about that. The stuff like the video games and all that sort of banana yeah. stuff. Then we have a monkey paw uh, type of crystal which is giving uh, wishes off, and we don't understand the concept of the wishes because they seem to alternate per person. So there's no benchmark. Uh, for us to, to 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 establish what the rules of that is, we've got a Steve Trevor walking around in a different man's body as Steve Trevor, and we've got people confused as to whether they can see Steve Trevor or whether they can see Handsome Man. And then we've got this. And then Pedro Pascal's kid just turns up, and it's just an Asian kid. It's just like, can you just at least show some threads to connect? I I, I, don't I, I guess I, the problem is that like to me this is kind of like baffling because yeah i don't like, get it yeah like i i i'm <laughs> like if you're like if major pascal has a kid who's asian it means that he had sex with an asian woman do you know that you don't know that well but it wouldn't I, matter you if know he... what i don't you're right. you know what i don't know that but i have an extremely high level of justifiable confidence that that is the case yeah yeah well but, to... you, but we we to make it's sure, right? Yeah. I'm, just, I'm just saying it's weird, and it's weird, and it's and it's just should be. I don't know, that's the how film people is work, though. On too many levels for me. I mean, America's a good old melting pot, right? Like, uh, it's not going to be unusual. Yep. I, I don't know. I, I can, I can at least understand that you're saying um, there's a there's a moment there where you might assume it's the film trying to tell me something uh, that's not. It's it's not exactly the same skin color as Pedro Pascal, therefore something else may have happened. But I mean, I don't think it's much confusion to just be like, oh, it's just an Asian wife. Or adoption, either one. Well, I mean, it's, yeah. well, yeah, exactly. Because, like, if ever if ever you just see a kid and, like, they look a little bit different from their parent, two assumptions is the other parent is a different race or, alternatively, that they were adopted. It's, like, neither of all totally, like, that, that completely scans for me. <laughs> I just, I just think, it's, I think it's weird. I just think it's a weird thing to do without explanation. Um, I mean, I, I don't think you have to explain in a movie that if people from two different races have a kid, the kid will be mixed race. The kid will be mixed. Yeah, yeah. Don't you feel like you wouldn't want it to be that way? Like you wouldn't want them to overtly be like, the reason he's not the same skin color as I is my wife here is. <laughs> no, <laughs> I, like, I, just, I just like, I like uh, just a bit of continuity. That's all. I like, I like a bit of continuity. No break in how, continuity. Is this, how is this a break in continuity? It's, it's, I'm, not, I'm not saying it ruins the film. I'm not saying it ruins the film. I'm just I, saying the whole thing's so weird. The film, anyway, in itself is so inconsistent and weird uh, that it just would have been nice to have just, to, you know, just have the wife drop in. Sorry, the ex wife. Just have the ex-wife or the ex-girlfriend, whichever relationship it was, just dropping them off, or at least some sort of explanation that just makes you go, "Why is he just? Why has he got an Asian kid now?" He's always I, had I the guess, Asian kid. Yeah. <laughs> or at least well, in this. Or, or, or why is he? Whatever. Okay. Well, I guess I guess for me it would be the fundamental of like I don't need an explanation for why somebody is like the race that they are because usually yeah, it will be I don't need to see the conception to fill in the yeah, blanks. I I'm, could understand. I'm not asking for conception. I'm just asking for some, some logic in the film because the film is so devoid of of logic. I just but want some logical, logical threads to, to go through it. But, but why is illogical. it illogical that his his kid looks the way that he does? I don't. Know. But you don't know. Right. No, but you, but you but you see you no because you're now you are making the illogical assumption. You're making your assumption. Yes. Not logic. You're making Wait, the assumption. You're not. You're not working off what the film has provided for you. Correct. Yes, um, but, the, but the thing is, when say, for example, Max, it's the montage of him talking to Wonder Woman, and then he enters his building. Would you understand if I said I need to see him driving in order to see him get to these two Just places? About to use that example. No, that, that's, that's, I think like... they're complete, completely different things. Completely I disagree. different things. I think altogether. they're exactly the same. But well, why? Why do you think uh, that they're meaningfully different? Because, because Max is an adult, and we've, it's it's normal to assume that he can drive a car. It's it's the and child bit. Other women. All right, I mean, disagree. <laughs> fine, you know, you don't have to. I'm not asking for an agreement here. Oh, yeah, I mean, you, you you find Asian I women think hot, right? It's really fucking silly in a yeah. film that's devoid of logic, that doesn't make a lot of sense any way through the film. 
that you just keep putting these silly these what I would class as silly little things for with no explanation given. Oh, well, like uh, most uh, well, and, and, it just, down and it to... operates on too many levels because you know the woman has to be like Diana, but then she becomes like Wonder Woman, and then it just makes her want to beat up men that hit on her. Um, you know, it's it's all these weird things that just don't make a logical sense. Um, I want all your oil. Oh, I'll take your security guards instead for oil. Now here's a wall that's... It's, the things that they're I, asking for don't make any logical sense. Yeah, I mean, I would I would agree with all that, but, like, I didn't... To be honest, I didn't even realize that the kid wasn't of the same ethnicity as Pedro Pascal. Like, I didn't... I never I didn't even thought about it. Well, because yeah, I... I just, yeah. about the Asian kid, I had no idea what you were talking about. Well, first. one of my compliments to the film is actually their relationship. I enjoyed it. Uh... I, I like it. Yeah, I, feel, like I still this this tells you something. I still remember that he was encouraging the kid to make a wish for themselves, and they made a wish for the dad's life to be better. And he even Pedro Pascal goes, no, 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 no. Like when because he's asking the kid to do what in his heart he wants. I remember finding that quite meaningful that a child would automatically yeah. try and look out for their parent. And it's just like mm. when when you when you, Pedro wanted him to be more selfish. It's it's like I like that payoff quite a bit. Um, I yeah I I didn't really care like what ethnicity that the child is. I was just more concerned about what, uh... Yeah, I we know how human, we know how weird and, and he got blown up out of real portion. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway. All right, back to high top. Moving, moving on. What does Az have to do with Terriers? Southpaw running the guilt by association crap that SK put in his shitty video. Looking forward to it though, it will be the most sour grapes spiteful video ever. Also I hope all ad revenue from the vid goes to your hospital's bills and they say I argue in bad faith. Look, two things can be true at the same time. What these anti-woke grifters are regularly barking about doesn't cross any serious moral line for these guys as it might for a regular person. And they're not always pushing back on them in the manner that I just put my six hour long critique on pause for a solid eight minutes to showcase that they sometimes do. But they don't shriek about media being woke just because they regularly play footsie with the ones who do. At the same time, it just so happens that they are signaling to the viewers of those types that they are welcome in their audience. And... These aren't the types of people who are genuinely interested in mounting an argument that is any more sophisticated than making fun of someone's health issues or a loss of a parent. The EFAP hosts themselves might put up a facade of good faith that's convincing to someone who doesn't think to look under the surface, but they sure are drawing in a lot of fans who would much rather attack a person's character than their arguments. And it does not seem like the hosts, or anyone who moderates their Discord server, or their subreddit, are willing to condemn these sorts of people. And until they do, the good eggs that are in their audience, who make up that first camp I described, they will suffer the consequences which will come from the reputation which this podcast has garnered for itself, which they really don't seem to care about doing anything to fix. Uh, I've heard some praise for the family and like his dad, Uncle Pendejo, Bendejo, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Rudy. George Lopez's character is named Rudy. He's not only consistently helpful and supportive to Jaime, but also he's the only relative of Jaime's whose name is repeated like a double digit number of times. I could understand if one doesn't remember the names of any other member of the family, but given what I've just outlined, and how phonetically dissimilar this is from the Spanish word for a stupid asshole, forgive me if I'm not seeing what's so funny or how this could be an honest mistake. Fuck me for trying to give him the benefit of the doubt, am I right? Uncle I really Uncle hate that man. <laughs> we will, uh, on the next EFAP, we're going to check out the XQC uh, Ethan debate. We we're going to have Dark Viper on. I'm afraid that is uh, an impossibility now. So I don't know how to talk about this exactly. So there is a podcast called Every Frame A Pause that is well known for like having like 11 hour podcasts where they break down a another piece of media. Why does this involve me? Um, the main dude who runs it, Mola or Mueller, depending upon how you want it pronounced, he says he doesn't mind. Um, he emailed me and he was like, hey, you want to come on? I'm, I'm like, you know, I'm tired and maybe not thinking straight. I'm like, oh, that's flattering to be invited onto a podcast. Sure, man. Why not? I don't get invited onto a lot of things, chat. I'm a somewhat of a controversial figure. Those who know me, like me, 
Those who don't, don't, <laughs> you know? So like being invited on something is flattering. So I was like, yeah, man, absolutely, uh, let, let's do it. And then we start talking and he's like, yeah, so it'll be uh, 4 a.m. your time. And I was like, oh, 4 a.m.? Coincidentally, like the polar opposite of a good time for me, given how my sleeping pattern was. Like I would have been, to do that podcast, I would have had to have been up for like 14 to 16 hours or something, then start the podcast. And the podcast usually goes for like six hours. So I was like, oh, uh, and even worse than that, it was three days from that email and I had two other collabs set up for particular times. One being with Bruffy for something for his channel and one with uh, Lank for my channel with GTA Guessa. And even then I was like, yeah, let's, let's see how this works out. He's like, look, you can come on next week and, um, you know, we can, we can talk or whatever and see what happens. And I was like, do I really want to do this? He seems like a nice dude. And I, I, I had already said yes. So I'm like, yeah, okay, fine. Uh, I, I'll keep, I'll keep moving my sleeping pattern. And by the time it rolls around for a week from now, I can wake up at 4am. And every single day I had to wake up and convince myself not to say no. <laughs> and so obviously I was very hesitant, but for like, up until today. So how many days was that like? Um, up until yesterday. So up until yesterday, which was like four days since I was meant to go on. Um, I ended up saying, look, I, I can't do it. You know, I've changed my mind. The reason this why, is happening. Don't worry, Mahler, I'll come on. I'll, I'll, come I'll on. bring Rex on. Um, I'll come well, on to yeah. our podcast and talk about it. Scheduling issues and things getting in the way. You know how oh. it goes. Um, unfortunate, but. I end up saying, look, I, I can't do it. You know, I've changed my mind. And a big reason for that is when I finally spoke publicly and said, look, guys, I'm going to be on this podcast. Is there any reason I shouldn't be? I received quite a few DMs from people um, expressing concern about some of the guests that the podcast had had on before, some of the things that the hosts or frequent guests have said in the past, not just on the, the podcast, but also um, on other social medias, clearly representing them as not really being aligned with my own politics. But when it comes to my brands, my associations, my public ones, um, there's obviously a risk that any association I make can come back to bite me later on. I'm very skittish when it comes to putting myself into situations where something can get clipped out of context and I'll have to listen to it forever, you know? Um, and when it comes to judging them for things that they've said, um, in many cases, sure, there could be context in which what they, what any of these people said wasn't particularly that bad. Um, and it's just been, you know, thrown around, thrown around by people who don't like them. But there were other stuff where I was like, yeah, there's no context that can really make this good. Um, and so while I was, I was already hesitant as to whether or not I was going to go on. Uh, and then when I saw all this stuff, received all these messages, I was like, so what, what I'm, I'm risking my brands to go out of my comfort zone to potentially risk something going wrong or whatever to reach a very small amount of people, many of whom will already agree with me anyway. As much as this dude seems like a nice guy, uh, I, I don't think I should be doing this. This doesn't make much sense, you know? Um, which sucks, you know? And so it's clear that for a wide portion of the internet, this podcast has a negative reputation. For example, um, in the Hassan video, um, the um, How a Socialist Made Capitalism Worse, one of the things that Hassan talks about is this something, is this thing that he calls a Nazi kill stream. And I had no idea what he was talking about there. Of, except that I was informed that this is nonsense and just Hassan talking shit as he always does, just lying to protect himself. But the podcast he was talking about was every frame of pause. Is that a correct assessment? No. These people aren't Nazis. I mean, I'm, I would be surprised if there hadn't been a sink Given may the political leanings of the people on the podcast, I would be surprised if it had never had a Nazi on it at some point. But clearly everyone on it isn't a Nazi, nor has every guest been a Nazi. It is not a Nazi kill stream. That's insane.
The reason this why is, is happening is an impossible. Don't worry, Mahler, I'll come on. Scheduling issues and things getting in the way, you know how oh. it goes. Liar! As for their frustrations that all people seem to criticize them for is their length or their stream about the clown movie, these frustrations are valid. These aren't solid arguments by any stretch of the imagination. Sure, the side-by-side -side comparison of a 30-minute video about the clown movie and the nearly 12-hour livestream that is titled a response to that video, on its face, looks pretty funny. And I can see why people who don't like these guys are eager to rag on them for it. The problem is, if you actually watch that stream, you'll find that it isn't really 11 hours of them whining about a woman not liking Joker. It's three hours of responding to a not very well argued take on a movie, which makes arguments a bit like the one I played earlier in this video, with a whole host of other subjects covered in the other eight hours of the stream. Mahler and EFAP's fans really don't like having their entire viewpoint overly reduced by people who clearly aren't working off of complete information, and I can sympathize with that. I think that really sucks. Which is why I'm baffled as to why so many of EFAP's fans, who have not watched the show, nor would have any idea what the substance of my contentions with EFAP's criticisms of the show are, are eager to reduce my viewpoint on all of this. From one that is concerned with legitimately bad faith arguments about a piece of media that I happen to care about, as well as some unapologetic rape denialism, to one that isn't meaningfully different from ending a friendship with them because they fairly criticize some awful movie or TV show, and I just couldn't handle a simple disagreement when you can literally look at a watch party in which I'm not losing my cool at all, despite Mahler and Fringy doing their absolute best to escalate the conflict by clearly talking down to me instead of reciprocating the respect I was offering their viewpoint. You can look at where I literally said that it's fine that they don't like the show, where it's clear that they took huge offense to what I said here, even after making far more scathing snipes against me prior to that, sandwiched in between a whole lot of just outright lies to their audience, one of which included vilifying a rape victim, and in response to the this thread immediately launched into doubling down about it on their server and posting deceptively edited clips to support their narrative. These people have unironically done exactly what they complain about when they get dogged on over that Jenny Nicholson stream. They haven't done any of their own research. They haven't looked into this matter with any depth. They just see a conflict between someone that they don't like and someone that they do like, and they just immediately jump to a truly delusional conclusion about it and cling to it like their entire life depends on it. And then they blame me for not being able to move on from this two years later. So, what's it going to be? Are these guys subject to substantive criticism when they botch the references and do a disservice to what they talk about, and to their audience who now might miss out on something that's a major cut above the sludge they usually wade through, as they have requested in their own scripted content? Are their dissidents allowed the time it takes to offer that substantive criticism, or do you want nobody to give your arguments any serious consideration and just make the same weak sauce deflections you normally get? Because you can't have it both ways. Now, I'd like to clarify that if you are a fan of EFAP who actually argues in good faith and will at least hold off on making vicious attacks like this until the other person has basically drawn first blood, what I'm about to say is not about you. It's about the second camp of EFAP fans I've just described. But this is largely for people who have been subjected to their animosity and cruelty. Because there's no way I could be the only person on Earth who has ever been targeted by them. And if you have been, I know how easy it is for all this animosity and cruelty to get to you. So I'm going to try to summarize it in a way that I really needed to hear a long time ago. EFAP's fans will often insist that what they are about is discussing media with each other. It seems to be the thing that's brought them all together because they all have a genuine passion for certain kinds of media, and for whatever reason, EFAP is what really resonated with them. However, there's a problem which becomes immediately apparent once they stop engaging with other viewpoints in good faith. This is not discourse. This is rage. This is the behavior of someone who has no real interest in putting in the effort that it takes to deserve being taken seriously, who's just resentful over their lack of whatever it is they desire in life, who has some perhaps deserved insecurities about their own intelligence, who need an outlet for their addiction to rage, who need a sense of belonging, and who feel the need to tear other people down in order to make them feel better about themselves. And they happen to have found all of those things in EFAP, which then makes any serious criticism of EFAP come across as a personal attack. Which is probably why I'm seeing so many people who are willing to, free of charge, make these insane defenses for EFAP that you couldn't pay me enough money in the world to make, even for someone who actually knows me, let alone some incompetent e-celeb I only have a parasocial relationship with. No one who is a slightly well-adjusted person, who is actually happy with their lives, acts in this manner. Some of them may be able to see the light one day, but as mentioned before, I've been at this for around two years now, 
and my energy in dealing with these people has been beyond expended. This video is really my last effort in trying to help people out of this cult that is just poisonous to not just their brains, but to their souls. And some people are going to just be too far gone to heed whatever advice I have to say and are beyond saving. And they really are going to waste away their existence making their own lack of emotional intelligence, or regular intelligence, everyone else's problem, and sending their money to grifters who don't really have anything worthwhile to say about art, but rather just take advantage of these suckers addiction to rage the next time that you start feeling like they're really getting to you try to remember that their efforts to tear you down are really just a method of distracting themselves and others that deep down they are just some of the most pitiful people in existence and you're not really obligated to help them out of that my own personal experiences with these people have taught me that you can't force them to stop being miserable and wanting to drag other people down with them they need to actually want for themselves to know that they don't have to be this way. Now, regardless of which of these two camps you may fall into as a fan of Mahler and his podcast, one thing I feel confident in assuming is that, for you, it seemed utterly uncharacteristic of Mahler to get things factually incorrect to this degree at this frequency, and I've not only experienced the absolute shock that comes with realizing that this guy is really no less fallible than anyone else, and doesn't seem to argue his points in good faith, but I've also seen others have this pedestal that they had placed him on shattered upon looking into this. Especially because because this one really bad take about this one obscure show is typically just the first domino that falls that gets them to realize that this is not just an isolated incident, but rather symptomatic of a much deeper issue, or set of issues that makes him and his friends just all around mediocre at what they set out to do, even if you can look past how needlessly hostile and mean-spirited they tend to be. And I'd like to urge the folks who are watching this video because they've always hated Mahler and they've always hated his friends and they've always thought these guys just aren't good critics to understand why this was not so transparent for a lot of other people. I mentioned at the start of this that I used to be friends with these guys. I used to talk with them a lot about media, and I've spent a fair amount of time looking back on some of these discussions I've had with them, and I think the one that's left the deepest impression on me was their coverage of James Gunn's The Suicide Squad. The last EFAP that I appeared on, not including the third anniversary, was going through the film scene by scene and discussing it and what worked and what didn't. And I can recall that Mahler had in fact watched the movie at least twice before that stream, probably even three times, and he seemed to to have had notes about the film ready for that stream. And I didn't recall any major factual inaccuracies in those notes beyond possibly minor errors that anyone could make. Nothing as gross as what happened with Terriers, and what has happened with other media he's covered since. It's so strange how that stream was just a couple of weeks before everything appeared to unravel, because the Mauler I've seen from his coverage of Guardians of the Galaxy 3, the Batman, and a handful of other things that I think he's simply wildly missed the mark on, seems like an entirely different person. The most charitable reading that I can offer for why this is happening is that he is covering way too much content, most of which he just doesn't care about. And no one is obligated to care about every single thing that they watch, but by that same token, you're not obligated to have a really strong opinion on things that you just don't care for either. And in fact, I think it is foolish to force it instead of just saying that it wasn't really your cup of tea. That Mahler is not competent enough to cover as much as he seems to want to does not mean he cannot ever make a good point or have a good take. It just means that he is not staying in his lane, because the reality is that I would be really incompetent at criticizing certain genres that I don't care for, like horror or musicals. I watched The Sandlot for the first time with my friend Evan, and I didn't care for it that much. I didn't think that it was terrible or poorly constructed, I just didn't vibe with it. So if I were to then go on a rant for 45 minutes about how awful I think The Sandlot was, I doubt I could make any particularly strong arguments for why it is poorly constructed, and it would just be a lot of super subjective points that you could probably also easily highlight where I'm being inconsistent with other perfectly competent or even less competent children's media that I have a soft spot for. Mahler and his friends have effectively conned hundreds of thousands of people into thinking they are far more reliable than the average critic. But that's largely because it isn't that hard to pick apart what they usually target. Sure, they can accurately pick apart the Book of Boba Fett, Kenobi, and quo po 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 Sorry, Quantumania. So fucking what? I'm not impressed with your marksmanship if the only time you aren't holding the gun sideways and looking away as you're shooting is when your target is 10 feet in front of you. And you know what? If you want to go after easy targets for entertainment value, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Just know your limits. Back in 2018 when he made his videos on The Last Jedi, Mahler said this. You shouldn't really make requests for films outside of maybe Star Wars episodes because I'm, I'm only good at certain things and that's what I stick to. I still talk about Terriers because it's a show I am passionate about and can talk about until I am blue in the 
the face. Even if it isn't going to get me as many subscribers as it would if I yammered about Star Wars once a week for 10 hours. But the reality is that as obscure or niche as this is, I'm good at talking about it. And I'd much rather stick to that than expand to talking about most media, including a bunch of things I'm frankly not qualified to judge fairly. And I think most, if not all, people are like this to some degree. We all have things we are passionate about and things we don't care for at all. There are acclaimed movies I've watched but just haven't really engaged with. But at least I know better than to give some half-baked, objective, hot take about them. I'd rather just be honest and say it wasn't my cup of tea. If I want to actually get involved in real discussions about them, I force myself to rewatch and this time pay closer attention. Mahler's decision to drift out of his lane has led to him making some seriously questionable arguments that don't hold up all that well to scrutiny, which would be one thing if he could at least acknowledge when he's being biased. But he doesn't do that anymore, even though he said in the past, The major problem is how many fucking bias these people have. Total Biscuit nailed it in an early December video. Every reviewer has bias. If you can identify it and wear it on your shoulder as you explore the information, you will be doing a service to the critical analysis on YouTube. But no, people would prefer to spout an opinion, shove it down your throat until you agree or just ignore you. Nowadays, he insists that he wasn't biased at all when he watched Terriers, meaning he either knew he was full of shit when he was making the arguments he was making, or he is both stupid and spectacularly unaware of when he is being biased. Pick your fucking poison, I guess. But you know what? I could still have a glimmer of respect for him if he was willing to accept when people make valid criticisms of him. But he doesn't do that. Look no further than how he is bound to ignore this video. My final summation here is that nobody's calling these people on their shit, and when they do, they're ignored. Similarly to probably what this is gonna happen to this video. This sucks, and I hope it changes. Ultimately, I offered to speak to Harris and Folding Ideas several times, but I was denied or ignored at every turn, and judging from this encounter, all I can say is that I think both of them aren't interested in discussion. Anything that is critical of things they love, or critical of themselves, they're just happy to echo chamber it right out, and I suppose it's offensive to try and burst that bubble. Honestly, if I ever get to their level of fame, I hope you guys hold me to a better standard than their fan bases hold them, because this whole thing was embarrassing to read through, as well as really disheartening in terms of... Wow, is this what fame does to people? Yet, he wants to run a podcast that is largely dedicated to criticizing not only movies, TV shows, and video games, but also other content creators, and they don't exactly make good-natured arguments much of the time. So right away, I like how he doesn't mention my name, conflates me with a bunch of other people, and downplays the fuck out of my Hulk video. People are making videos about it now, because like it's like, oh, I'll explain to you guys what's wrong, as if any of us don't know. Well, apparently not, because none of you made any such videos, and half a million people flock to my tiny 200 subscriber channel and graciously thank me for making this. This is also Rich, coming from the guy who who has nearly 24 hours of footage dedicated to breaking down Multiverse of Madness. The problems with that film aren't exactly hard to find. This unflattering introduction is a pretty big red flag that will indicate how the rest of this breakdown will go. They did not come here with good intentions. You could have provided context by saying this was the first video from a small channel. You could have pointed out that this isn't the best reflection of my work, and I have far better videos out there, including my She-Hulk series, which was performing super well at that time. But no, instead you paint me in a negative light before the breakdown even starts. The end result is a podcast that loves to criticize people, oftentimes extremely harshly, and grandstand about why people ought to internalize criticism, even if it's harsh. But also they can't stop saying things that warrant valid criticism, while also struggling to accept criticism where it is valid even if worded much more gingerly than what they will eagerly dole out onto others on a regular basis. This level of self-awareness and openness to critique is lost on these pseudo-intellectual fucks. Contrary to what everyone says, I've always said it's fine that EFAP doesn't like this show. It's not everyone's cup of tea, and I know that. I've had to deal with their fanbase who have not seen the show or the criticisms for themselves, assuming that I just thought that the show was above scrutiny, or that EFAP are not allowed to not like it. I've said from the beginning, it's perfectly fine that they don't like the show. But acting as if all that they said was that they didn't like it is some preposterous horse shit, because that acts as though when they were asked what they thought of it, all they went was, ah, it wasn't really our cup of tea. We can see why others would like it though. But that's not what they did now is it? They ripped into the show with inaccurate criticisms from their live stream, during which they took quite clear digs at both me and my other friend, SK. He fucking I don't care. likes terriers. I don't hey. care what he has. <laughs> I'm not saying that it's the case, but maybe if, I don't know, people who maybe try and brand themselves on the idea of having hot takes and I'm the one who discovered this and I'm the one who really showed the world what the truth is. I don't know. Maybe if you're not good enough to justify that title you've given yourself, it will... I don't know. You know what? I might have some wonky bad takes rags, but at least they come from an honest place and don't rely on purposefully omitting context. Look what you guys need to mimic a fraction of my power. Just don't ignore the portions that would stand in the way of your argument. Yeah, you can't cut out something that would make your argument weak or outright contradicted. And if you yeah. do that, that is dishonest of you. 
I thought that this thread would prevent me from having to either lie about agreeing with their criticisms when asked about it by some person in chat on whatever the next ETH app I was going to be on, or risk starting some stupid drama by prompting an argument with them on stream, when I've already seen what it is like to be on the receiving end of their bad faith tactics. In a better world, we could have just not brought up the subject with each other again until I could have constructively criticized their arguments, perhaps in a much more gentle manner than I took in this video. A courtesy I would have extended to them because even after everything I'd been through in private, and the distress that was caused by it, I still tried not to let this be some silly catalyst for my friendships with these guys to dissolve, but apparently this wasn't enough, and I don't know what it was that I could have done that would have satisfied them. Regardless of how I initially had a harsh reaction to how dishonest they were, I did my very best to try to prevent this from erupting, which was why this thread was worded more gently than I think they deserved. I could have torn into them for making these absurd arguments, but I didn't. I told people it was fine for them to not like the show. I told people not to pester them or harass them. I just said I thought they had a bad take because they did have a bad take. Every single one of their last goddamn arguments about the show, and there are many they unleashed on me, is either based on some major misread in how the show frames its main characters, or exaggerating and leaving out context that should be impossible to miss if they were actually paying attention as they insist they did, in order to make them go from being morally gray into villainous, which they've called others liars over similarly extreme omissions of context, but not quite severe as what they left out here at several points. That it only took them 16 minutes to run to their echo chamber and have this huge cope session about what I had said and further twist the show out of context to their fans while I wasn't in their server is beyond indefensible, as well as the fact that after I thought we had cleared the air, that perhaps they could have done anything to quash this false narrative about me that they got off the ground. But six months passed, and they didn't. If only the EFAP hosts, or the community at large, were capable of arguing with me about this show in good faith, then all of this could have been avoided. But they aren't because they would rather live in their fantasy reality that they're right all the time. And to that end, they will resort to gaslighting and character assassination, and the majority of their fans seem content with treating the EFAP hosts with kid gloves, while interpreting every single thing I do in the worst faith light imaginable. Even when I was trying not to attack them. Even when they had started by attacking me. Don't really know how else you can read, they don't seem to understand this character was raped, and then transform that statement into EFAP are rape apologists! So here we are. Will we just talk for a second? Just you and me? Just talk? Look who showed up! You ain't even the shit no more! Ugh. I don't care if they don't like a fucking TV show. I do care, however, if they misrepresent media to make it look worse than it really is, to an audience of people who wouldn't have seen this obscure show. But mere media illiteracy pales in comparison to their potent mixture of obstinance, belligerence, and dishonesty that bleeds into how they speak to people. EFAP are not bad critics because they don't like a stupid TV show from 13 years ago. EFAP are bad critics because they engage with media in bad faith, and when anyone in their circle bothers to correct them, they throw an enormous shit fit and dismiss why people might be aggravated with their criticisms or their approach to discussions by deflecting and insisting that you must just be incapable of emotionally reconciling flaws in your favorite media, something they clearly have no leg to stand on to lecture others about. It's also quite worrying that they admitted themselves that they engaged with the show just as they would with anything else. Jesus, if that's not a great way to make me question the veracity of numerous hot takes of theirs that I used to agree with. Perhaps I was too harsh to Spider-Man 2 or Batman the Animated Series when I was trying to emulate them more. Their coverage of Peacemaker, The Batman, The Banshees of Inna Sharon, Avatar The Last Airbender, and now Terriers, are great indicators of what happens when these guys aren't just going after the low-hanging fruit. When they're being challenged by someone who is obviously wrong or dishonest, they have no problem with engaging with them and exposing them for the fools that they are. For all my issues with EFAP, you're not going to be seeing me taking Synthetic Man's side over them anytime soon, or Hassan Pikers. They have no problem with dealing with actually dishonest people, but when it's someone who can actually call them on their bullshit, well, that person's just dishonest. They're not worth paying any attention to. And because most of their fan base isn't going to hold them accountable when they get the facts wrong, this is only going to continue. And they're going to keep digging in their heels and smugly laughing at people when they try to respond in good faith as they're blasted with a fire hose of nonsense from EFAP, asking questions like a machine gun in order to convince you that they actually have a case, questions that do not account for various details that are present in the text. For people who are supposedly all about criticizing media with accurate references, they sure are shit at their jobs when they don't have themselves an easy target. It comes across to me as people who've built their brand on picking things apart for various kinds of inconsistencies, who feel the need to prove that they can find them where they aren't really there, because when your only tool is a hammer, everything begins to look like a nail. Now, I cannot force you to stop watching EFAP. That is entirely up to you. I cannot force you to stop valuing their opinions. That is entirely up to you. The one thing that I hope that anyone watching this comes away with, whether or not they keep watching EFAP, 
is that you shouldn't just take them at their word on things you haven't seen. Or at the very least, if someone begins disputing their claims, maybe don't get involved and automatically take EFAP's side without first watching the media that's being discussed. And if you have seen what they are talking about, don't assume that their take is stronger or more thoroughly thought out than yours. Think for yourself before then parroting one of their talking points, because if they could fuck up to this degree while discussing a show, then where else could they fuck up? Or, if living in the real world is too much for you to bear, you could be a good little consumer. And you could continue deluding yourself into thinking that these guys are good enough at what they do to be trusted and taken at their word. And just pretend that all the concrete evidence that suggests otherwise doesn't exist. All because you simply find them entertaining. But I urge people to have a taste and call a spade a spade instead of eating what people say and fundamentally saying shit like, you're the greatest YouTuber in history. And then join in on their whinging about modern blockbuster franchises going down the shitter because of the preponderance of those who've chosen to settle for mediocrity just because they find it entertaining. Without even a vague hint of self awareness. Fuck uh, me, you will clap at anything. Don't ask questions, just consume EFAP and get excited for more EFAP. Only respond to the dick sucking comments and then ignore any kind of critique and rinse and fucking repeat. Criticizing media with accurate references was EFAP's proclaimed bread and butter, respectively. But if you ask me, the accuracy of their analysis these days feels thin, sort of stretched, like butter scraped over too much bread. It ain't getting above a three. <laughs> you fucking struggle. Dude, at, at best a three, but I'm leaning towards a two. Um, Batwoman? Yeah, yeah, well, I'd rather watch Batwoman. That's fun and entertaining. Yeah, and you, at least you got Jacob. That's yeah, true. well, yeah, and, and you occasionally get, like, a good scene. In, in Batwoman. Very, 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 very occasional. Oh, well, yeah, like but two. Still. Like one per season. There was that one scene we liked in Terriers where a character finally called a character out for being wife. a piece of shit. That was nice. Yeah. Right, that, that was nice, yeah. We really got that the well, one time. He had been, it's nowhere near Batwoman levels. Yes, it is. Maybe they mean Batwoman's better. It's like, well, maybe. Oh, well, yeah, in that <laughs> case, there's, again, Batwoman is entertaining. I mean, the show is mainly about the lore. And it fucks all of that up. Batwoman jumps between all kinds of things. Yeah. And like, there there Batwoman are times of Batwoman. To have something to say as well about you know the world. Well, yeah, we've even appreciated but, sometimes uh, Batwoman will have like a thematic throughline in an episode about something. Yeah. Like what's you? Not great most of the time, but occasionally there's like something there. Something <laughs> to draw out of the mire. The bog. Perhaps it's for the best that they just stick to things that aren't any more complex than Batwoman, from now on. And that concludes the main meat of the video. I've used the long to slaughter the long. Now is the time for some housekeeping. Starting off, as much as I hate to do this, I'm going to do a little bit of e-begging. I only care about money, after all. In all seriousness, though, I experienced an unforeseen medical emergency at the beginning of this year. While I was at work, I had a stroke which destroyed my ability to physically balance. Now, as far as I know, the cause of this was purely physiological. I was told it was caused by an artery in my neck being severed by a chiropractic adjustment. In first grader terms, I had my neck popped to the wrong way and it almost killed me. Anyways, I started out this year being in about $8,000 worth of medical debt, and I don't exactly make enough money to pay that off very easily on top of basic expenses. I can't tell you how often I'll be able to make content either via live streams or fully scripted and edited videos like this one. So I don't really like to ask people for money under the pretense that it will drive me to make more content, especially because I enjoy doing this sort of content as a sort of passion project rather than looking at it as a job. However, I would like to not have to worry about paying off medical bills for the next three years so if you enjoyed this video and would like to lend a helping hand, there is a GoFundMe link in the description. I have a goal of only $8,000, and everything donated up to that point will be going to paying off these medical expenses. Only give what you feel like you can. If you can only spare a dollar, that's appreciated, and if you don't have any change to spare, I understand completely. As for future content, I've got a number of plans I would like to see through. I have a script for a video on Civil War I've been working on for a while now, and I haven't aborted my interest in giving Batman the Animated Series a critical breakdown. Fair warning, I don't think much of it is very good, although I've been wanting to revisit the show to see if perhaps I was watching it in bad faith as EFAP were with Terriers. I don't have any qualms with having a hot take, so long as it's rooted in fair criticism. I also have a bit of a hot take on HBO's The Last of Us, and would like to explain why I think it is a much poorer execution of the story that was told in a video game that I'm quite partial to. Especially when the most prominent voices of dissent against it are these cringe far-right grifters who care more about the show's perceived wokeness rather than 
anything I actually give a fuck about. Yeah, those guys aren't affiliated with me. Oh yeah. I guess this is as good a place as any to warn any prospective subscribers that I'm quite reputable for having hot takes on some beloved media and not being too shy to talk about them, even if it might piss some people off. I promise I'm not trying to troll you if I'm being really critical about widely celebrated content, even content which means something personally to you. I'm just trying to be honest and consistent about what I've criticized and other things, and I happen to enjoy talking more about where I've got an alternative perspective to most people. I just think that's more interesting than regurgitating whatever opinion you can get from most YouTubers. Exploring different perspectives on art is fun, is it not? I've also got plans for something exciting with Shiv and Jolly. It's a bit early in the process to reveal exactly what it is, but if you've enjoyed the cut of our jib on the handful of times I gave them the mic in this video, you might find this news exciting. So stay tuned on that front. There's a bunch of people dining at a table. At the head of the table are Jack Black and Lizzo, whose names I refuse to learn. I'm just going <laughs> to call them Jack Black and Lizzo throughout well, this I, just, I, mean, I remember. I remember his name only because of the beer advert in the UK that shared the name. I don't yeah. remember Lizzo's character's name. I was like, there used to be an advert. Does Lizzo's character literally not have a name? What? <laughs> hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. I'm looking what's up now. We go stars. Mandalorian name. No, she's just the Duchess. That's just her name. No way. Whoa. That could actually just be lit. That could actually just be Lizzo. <laughs> Duchess Lizzo. Duchess Lizzo. <laughs> Duchess Lizzo. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> and so, at long last, this video has finally reached its end. I would like to shout out both SK and Sheev Talks for helping edit together this beast. Without them, I don't know how much longer it would have taken me to get this out. Links to their channels are in the description. I also owe some personal thanks to Madvocate, The Jolly Chap, Blebo Daggins, Dominic the Donkey, and Synthwine for the various contributions they made to this video. I would also like to give a special shout out to Posidon for their illustrations of the two worms discussion between Jolly and Sheev. And finally, I would like to thank you and all the other viewers who clicked on this and made it this far into the video, for lending me an open ear in spite of whatever pre-existing inhibitions about me you may have had. Hopefully this can prompt a productive conversation about how we engage with media and how wise it is to place blind trust in others, even those who seem reliable. Stay safe, and I'll see you when the next video rolls out. In episode 8 of Terriers, Brit gets taken across the border to Mexico. Under duress, which isn't enough to get you off the hook for a lot of crimes, Brit gets himself arrested for assault, breaks out of prison, aids in the assault of a police officer, steals evidence from lockup pertaining to a major investigation, and proceeds to give that evidence to a criminal organization. With the assistance of a police officer and an unlicensed PI, Brit sneaks back into America by hiding in the boot of Gustafson's car. Nobody checked the car at the border. It's over for Brit. The Mexican police know who he is. They know what crimes he's committed. Mexico has an extradition treaty with the United States. As soon as he pops back on the radar in the United States, he's going to be arrested and shipped off to Mexico, where he'll probably spend the rest of his life in prison. Hank is also likely to go to prison for aiding and abetting, and Gustafson will be very lucky if he only lost his job. This is all assuming that the car isn't checked at the border, which it would have been, even if it belonged to a police officer, since Border Patrol is of a different jurisdiction at which point all three of them would have been stopped, arrested, and sent to prison. At the end of episode 13, after Britt has received a very light sentence for nearly beating a man to death, Hank suggests that Britt not go to prison for one year, but instead flee to Mexico. If Hank and Britt try to get across the border, they'd be stopped, because it would be known that Britt is a convicted criminal who is supposed to be going to prison. Hank would go to prison for aiding and abetting, along with the many other crimes he has committed for which there is a mountain of evidence. And Britt will go to prison, and then probably get shipped off to Mexico, where he'll spend the rest of his Look, life in a prison. I know it's our job to help Please this guy out of everything, but I think this guy's a lost cause. He's obviously made up his mind. Why don't we just cut our losses and get out of here?